from all my deployments and all my deployments were combat deployments, heavily engaged deployments. Fallujah still uh, is the cherry on top. It was the most next level fighting I've ever been part of. March 26 is an important day to me because that's the day I got shot right in the helmet and just like really put life and that deployment into perspective. I go to reload and I come back into the window to shoot. That's when literally it was lights out for me. And I just remember this like loud, like life just left my body and I had this like gnarly out of body experience where I could like see everything taking place. My body, the gun shooting across the street, my the house that I was in. I remember waking up convulsing. I was getting kicked by my assistant team leader. He's like, dude, I thought you were fucking dead, but they didn't see any blood. So they're even more blown away that I just wasn't moving on the ground. It was was like watching Banner Brothers. Banner Brothers was out right before this deployment and we literally stopped making friends with these fucking dudes because they were like on the death list. Like your combat replacement, like please stay the fuck away from me. Like you're going to fucking die. Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He spent 15 years on active duty as a sniper slash recon slash MARSOC. Um, which sounds like three bands I would listen to. Uh, he received a Bronze Star, a Navy Com with V, an Army Com, a Purple Heart. Uh, I, I do think you did get a good conduct medal also, right? Definitely. Which is pretty awesome. You may be the first. He's the owner of Defy Tribe, which uh, helps unlock people's potential and helps them go all in in all aspects of life, as well as uh, We Defy the Norm, which is an apparel company that uh, I would say mirrors that same brand and, and image. He's a personal upper limit coach, which we're going to get heavy into what the fuck that means. And he was actually hospitalized from ink poisoning from the amount of tattoos that he got while in the Marine Corps. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Cody Alford. Dude, thank you for having me. I'm so super pumped. Dude, thanks for coming. Uh, we've been uh, talking about making this work for a bit, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time. Did you ever shit yourself from the liver cleanse? I did. Not, you did? Yeah, I, told, right. did, I definitely shit myself. I shit like can, two cans of peas. It was insane. Really? Yeah, it was. that was in my liver. Peas? Yeah, it was like uh, these green pea-sized things, and uh, that's like what's supposed to happen. Really? And apparently now I just need to repeat that process so I'll have like two or less. Uh, but basically like every medication i've ever taken drug whatever it doesn't always filter out of us and so i was in the military i was heavily uh, medicated yeah heavily medicated <laughs> with all the great stuff uh yeah. even basic stuff like motrin really oh yeah so like if you were to take those and and analyze them like in a lab those peas it, it would be like combinations or or like excretions of of medication or, or of like what? of like i'm not a, not a doctor uh but it's basically just like all the trace remnants of all the unprocessed things that our liver yeah. actually is supposed to function on. Shit. What uh, what was the li liver cleanse called? <sighs> um, give me a second. Let me check real quick. Did, uh, was it painful? Was it uh, relief? No, it was not painful at all. Uh, and it's all like just, it's called liver cleanse program. It's actually from uh, this company called Global Healing. Uh, it's six days, um, revitalize your liver, support healthy digestion, natural flush of toxins. Um, it was absolutely simple. Just like uh, last day is like Epsom salt you take and then um, uh, you drink like six ounces of olive oil. Yeah. And uh, that's wild. That, it's, I mean, that's hard to put six ounces of olive oil down. I, I saw you chug it and I was like, man, you've you've had practice. Yeah, man. <laughs> doing I, shit like that. When I drink beer, I just like open up the throat gullet yeah. and just like yeah. let it float, you know. Uh, the one thing I'm curious of is that I remember seeing there was like a, a colon cleanse years ago that everybody was high and mighty on because it would make you shit like this material that right. was uh, fucking gnarly. I mean, it looked like alien puke or something. It was, it was, I was like, what the fuck is that? But what came to find out is like, if you took their product and just mixed it with water and let it sit for a amount of time, that same shit would be there. So it was kind of a scam. I'm not saying that the liver cleanse is a scam, but I'd be curious like to, to actually send that to a lab and, and, you know, like a third party that has no idea what it is and be like, tell me what the fuck is actually in this and see if it's just not the ingredients. It's space peanut. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> That's fucking great. Uh, when was the last time you legit lost your temper? Well, I can tell you that I was, uh, it was 2018. I was at our schoolhouse. Uh, I'm on my medical board getting ready to get out of the Marine Corps and 
the smallest thing set me off. Uh, one of our civilian contractors was telling me I was signing up for like one of those Lean Six Sigma courses. Uh, I was trying to like stack the deck for myself when I got out because I don't know what I wanted to do. And uh, everyone hyped up this course and how it's super valuable. And I show up for the course and they're like, hey, you're not on the roster. And I just like lost my mind. And I lost my mind in such an unprofessional way. I'm like storing up and down. And like students are in the other side of our building. All the team guys and uh, instructors are on this particular side. And I'm just like, where I'm down saying like, man, fuck this guy, fuck this place. Like just losing my shit. And uh, I got really tired of civilians telling me like what I can and cannot do. Even if they're prior military, like they're not wearing a uniform and you you know this there's a lot of weight that gets put on their shoulders and i think it's kind of fucked up in a lot of in a lot of times and i was just in a bad place mentally and emotionally and that with cortisol imbalances that just literally set me off the edge and i was like bro what are you doing i'm getting ready to throw away my entire fucking career because i'm losing my shit right now and that was just even more target indicators like bro dude you need some massive help yeah uh and this was 2018 that was the <laughs> last massive ex uh like like blurt that I've ever done. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take a, a quick break. I, I do want to let you guys know um, the way that you can support the show is to support our sponsors. Uh, I know some people don't like to hear ads, but uh, that's how I do what I do for a living. So uh, any support you can show for our gracious sponsors is much appreciated. And again, it does, uh, does support the show. So thank you. What are the two key components for canine success? That's effective training and proper nutrition. Fueled by Team Dog brings those two components to your family and best friend. The perfect nutritional balance that results in a higher mental acuity, energy, overall vitality, and even an improved appearance. Every product you will find in my company's store was born from the battlefield and not from the boardroom. Let my life's work help you become your dog's hero. And uh Everything's been fairly calm since then. It's been a work in progress, absolutely. I mean, dude, my, my, my life the past year and a half has just been nine day compared to what it was, and that was the last uh, major out, outburst. Uh, but since then, I obviously I had some ups and downs, but I've been working on myself uh, ever since then to like find healing and to <clears throat> basically get all these issues I had wrong. I mean, a lot of my issues stem from stress. Stress alone was causing nine times, you know, you know, nine tenths of my cognitive impairment. Yeah. Uh, and so just remove myself from that environment and then like working on ways to mitigate that, um, uh, heavily into plant medicine and psychedelics for the past four and a half years. Uh, it's really helped me like find my balance. I mean, hell, two days ago when I got to Dallas, I got rear-ended in my Range Rover and I didn't even get mad. Yeah. I'm just like, Hey dude, you guys all right? You know, and making sure everything's cool. And like old me would like not have been able to do that. Yeah. And so like, I just like, damn, I've come a long way and I'm like super stoked because yeah. it's easy to like blow your top. It's yeah. way hard to like remain chill. That's the fucking truth, and uh, it's always the right answer to uh, to not blow your fucking top. I mean, in, unless you're being attacked by somebody, but then violence yeah. is very appropriate. Yeah. Uh, what was the last full book that you read? Uh, the last full book that I read. What what book was that? I just read it. <laughs> I can't remember. TBI is <laughs> definitely. A it was a memory book. book. I it was can't definitely remember. a memory book. Um, it was actually uh, Alex Ramosi's uh, Million Dollar Offer. Oh, okay. Yeah. What uh, do you find your yourself reading primarily entrepreneur business nonfiction type stuff or, or is there a, a wide range of stuff that you read so i definitely add a lot of like like mindset mental energy type of stuff um, all these things i'm curious about i'm a firm believer and i mean dude everything you've accomplished in your life everything i'm accomplishing in my life these are all things that we couldn't we didn't just stumble across them we had to mentally visualize them and you know, manifest them into reality through hard work and action. And I'm really fascinated by all those books. Uh, as an entrepreneur, I'm always trying to learn more things because I only know what I know. And I realized the, the value of hiring coaches and mentors and investing into my own knowledge uh, years ago was the ROI, the return on investment is like crucial. So yeah. that's probably like my two categories is uh, self, self-help, self self-investment, because that's also the department that I'm in. So I like to learn different techniques. Yeah. Um, energy, healing, the power of our mind, and as well as business. Yeah. Has there been a, uh, I mean, not to single out any of the ones that don't fall into the best category, but uh, have, have you found like a, a varsity squad coach, like one that's helped you the most or is it? Man, I, so I have, I joined the, I'm um, part of the Lions Den, the Sean yeah. Raylands group. And I remember I used to watch this guy uh, all the time on the internet. I'm like, fuck this guy in his Lambo. <laughs> this guy used to just trigger me. Yeah. And I learned a long time ago, triggers are an invitation to grow. They're like, yo, pull that fucking thread of what's triggering you and see why 
And he kept on saying this shit and I was at the right place at the right time. And I'm like, I got to join this fucking guy's group. I got to, I got to literally put my money where my mouth is and stop talking shit about this guy and see what's up. And uh, a couple months later, I had an uh, opportunity to do like a kind of a veteran entrepreneur mindset uh, mastermind with him. Yeah. And <clears throat> this fucking guy, he basically pulled all my strings and pressed all my buttons and it transformed my life. Uh, he basically told me, I didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do. And I'm like, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> and he held me accountable. And he's really the reason why I have my coaching group up. Uh, he helped me launch my first uh, first online course that I ever did talking about journaling and really put me in the spot. I was not ready to do any of this stuff. And he set me on a new trajectory because he was that fucking guy that I needed to hold me accountable, trigger the shit out of me. And that's how change happens. Yeah. And uh, I love people talk shit about him still to this day. I'm like, you're going to talk shit until you know. Yeah. And that's true to anyone else. I, I know I trigger people and people talk shit about me all the time. And I'm like, bitch, but you don't know. And that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so the value in coaches is, I mean, you're looking for that one nugget, that one small thing that can truly change your life. And yeah. Sean Winland has definitely been that nugget for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, do you have a favorite childhood memory? Uh, favorite childhood memory. Put you on the spot in front of your mom like <laughs> yeah. that, huh? Hi, mom. Uh, my favorite childhood <laughs> Ear muffs. memory. Earmuffs. What is his favorite childhood memory? Is there just one that comes to mind? Uh, I mean, so I got my very first knife. It was an old-timer pocket knife. I wanted a knife for a long time. My parents got me one for Christmas, and they had it in this, like, green wrapping. Remember that, mom? They had this in this, like, little green wrapping in the tree, and they're like, Christmas isn't over yet. I'm like, oh, my God. And I look, and I see it, and... Uh, you know, my mom's inside making in the kitchen making breakfast now and i was really into like gi joes and like all that ninja shit so and i had a red rider bb gun and so i'm taking this uh, old timer pocket knife and i'm trying to split uh, a wire coat hanger apart so i can like make a <laughs> grappling hook and shove it in my bb gun well during that process i slipped and i like slipped my finger so like my finger's dangling uh the tip of my finger and uh my mom, she's like freaking out. She's taking me to the kitchen. She's like, oh my God, Jerry, I told you we should have got this knife. <laughs> and uh, everything was super cool. I have a gnarly scar and like a weird bump. Uh, that was probably like my favorite time because, I mean, <clears throat> now that I, you know, I'm, I'm around my son, I'm like, fuck, man. Like there's going to be times where I'm going to have to allow him to just fuck around and find out. And it's yeah. kind of scary, but it's freeing at the same time because it's, it's just the tables are shifting. And it's yeah. now that I've experienced these things and now I'm experiencing it myself. Uh, it's, I don't know, I'm very fascinated by it. No, it's a, that's a great point. You, you for sure have to do that as a parent. I know as my kids have gotten older, like you can't helicopter and, and put them in a bubble and like, you, you just got to let them <coughs> make mistakes, you know, cause otherwise once they're out of your realm of influence, then those mistakes are going to be 10 X if, if they don't learn the hard way, you know, when it's in a little more controlled environment. Uh, what is your morning routine on a on a day that you're in town? I noticed you, you just moved right to uh, way the fuck up north. Yeah, uh, well, we just moved to another house, so that's been pretty chaotic. Um, <clears throat> and we got chickens, and I got four dogs, so like figuring out. And it's like super snow, fucking icy there, so like everything is a little bit different. Um, and <laughs> listen to your podcast. I'm like, this fucking dude's gonna ask me my morning routine, yeah. and uh, I'm like, what am I gonna tell him? I'm at this phase of my life now where I'm constantly evolving and I've realized like just in the past month, my, my mindset, my conscious mindset has completely changed uh, astronomically. And I realized that practices that I was doing, they just, they don't serve me anymore. I was trying to do my morning routine because I saw other people do it. I'm like, well, fuck, I need to do this also. But I always felt forced, not like forced, like, Hey, I need to go work out, but I don't want to, but forced isn't like, is this speeding me up towards my goals or is this just fucking going through the motions? And I realized I was just going through the motions of these morning routines. So I've been revamping everything. But right now what I'm currently doing is uh, I wake up and I like visualize. I visualize how I want my fucking day to go. I remind myself what my goals and my dreams are and what I can do today to do that. Um, I read, I'm into the Bible now. I'm like opening that thing up because uh, I've talked so much shit about it for all these years. And I'm just curious. I'm reading it from left to right. Uh, even though everyone's like, don't read it that way. I'm like, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Sensei. Kiss my ass. It was written that way. Yeah. I'm I just, mean, whatever. Yeah. And like, it's pretty fucking weird. That's in, how it's laid out. In anyway. the beginning of it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so I do that and then I, I go into burpees. I don't like burpees. Uh, burpees suck, but I do them because they suck. Yeah. And then I usually mix in some type of cold plunge or cold shower and then I start my day. Yeah. 
I noticed uh, your burpees are more prison-like than they are CrossFit-like. Yeah, uh, people are like, Cody, but you didn't jump at the end. I'm like, fuck you, dude. Like, I don't have to jump in. I've had this infatuation with, like, I guess, like, prisoners for the longest time because, you know, people, civilians talk about mindset and how being hard, but fuck, could you imagine how hard you have to be in prison just to survive on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, just... And to be in your head 24-7. There's people that live a, a work a nine to five, have this great home, have all the money, have this great family, but they're in their fucking head 24-7. They don't even know they're prisoners. And there's yeah. prisoners that know they're prisoners, but they're getting college degrees. I mean, they're reforming their lives. And yeah. let's be real, not every prisoner is there for some fucking catastrophic disaster. Yeah. Um, and so seeing I'm like, well, how do these these men like mold their bodies? Well, they do with what they have. And I'm like, well, fuck, dude. They're clearly doing what works, so yeah. why am I going to reinvent the wheel? And I look at these CrossFitters that are still kind of, some of them are fat and some are this, some are that. I'm just like, but these dudes inspire me more than yeah. some fly-by-night. Yeah. The, the kipping pull-up really burns my ass. You know, uh, I know that it's the, it's the military in me, and I get that, like, technically it's the same amount of work being done. You're traveling, you know, you're moving your body from this level to that level, and I, I get all of that, but I just don't buy it. Like, to me, you got to be strict in a fucking pull-up. There's a there's a book called Convict Conditioning. Have you heard of that? I have not. Yeah, you would you'd love it. I have it actually at at, at the house. But uh, it's exactly what you're talking about because I you know you're the first probably the first person I've ever met that at least we've talked about fascination with uh, convict conditioning. And uh, I'm right there with you. Like to use just your body weight and for them to master that ability to move their body in every direction at at you know different gravity angles and whatever is fascinating and and some of those dudes get in ridiculous fucking shape you know but it's similar to like gymnasts you know most of their conditioning is body weight stuff you right. know uh, they don't do a ton of lifting and resistance training other than what their own body provides but uh, yeah i would check it out it's uh it's fascinating but um to me and it's also like that you didn't jump at the end it's kind of like the like you talked about the cold plunge thing you know it's like the people that would give you shit for doing a shower instead of up to the neck. And well, it's, you know, it needs to be four degrees colder and it's, you know, Oh, you went 18 seconds too short. And it's like, like they get, people get so far in the weeds, whether it's, you know, technical lifts with CrossFit shit or cold plunges or nutrition and fucking counting macros or whatever, you know, to me, it's like with that, it needs to be cold enough for you to not want to be in it, you know, and again, cold enough for you to, to force yourself to breathe in a manner, which makes you calm yourself down. And once you're calm, do it for another 10 or 15 seconds and then get the fuck out. Like whether it's 61 degrees or 38, whether it's a shower or a fucking ice bucket, like if those two things are present, you're, you're getting what you're supposed to get out of it. You know, like it, it boggles my mind how fucking bored people are, uh, you know, with, with being able to, to go that far in the weeds on so many things. But uh, it's a gatekeeper mindset. Yeah. Like keeper the badge. Like you didn't do it right. Like. The person messaging me that is not doing anything that I'm doing right now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I know it. Fucking cheap seats. Uh, so childhood-wise, growing up, where are you originally from? Uh, Duncanville, Texas. And that's not far from here, Yeah, right? not far at all. It was like a 40-minute drive to here, I think. And were you born and raised a whole, whole childhood there? Yep, all the way up to 18. Tell me about growing up there. And it was... Uh, Fun. I mean, back in the day, we were, you know, you'd ride bikes to school, you'd walk to school, you egg houses, you'd toilet paper people... Um, you know, it was fun. I played outside, drank from water hoses. Um, siblings? Sport. Uh, no, no siblings, yeah. just, just myself. Um, in terms of like big impactful moments, were there any, uh, big tragedies, traumas, uh, notable events that, that really shaped your childhood? Yeah. My mom, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. How old was I? It was 1994 that happened. And so at that time, um, it was a lot of my dad. My dad was a full-time police officer. So my mom was always in the hospital and she was losing her hair and she's super stressed out and going through this like crazy life changing, altering thing. And I ended up living with uh, one of her brothers for a bit and completely different <laughs> upbringing than, than I, uh, like country club type shit, uh, weird, but I learned a lot and then I lived with another family friends for a bit. They lived out in the country, which was a completely different upbringing too. And I did a lot of uh, manual labor, like a different lifestyle than I, than I, than I grew up with. And you're uh, like eight or nine at this point. Yeah, I think so about eight or nine. And, um, I'm like chiseling off, um, aluminum and different metal parts off like, um, like washing machines and dryers. And we were like scrapping metal and, 
you know, breakfast at six o'clock every day, church on Sundays. Like I didn't go to fucking church and, but I'm doing all these new things. And it was weird to be that young and to have three different like realities happening at the same time and kind of barely see my mom and dad. And I, what did it help me with? It just fucking showed me that dude, life is not this like straight and narrow. Like it's not, it's like, there's no constant with it. And it's always evolving. And I, I kind of learned that at a young age. And I'm not saying I had a bad childhood or nothing fucking crazy. Well, especially not in front of your mom, right? Uh, I mean, I, <laughs> we're, we're pretty open with it. I mean, I definitely gave my mom hell for a long time. Um, and she knows that, especially when I got out of the military. I was very toxic to be around them. So I was very, very verbally abusive as just being really? a dick. Yeah, just like always fighting. I hated myself. And so that lashed out to my mom and then years of programming my mom being a dickhead, well, she's gonna let, I'm programming her. She's clearly going to retaliate against me. And and it's been, it's been kind of fun to see our transition because there was, um, you know, people talk shit about COVID. COVID was the best thing that ever happened to me because during that time, my mom and I really rekindled our relationship. And we always had a good relationship, but like a good one where we could have conversation and like not just yell at each other and just dumb shit. And uh, so I'm super fucking grateful for all those things. and. Um, but yeah, the childhood up until now, uh, it was it was a good. I had a good childhood. I played sports. I sucked at it. What sports? I played football. Oh, I played soccer at a young age. Um, Which is basically like worshiping the devil in Texas. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're you're naughty for that. And then yeah. uh, I think eighth grade, seventh eighth grade, that's when football was introduced, uh, and I played that in school. And I was never really good, but I was so small, and we were all young back then. So I was, I was like playing center. I was like a small, like little <laughs> white kid in a five A school. So like all these like huge black dudes. Were, like I was never a starter, right? Like I couldn't compete against like these like physical specimen dudes that like grew up with football. And I still, even my senior year, didn't even know how to play football. Like yeah. I would ask the other defensive end, like, "Hey, bro, who, who do I hit?" Yeah. Um, so maybe I've always had traumatic traumatic brain injuries, but I just like the sportsmanship of it, and that's yeah. really it. Did uh, did any of the, I guess, playing sports uh, Im impact or play a role in you deciding to want to join the military and or what was that light switch for you? Like, did 9-11 happen when you were in? Yeah, 9-11 like, happened when I was in Spanish school? class. Uh, early high school? Yeah, early high school. Um, but I, w I remember being dropped off at daycare one day and there was like a Ranger poster um at the school for whatever reason and i saw that and i'm like oh fuck i want to be a ranger uh and then the shortly after i saw this like marine slaying the dragon commercial i'm like oh fuck I got, i'm gonna do this thing and i always wanted to do it i would watch like every like buds class video on the discovery channel i'd wake up at like three o'clock because tom berenger you know sniper would come on and i'm like oh my god and i recorded on vhs like probably like recording over like family fucking videos and yeah. um that's why I wanted to do it. 9-11 happened and I, that didn't like simulate me even more. It was just like fucking crazy. And, um, uh, to see something like that. Right. But, uh, young age, I was, that's what I wanted to go to. And yeah. my parents knew that's all I wanted to do. I signed up at 17 and, uh, it was just a matter of time. I was just waiting for my time to go. Yeah. Was there any, uh, talks from your dad being a police officer about joining the military and kind of any advice he gave or, you know, was he supportive? Was he not supportive? How, how was that? He wasn't one way or the other. My parents wanted me to do what I wanted to do. They both, ex they, didn't ex they didn't expect me to do anything else other than the military. They thought that's what I wanted to do the whole time. They never encouraged me towards it. Uh, my dad, very, he was a Marine also. He mm. very rarely talked about being in the Marines. Uh, every now and then he was with his friends. Some talks would come out, but like it was never never heard in those types of stories never was like hey son think about this uh the only thing he did tell me was like don't bite your damn nails you'll learn that in, the, in boot camp and then he's like keep on fucking around you'll be pulling grass with your hands outside i'm like because that's how my yeah. dad went to boot camp you know with the the m1 grand you know like yeah. super old school uh green dungarees and uh so that was really the only like kind of like pep talks I ever got yeah was he uh, a hard ass on you growing up yeah i think he was a hard ass uh did you get in a lot of trouble I got in a lot of trouble. My dad was a cop, so I was like the fucking pastor's kid, you know? Yeah. Like, I had the only canary yellow pickup truck that was a classic in the neighborhood that, or the town that I lived in, and my dad always get these call reports because my dad was in a neighboring police station. He's like, hey, I heard your damn truck is zipping down the street. I'm like, dad, that's not me. And he's like, you're the only one with the yellow truck. I'm like, fuck. Yeah. I got to come up with a better excuse, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was, he was hard and firm and fair, <laughs> and 
he, I was a lazy kid. I, I was really into like drawing and computers and like computer games and shit that when those things came out and, um, my dad was a laborer yeah. you know, when he wasn't working, he was doing some shit outside or he was, uh, mowing lawns on the weekends, hustling. And I was always going out with him and my mom and like, fuck, I just want to sit and do nothing. And this was like, not the sit and do nothing type of guy, which sucked. Yeah. Um, but, uh, it was I, all good for me. How is your relationship with him now? Uh, my dad passed away in 2014. Oh, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it sucked. Um, I fucking miss that dude. Yeah. He's a good man. Yeah. Well, I didn't mean to rip that fucking scab off. No, you're good. Uh, no, 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 you're good. I, I learned a lot of lessons and, you know, oddly enough, I realized I had to do a lot of healing with my dad. Um, I got, um, it was actually on my, my mom. Sorry, mom, I'm not sure to make up bad memories, but, uh, you know, I learned a lot about myself that day. Uh, the day before was my parents, uh, was my dad's birthday. So I, I wake up, it was a weekend station in North Carolina. Um, and so on the weekends I'd wake up and I call my parents early around like seven, eight o'clock North Carolina time. So they'd be in Texas time. It, they'd be awake and I would call them, say, how's it going? What's going on? And then I'd like go off of my day. Uh, so I call my dad on his birthday. I think it's like a Saturday. Talk to him, get to FaceTime him, had a great time. The next day is my parents' anniversary. Well, I wake up early, just like I always did, and I'm like, well, I'm going to watch a movie. And inside, I'm like, I should call my call my parents, but I'm like, I'm going to watch this movie. And sure shit, man, halfway through this fucking movie, I get a phone call from a family friend saying my dad died. And I just, I, I felt so selfish. Yeah. And um, then I was obviously instantly uh, turned to my mother. I'm like, fuck, man, I, I'm going to have to get out of the Marine Corps, take care of my mom. Like, I don't know what the fuck is she going to do? And I was just like really like overwhelmed with like, you know, there's some life decisions that happen. You're like, well, fuck, that's life. Then it's like life decisions when it affects you and someone you love. You're like, well, fuck, now what do I do? And, um, but I learned a lot of those lessons. And, you know, I've been doing psychedelics for four and a half years now to heal and like just to just uh, get my neurons firing back f properly and functioning yeah. right. And, you know, my dad's come up a lot in those. And uh, I realized that I was telling my mom today that, you know, I was healing wise, I was always looking for validation. I was a fucking, I, I kicked ass as a kid. I, I kicked ass in the military and I was always looking for like my dad to be like, damn dude, I'm proud of you, bro. And that never happened. You really? know, I don't think he was never not proud of me, but he was just his generation. I mean, this fucking dude was like abused. He, he was like that type of family photo where like they're in like half overalls and there's like 12 kids on like a rinkety wood porch and he's working a fucking field, you know? Was he from here too? Uh, he was in, he was from Texas. Yeah, uh, from Texas, and oddly enough, I my dad was super into like family tree stuff, and I'm just like never into that shit. Yeah. I'm like, what can I do now to like change the Alfred's trajectory? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of things came with my dad, but that fucking dude was a good man, and and I realized he loved me the best way he could, and it just took me time to kind of like understand that by yeah. seeking validation and knowing that, hey man, you only know what you know, and and that dude did what best what he could with what he had. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's, I think, both interesting and amazing to hear, you know, looking back on it, you know, how you reflect on it now and, and that validation thing is, is so important, uh, but also understanding like that generation and, uh, and it's just kind of more of a time where most men didn't communicate shit like that to their parents, right? Or to their parents, to their children, uh, which is strange, you know, I, I know I, I, talk with my, I've got two daughters, they're, they're older, but, um, I mean, I, I tell them stuff like that all the time. I, I mean, to me that, that shit's so crucial and, and I know how important it is. Um, but it's, it's fascinating to me the way generations change and the way they work and, and kind of how they influence kids growing up. But, <coughs> um, all right. So you, you've been hell bent on joining the military basically as soon as you graduate, I'm assuming you, you join. Yep, I like to skip school. I I listed at seventeen, and then I just waited till I turned eighteen and leave. Was it a uh, my recruiter told me X and Y is happening, or like did you have any anything signed up for? Or Mama how? didn't raise no bitch, you know. So I knew exactly what I wanted. I I just wanted to be a scout sniper. Dude told me the only way to do that is to go infantry, and so I did. I enlisted as an O three eleven, and then um, that was it. Yeah, what uh, where'd you go to boot camp? I went to boot camp in San Diego. Yeah. Um, I mean, so. It, do they break it down where this half of the country goes to San Diego, this half goes to... Uh, yeah, I think it's like some dividing line, like in... Uh, I would think you would go to the uh, East Coast. Thank God I, I mean, didn't. Yeah. 
they did tell these stories about gnats and yeah, East Coast military is like completely different yeah. than West Coast. Yeah. I, same with the SEAL teams. Yeah, I lucked as you, out. As you know. I lucked out. Yeah, that's good shit. So, all right, so you go to uh, to boot camp. Was there anything that surprised you? Man, I it was weird. Back in the day, like on the Family Channel and all this type of shit, there was like these like Marine boot camp documentaries where it's like, or like these like sitcoms, not sitcom, like a like a like a homemade TV show or, you know, and I'm like, I would watch these things. So I'm really just like so excited to be there. Like, I'm like, holy shit, dude came on the bus and yelled at us. I've seen this, like yeah. this is epic. Or <laughs> I'm standing on these fucking footprints, epic. I'm shaving my head, this is epic. And, uh, you know, nothing really surprised me. I, I do very vividly remember we got into, like, so you're like, you got your shaved head now and you're walking to this like storage room and they're like, your hands are out like a peasant. They're just like putting shit into you and, um, they gave me these camis and I was one of the first classes to have like the digital camis. Well, they had elastic on the sides. I'm like, Oh shit, these are like sleeping pants. You know, <laughs> I didn't know what the fuck they were. And then they give me like, they give you these like UFC gloves and uh, this like mouth guard. I'm like, what the fuck is this? Like, this is epic. Like it was that part. I had never seen in a video. So I was like really excited about that. So you're like a, a Marine Corps tourist almost. Y yeah. I was like, I'm like, dude, I'm I'm a super fan. Yeah, you know that's classic, man. Yeah. Was there was there any part of it that was harder than you were expecting? Like, were you, were you challenged? Absolutely, I was. I, dude, I remember one time I like my body like straight up quit on like a. I did not quit. But my body was giving out on on the obstacle course. I could not, for the life of me, pull myself up this rope on like one particular obstacle course, and I was like, what the fuck? And I'm just so fatigued, stressed, and like you know, you just got the tension like the spider wall at buds, you know. That fucking thing kicked my ass. Yeah. Um, and I'm not even still. But uh, I remember there was a lot of things that challenged me. I remember the uh, crucible towards the end. I mean, pack in the day. I laugh because, like, your pack, your heaviest pack is probably 35 pounds, maybe 45 pounds in boot camp. It's nothing. Yeah. And it's, like, dumb shit. It's, like, an isomat and a sleeping bag and a poncho. Like, shit you can't even use. Yeah. And uh, having that on your pack and looking at a, at a hill or mountain that's just, like, up into the heavens, I was like, "Well, the fuck am I gonna get up there?" And then you just realize that, you know, after you get past boot camp, you're like, "Dude, that shit was a joke." Yeah. And then it just, but it like sets you up because, like, who, how many eighteen year old kids are wearing forty five pound packs on their back and doing shit that they don't necessarily want to do or they want to do, but they don't even know they can, and they're put in a situation where they're about to fuck around and find out. Yeah. Not very many in the United States. That's Absolutely. For sure. Yeah. All right, guys, as you know, I'm into uh, health and fitness uh, and specifically how nutrition relates to it. Um, coffee has, has been a staple of mine and, and I think most people's for a long time. Um, as you know, I'm a big uh, proponent of Mudwater, which is a sponsor of this show. They have been uh, for a while now and, and we have a great partnership. I love their product. Um, it's a phenomenal alternative to coffee. Uh, for me, you know, coffee, there's jitters, there's mold in it. Uh, you know, a lot of times it tends to, to kind of upset my stomach. Uh, but mud water has adaptogenic uh, mushrooms. Um, there's a fraction of the caffeine that coffee has. There's a little bit, but it's very, very little. Um, and it, it really leans on, on mushrooms and the blend of matcha and chai for kind of that sustained energy that, that continues to go and, and doesn't crash the way coffee does when, uh, when it runs out. Uh, they use lion's mane for alertness, cordyceps to support physical performance, chaga and raishi to support the immune system, turmeric for soreness, and cinnamon for antioxidants. Um, I, I really enjoy that first cup of warm liquid in the morning by taking mud water instead of coffee, and I'll put uh, just a splash of, of heavy cream uh, or even some protein powder, uh, some collagen powder, um, and I also throw uh, usually a couple drops of uh, stevia or uh, monk fruit vanilla to make it kind of a, a thick, normal morning coffee ritual type of uh, concoction. And uh, I got to tell you, it, it it does wonders for me. And, and I'm really really glad that I switched. It's been you know better part of a year now, uh, you know that I've been taking that uh, and using that as part of my uh, daily morning routine. And it's fantastic. I love it. I, I can't re recommend it enough. Uh, it's 100% USDA, uh, organic, non-GMO, gluten-free, vegan, and kosher certified. Uh, and they also donate to the Berkeley Center for Science of Psychedelics, which is, uh, you know, groundbreaking and leading research to help veterans with PTSD uh, and other uh, associated illnesses and, and uh, syndrome. So uh, great cause, great company, phenomenal product. If you go to Mudwater, that's M-U-D-W-T-R dot com forward slash Mike 
to su- support this show and the product uh, and use the code Mike Mud, M I K E M U D, all caps, for 15% off. That's again, Mudwater, M U D W T R dot com forward slash Mike. And the code is Mike Mud, M I K E M U D, all caps, for 15% off. Go check them out. Um, so after that, you go to infantry school. How did, were you able to go? Uh, right into the sniper program or did it take a while before you were able to to go to to that school in particular yeah so after infantry school um i went to my first infantry battalion and uh i was actually in our headquarters and support company which i didn't know what it was at the time and i was put into this thing called a trailer platoon which is um they were the force reconnaissance like drivers and outer cordon people and i was like oh that sounds cool i get to wear a pro tech helmet and a flight suit like i was like <laughs> i get to be a navy seal you fast know? team shit, yeah man. fast team yeah i get to do all this cool shit well i never did any of that stuff yeah. uh and like two weeks later uh the one of the sniper leads came down he's like hey we're running an indoctrination blah 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 sign up and that started so bas- basically like two and a half weeks inside my infantry unit i basically tried out for the sniper platoon and I like made it over there oh that's cool yeah super lucky <laughs> um did you go right through training and pass and nope uh so uh i had an opportunity to go to sniper school probably my first 30 days inside the platoon uh but we're also training up for our first deployment to fallujah and so they're like hey we're looking for volunteers to go to this battalion there's a few spots and we're like i'm not gonna miss out on this fucking i'm about i'm new here i'm getting ready to deploy i'm not gonna miss out on this so i didn't end up going to sniper school until probably a year and a half in the military i came back from my first deployment and then i went straight to sniper school so this is i went to sniper school in 2000 i think october 2004 is when i went to school oh, okay was that uh, a bigger kick in the nuts than you were expecting or was it about like you thought well i don't know how sniper platoons are now but back in the days sniper platoons were literally they taught you everything and sniper school was to basically fine-tune shit so really what i learned at sniper school was how to um like mission plan and like other hard like you remember writing toots and yeah. uh these like long 50 page like fucking reports and type of stuff um i learned a lot of that stuff but sniper school was there's a lot of hard aspects, yeah. but it was, I mean, it was just perfecting my craft at that point. Yeah. I had, it, I had great leaders. Is it kind it. of akin to being at a ranger battalion, ranger school? Is it kind of the same thing? Like they learn more at, at the battalion and then the, the school is just kind of the certificate? I think now it's completely opposite. I think there's way more because they've broken down like the whole sniper community and how they run it now. But back in the day, like every, there was not a lot of money in the military, even with the GWAT starting off. Uh, so like you did a lot of training in the battalion and there was a lot of leaders and mentors. And I think the military lacks a lot of that shit now. And they rely yeah. on these schools to produce leaders and mentors. Um, so I, I don't really know. I mean, shit, I've been out of a sniper platoon since 2006 and yeah. I've been a sniper, you know, ever since the rest of my career, but in a different organization, different platform and just different caliber of people and mindset. Yeah. So yeah. did you go on deployment uh, with that group? Soon thereafter? Yep. I deployed with uh, my 1st bat- Infantry Battalion, which is 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Space out of Camp Pendleton. Uh, I did two deployments. I did uh, Fallujah, and I did Operation Steel Curtain with them. And How I was that? Both deployments were, you know, as you know, history-making deployments. It was super crazy to, like, hit those timelines up just like that. Uh, my first deployment to Fallujah was fucking insane. Telling the stories about that place, it sounds unreal and sounds fake. Uh, even... Operation Still Curtain, my second deployment, which was 2005. Uh, I mean, we just literally did a smashing campaign through multiple villages, multiple cities, and it was it was super gnarly to uh, be stretched that thin and to just go from one campaign hopping to the next. And kind of really reminded me of some stories like World War II, mm. where you know Fallujah, I was there for my whole seven month deployment. <clears throat> Still Curtain, I went through like six different like major cities, yeah. um, and you know casualties along the way, and you're fucking tired. You have no supplies. You're, you're, you're whatever. And like you band of brothers. Yeah. yeah. And you're just, yeah. you just keep on going. I mean, I lived out of a, of a three day Eagle day pack for fucking months. Yeah. Uh, you know, supplying <clears throat> myself and my team with harvest bars and, you know, shitty ass water. And every, I remember the Marine Corps birthday happened on still curtain and they uh, brought out Marine Corps does not fuck around with a birthday. Oh, I know. It. Uh, they, they brought out, I think I had steak and lobsters and, and I got a Red Bull. <laughs> you know, and, and I even got a cigarette. I was super excited. Okay. Um, yeah, we're literally in a fucking gunfight. It just ends, and they bring the food chain up, and we're like all grimy and shit, like like behind like this like busted ass wall. I'm like fucking eating steak and lobster, and, <laughs> and um, so what a yeah, fucking trip. If we can take a step back to uh, that first deployment, 
when you first got boots on the ground there, what was that experience like for you mentally? What was going through your mind? Uh, I was... <clears throat> I hated the Iraqis, right? I, I was brainwashed like any other person that watched any Moto video, right? The die motherfucker die videos. Um, so I was definitely there to fight. You know, I was super eager about that. Um, the army unit that was there was absolutely fucking battered. We replaced the 101st Airborne, I believe. I believe it was 101st or might have been the 82nd. Either way, in an Air Force unit. And uh, these guys were fucking beat. Um, they had way more stuff than we did. So we started to pillage their shit to like outfit our vehicles because we just had soft skin Humvees and the Mercedes IFABs, the Jeeps. And um, I remember probably about a week in our leadership from the cyber team or cyber platoon I was in did a left seat, right seat with the uh, scouts from the army, their sniper guys. And dude, fucking they're out there doing this like weekly uh, district center meeting for the elders and they all get like fucking shot up and grenaded. And so, like half my platoon comes back fucked up already and they're sitting out the rest of the deployment, you know, wow. with like holes in their asses and shit. And I was like, damn, this is real. And then, um, uh, you know, not even going out the wire yet, having to like write death letters and just this mindset of like, hey, we're going on this day and you're like, fuck, you know, thank God I never had to go off of like one of those ramps on like Normandy Beach, right? Which doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. Uh, but like, I felt that type of feeling if potentially of like, you know, sitting in the back of a seven ton and it's quiet outside and you smell like JP8 diesel fuel and you're like, quiet as shit and you're rolling to an objective and then we all get off and dude next thing you know we're like literally storing up a harness nest it's like the black hawk down scenario uh, i'm not going to compare the two but using that that phrase of like you're you're going in quiet you're going in calm the city is dead as shit and the next thing you know literally all hell is breaking loose and it was like that my entire deployment uh which was absolutely insane to the point where like you're just i tell people like we we would have combat replacements all the time and uh, it was like watching Banner Brothers. Banner Brothers was out right before this deployment. And we literally stopped making friends with these fucking dudes because they were like on the death list. Like, you're a combat replacement. Like, please stay the fuck away from me. Like, you're going to fucking die. And uh, it sucked, but it was just how it worked. It, it was crazy. And it was a lot of violence and a lot of, uh, a lot of pain. Uh, Fluja was, to, from all my deployments, and all my deployments were combat deployments, heavily engaged deployments, Fluja still uh, is the cherry on top. It was the most next level fighting I've ever been part of. Do you remember the very first like legit gunfight you got into there? Yeah, it was actually the day one in the city. Uh, it was um, March, yeah, March twenty six, two thousand four. I remember that day because it's a very important day to me. Um, we're in the city. And our whole mission was to, um, back in the day, we were actually the eyes and ears of the battalion. So what that means is we would patrol up and we would report back to our commanders so they could paint the battlefield picture. Um, we're using like phase lines and all this other type of shit, GRGs to navigate. And we kept them pushing up further and further into the city, setting up overwatch positions to report back. And I remember we set up in this one two-story house and... Um, you know, I saw some, there was like some shooting, but I wasn't involved yet at this point. We stopped at a couple homes before this house and my guys were shooting and I was holding rear security at the, at the door that we walked up to. So I wasn't engaged. I was like, come on guys, I want to shoot, you know, and I should have just shut the fuck up. Um, and so a few houses down about mid afternoon, we rolled into a story house and I'm setting up a watch and I'm uh, by a window checking it out and my radar operators on the other side and my two snipers the school tearing snipers that have a nine millimeter Breda and a bolt gun in an urban environment which is fucking crazy uh, especially for what we were dealing with uh, they're like in the back of the room setting up like observations and um, you know shortly after uh, afternoon prayer happened that's when we got this like pretty gnarly gunfight across the street and um March 26th is an important day to me because that's the day I got shot right in the fucking helmet and just like really put life and that deployment into perspective. And this is day one in the city for me. This is day one in the city for everybody. Um, and it definitely set the tone of like what's to come for that whole deployment. What were the circumstances where that happened? In regards to? Getting shot in the helmet. Uh, so basically, um, you know, I spotted these two guys across the street on this rooftop and uh, they had guns. 
my 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 buddy and I we start opening up on these dudes, and we're, now we're just exchanging fire. They're they're shooting blasting machine gun into her window. Uh, I'm shooting an M16 fucking cannon, you know, like old to, school shit. Yeah, old yeah. school, like the fucking 20 inch barrel, um, way better than a musket. So I'm I'm grateful. Yeah. And uh, BFA on the end of yeah, it. Yeah, BFA <laughs> saying butta butta jam, butta butta jam, <laughs> doing exactly what I'm told to do and instructed. Yeah. And um, long story short, I, I go to reload on the left side of the window, and as I load up and I come back into the window to shoot, that's when literally it was lights out for me and. I just remember this like loud, like life just left my body. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, I had this like gnarly out of body experience where I could like see everything taking place. Um, to my body, the gun shooting across the street, my, the house that I was in, I saw everything. And, uh, did you go unconscious? Yeah, I was definitely out. Um, I don't have like, I don't have a timer for the whole evolution. Um, if I had a guess, it'd probably like maybe three to five minutes potentially just based off uh, the time and distance from when the uh, shooting started and when we actually exfilled from this house. Um, and when I came back to my body, there was like this like light, bright light and like just zipped me back into my body. And I remember waking up convulsing. I was getting kicked in the shoulder uh, by my assistant team leader, Brian. Uh, he's like, dude, I thought you were fucking dead, but they didn't see any blood. So they're even more blown away that I just wasn't moving on the ground. I thought and you were playing hurt. I, I don't know what they were thinking, but I was definitely hurting. Yeah. Uh, and I was a cloak. My body lay next to the radio. They're like, dude, get on the fucking radio and call for support. And, uh, and that's what I did. I just like, you know, try yeah. had like the most like fucked up communication, trying to like call for support. Obviously nothing's working. As you were coming to, was it uh, like physically was, was it, like being drunk or like, was it real slow going at first or, or when that light came back in where you just like psh, fucking snapped out of it, adrenaline pumping and you're right back at it. No, I was definitely uh, dazed and confused. I was super like lethargic. Um, I probably had 20, 30% situational awareness. I was very choppy. I was crying and, and laughing at the same time. So I was an emotional wreck. Um, so even getting on my transmission was like a, every other word I was saying break, you know? Um, and I remember when we decided to like break down from that house and like move to the bottom floor to get better communication and get, get off this like place just getting pelted with the machine gun fire. Um, I was definitely like a lot of tunnel vision, a lot of, um, in there, not in there, but I, I knew I needed some help, but at the time I didn't know what that was. Yeah. Did it change your resolve at all? Um, either heightened it or lessened it. Like, did it did it make you question what you were doing there, why you were there, if you wanted to be there? Was was there any of that kind of self doubt? Uh, I didn't have any self doubt. I just started to show my body more. Uh, I realized we were in a shit ton of gunfights that deployment, and I realized if I only show my head, I'm only giving them my head to shoot at. So I decided to like show more of my body and like increase my chances of like not getting fucking dinged in the head again. Uh, I was really scared though. I had the same helmet, which would not stop another bullet at this point that I was still wearing in the city. And the only reason I got another helmet was like as Marines got injured and killed, I was able to take their gear. And uh, the that part alarmed me because I'm like, this is fucking real. And I was a point man on my sniper team. So I'm still on point. I'm still doing these like, I'm the first guy missions. And it was just a reality check of like, fuck dude, like life can come quick as shit. And I'm 18 years old. I've never done anything, you know, like uh, there's so much life ahead and that was really it. But like being scared about the mission or like not wanting to participate, that wasn't, that never crossed my mind. I was, I was committed to the cause and the cause was just like my team, not really go America or anything else or go war. It was just doing my job and yeah. I was taking care of my guys. Was the operational tempo at that point uh, or that time during that deployment, was it going out every day? So we actually, uh, after this particular incident on March 26, uh, we actually came back for about a week and a half, two weeks to regroup and because there was really no plan established. And the whole beginning of Fallujah was just kind of like strong arming the whole operation by pushing in and like doing this like, uh, uh, like blitzkrieg type of push. And that turned to be not very uh, effective. And so our next phase line, our next, our next game plan was to actually go in and take strongholds. And at this point in time, my battalion two one became the anvil. So we were the, we were the strong point that we weren't moving. We occupied homes um, and buildings inside the city of Fallujah and all the other adjacent battalions and units were pushing 
of the insurgents towards us. So we really became the magnet for like everything happening in the city. I mean, granted, there was like a lot of chaos going on everywhere else, but everything was being pump funneled towards us. So the rest of that deployment till towards the very end, we were stationary in the building. And what that looked like every day was you just rotating your, your duties on you're on fire watch or you're sleeping or you're filling sandbags uh, or doing some type of shit like that. I think every other week or every week you would get a chance to go back home and like take a shit in a porta john or something like that and you'd come back out like the next day. So it was kind of like just like you're in a, like a fire base yeah. and you're just fighting every fucking day and dealing with that type of stuff. And how long was that deployment? Uh, seven months. Seven months. Um, the, the group that you were there with, uh, that you deployed with about how many guys was that? Uh, this is where I get screwed up. I don't really remember a lot of numbers. Um, ballpark. I'd be lying. Maybe 300 people. Did you guys lose a number of guys? Uh, we definitely did lose a number of guys. The exact numbers. Uh, not sure. Like I said, with memory loss, I numbers always fuck me up. Uh, but we lost enough to, uh, we lost enough to to remember that like this is this is it man this is the real fucking deal and, and and guys back then were just built different uh these dudes were i mean real leadership and mentorship things that the military lacks today in my personal opinion uh, i'm right there with you uh they these were guys that were like e4s after for four years and they weren't turds you know if you're an e4 for four years now you're, you could be a fucking turd but back then things were just different and these dudes had, they were just true, real leaders are teaching you how to use everything. They weren't that do as I say, not as I do. And, you know, when we started losing a lot of those guys, and especially when we lost a fuck, we lost a squad one day from a V bid, uh, it hit a seven ton and just fucking killed everybody. And um, to see a lot of my senior guys and all these senior guys were all OF1 deployment guys. And just to see these men that we all looked up to just fucking broken and yeah. sad from losing their close friends and, you know, because OIF-1, from what I hear, I did not participate in OIF-1, <clears throat> but it was like hit and miss. There was some engagement, there was some combat, but it was nothing like Fallujah. Fallujah is, it's it's like driving a fucking supercar for your first time, right? Like, you cannot compare it to your Mazda Miata. Uh, it's 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 night and day, and um, it was it was it was really intense. But those characters of of men back then was just they they do not make them like yeah. that anymore. Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, it's uh, it's been a depressing observation uh, to kind of be past that point in my age and and on the sidelines watching what's ha happening and taking place in the military. It's it's fucking depressing and, and devastating. Um, do you recall the the first time, whether it's during that deployment or subsequent ones, where like you knew for a hundred percent sure, like I just took this guy's life? Do you remember the first time you felt that? Yeah. Can you, can you uh, walk us through that both in uh, from like a timeline standpoint, um, story wise, but also from an emotional standpoint? Yeah, the uh, <clears throat> well, m all right. So a lot of fucked up things back then. There was a lot of uh, human shields and um, there was a lot of uh, people being used to call um, to spot us. And at times those are the only people that were fucking shown that you had access to. And I remember my, actually my first uh, engagement was with the fucking bomb. I, I lays this bomb on this building and uh, we were, were getting just fucking murked from this place uh, all day across this river, across this bridge, actually, excuse me. And uh, when this fucking bomb dropped and I knew there was people in there, I mean, we saw them, we're shooting at them, they're shooting at us. I'm seeing fucking, you know, civilian casualties used or civilian people used as fucking human shields here. And, th and this, and this bomb dropped and I was like, fuck, that's real. And I realized that like, dude, this is fucking disgusting. This is absolutely disgusting. Cause even my fight, my first fight when I got shot in the helmet, like, I don't know if I kill these dudes or not. Like yeah. we're, we're literally trying to like squeeze in some five, five, six in between a fucking machine gun. Right? Like I'm, I'm literally just trying to put down suppressive fire. So my guys can get out of this room. And, uh, but my first up close and personal, it was, um, <clears throat> beside this bomb, it was this fucking dude. Um, I remember this, there was this dude that was, uh, he lived in the village. We spotted him and he was with his family and he was by the mosque and the mosque was off limit back in the day. And this dude wearing the same fucking clothes in the same pattern of life. And we were just observing him the whole time. And, 
Um, I remember him passing off his son to his wife. And then uh, as soon as I walked away, I, I, you know, dropped him. And I was like, I was fucking empty inside. And uh, it was almost like, did I have to do that? And then I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> We're just being shot at all fucking day. This is like the dumbest game ever. But I realized that that's what war is. It's fucking stupid. And uh, but at the time, my, my job was to fight terrorists, you know, fight these these bad people. And there was a lot of people in Fallujah that, um, you know, before we got there, they were dropping pamphlets from the sky with C-130s telling people, like, hey, get the fuck out of here. There's a curfew. And that's what made Fallujah really weird. It was, like, really not a free-for-all as in, like, there was no, like, order, but a free-for-all as in, like, dude, it was like, it was like a Call of Duty game where, like, if you see them, they're there to kill you and vice versa. It's like, who can kill each other first? And seeing death in that capacity and then seeing death and carnage with the capacity of um, air support and very up close air support. It, it, it was really crazy to be 18 years old and to experience all this. I mean, I, you know, looking back, I'm like, oh shit, I wonder where all my fucking trauma came from. I'm sure I had plenty prior to the military, but I was very <clears throat> empty uh, on that deployment. And I was definitely empty for the following deployments in my life. And uh, when you took that guy's life, did you see the the family's reaction after it happened or was it just, all too quick to it was honestly just tunnel vision for me it was almost like what did i fucking do and um it was because it's easy it's easy to pull a trigger and i didn't i didn't really know that because i haven't been intimate like that up until this point and um the intimacy of that it was almost like it was like why and it was not hard for me to process uh, but it was weird on how I was justifying that emotion. I didn't really know how to kind of categorize what I was feeling or experiencing. I definitely wasn't scared to fight. I definitely, I mean, I've shot my gun multiple times up to this point, but this is like, this is, I'm, I'm scouting this guy. I'm following him. I'm, I'm seeing him and he's not seeing me. This isn't like I walking through a fucking door and I pop a guy that's trying to kill me. This is a dude that's fucking living his life, getting ready to go do his good bad guy work for the rest of the day. And he has no idea that I have a fucking crosser on him. And uh, so it was, it was weird. Not, not sad, but it's just weird. Empty as in like, I didn't feel good about it. I didn't feel bad. It just <clears throat> blank. Because that was the first time that you experienced that particular emotion as it relates to uh, taking somebody's life, has that particular uh, scenario come back up in the Ibogaine and, and psychedelic stuff? Have you relived that at all? Honestly, I have never, through any of my psychedelic experiences, relived any combat-related really? stuff. Yeah, That's interesting. Yeah, um, the last experience I just did was the Ibogaine and the 5-MeO-DMT with uh, the vets. And... I try to tell people like I was thinking I was, you know, I realized that I never really healed or processed any of my trauma. I mean, I definitely cried a lot in the military. Uh, I definitely like was sad a lot. Definitely had a lot of hurt emotions and feelings and suppressed shit. And but when I did this five meo, there was not a pinpointed trauma. I just knew I had trauma unprocessed. If I just literally felt this ball of trauma leave me, like just like not one thing and. And that's why I try to tell people, like, when you have PTSD or stress in your life, people, asshole vets, vets are the worst. They're like, oh, you didn't go to combat. You don't have PTSD. Like, bitch, you can get PTSD by seeing something violent. You can get PTSD by experiencing something verbally. Like, it doesn't have to, trauma, it doesn't matter how you broke your arm. The fact is you broke your fucking arm and it sucks. But too many people want to compare how you can rate and how you cannot rate these things. And It's a stick measuring contest. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even knowing that, I was trying to, I was subconsciously, thinking and hoping that I'm going to be able to process something specifically, not realizing that it doesn't matter what the fucking trauma is. The thing is I had some shit that I didn't even know about and not knowing what it is, it just left me as this neutral like anchor of my life. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I've definitely cried a lot when I've bef before all this shit happened when it came to like, uh, looking at old pictures or I'd watch some, you know, the first time I saw that kill house video of Fallujah, uh, on April 26, 2004, we were, being overran, essentially, not essentially, we were fucking overran. And um, you saw the video from it. Yeah, we had uh, reporters with us, and uh, I, I stumbled across this video like a few years ago on YouTube. It was like probably like a five minute clip, and the video is just in the corner of a room. Just all you hear is just like yelling, 
screaming and just fucking machine guns and just guns and explosions happening and like boots and marines walking by and people getting carried out on stretchers and um or not stretchers but doors because we didn't have stretchers and shit back then and i remember that day very well because it was a, probably the scariest day of my life uh and uh i remember not i'm like i'm a marsat guy now i'm on my like fifth deployment or something like that and I see this video and I just start fucking crying and I wasn't really sure why or how or what was going on, but I just, I always went back to Fallujah. So, I, so you know, the more I talked about it, the more I realized that I had a lot of issues from that deployment. I mean, fuck, I came back from that deployment on base uh, to go to sniper school. And I remember it was like a Wednesday night and it was like my first night back home, but it's like, I think on Wednesdays or Thursdays, they, the other base does artillery, like illumination missions on Camp Pendleton. And my buddies that were in my sniper platoon on deployment that weren't school trained snipers, we all came back to go to sniper school and they start shooting illumination missions. And dude, we we're all underneath their fucking beds. Like, fuck, you know, like not this, like we were, cause we were, we were fucking scared. I mean, we lived with that for seven fucking months, you know, where buildings are shaking, bodies are fucking coming up from the, the graves from like Jesus era time frames. you know, like it was insane dogs eating people, um, bloated bodies everywhere. Um, dismembered bodies everywhere, Matt, bunch of civilian casualties from the insurgent side, you know, sabotaging them and fucking bombing them. It was just, it's a lot of, a lot of stimulation to take in that uh, I just never gave space to process because if you stop, if you give time to think in combat like that, especially how we were living, um, you, you, yeah, you, you lose that edge and you, it's the reason why I didn't like wash my camis. I was like super like, there's a reason why I did the things that I did because I did not want to lose that upper hand that I thought that I had to stay in the game because as soon as I relaxed, I do, you're starting fresh again and you can't, you, I don't know. I wasn't willing to take that, that chance. I want to take a second to talk about something near and dear to my heart. And that is a staunch supporter of this podcast, which is Bub's Naturals. Uh, the hat sitting in front of me uh, here on our, coffee table here in the studio belonged to Glenn Doherty. His nickname was Bub. Uh, I did two platoons with him and his childhood best friend uh, and another colleague of theirs, uh, Sean is the best friend, TJ is their colleague, uh, started Bub's Naturals, which is a collagen and MCT oil company uh, in Bub's or Glenn's honor. And, um, you know, for me, it's, it's uh, an absolute honor to be sponsored by and working with a company that um, you know, was started in the honor of one of my closest friends and, and a guy that I went to war with. And, uh, you know, the, the Bubs brand is not only super quality, um, you know, collagen, uh, collagen powder as well as MCT oil powder, um, you know, but they also give back to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation. Uh, they donate proceeds from their product sales to the Glenn Doherty Memorial Foundation, which, uh, you know, to me just furthers uh, you know, the, the mission set on veterans day, they give a hundred percent back. So, uh, I do believe it's the best collagen on the planet. Uh, I like to mix it in with uh, morning coffee, the MCT oil powder, the same thing, uh, mixes in very easy. It tastes great. Uh, and it just kind of adds everything that you want to start your day off from a brain health standpoint, from a joint support, gut support, um, you know, MCT oil and collagen are, are two components, especially as, as we age, uh, that are integral components to, uh, to health. And so, uh, to be able to work with Bubs Naturals and, uh, be able to, to work with them and, and sponsor a product that, uh, number one is a high quality product. And number two is, is so near and dear to, uh, you know, to my heart and to the mic drop podcast for, for who it, uh, was started for and what it stands for. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's an amazing, amazing place to be. So, um, it is whole 30 approved. Um, it's uh, sport certified, so you're not uh, going to run into any problems with that. Um, and I will say that um, you know right now they're they're offering twenty percent twenty percent off if you go to bubsnaturals.com and uh, use the mic drop code. So uh, I really highly encourage you to to try it out, incorporate it into your day day to day for joint health, for brain health, uh, for cognition, for gut health. And, uh, and to support an amazing organization that does a lot of things uh, in Glenn Bub's honor. So uh, go to bubsnaturals.com. Mic drop is the code, 20% off. During your time in that first Fallujah de uh, deployment, um, 
you know, in, in speaking about the different crazy shit that you saw happen, um, was there a particular thing that you saw that stuck out the most as kind of scarring your, your psyche and your soul from, from seeing it? Yeah, uh, we had a short round go off uh, for a mortar for a fire mission at, a, at an adjacent house, and to hear that a uh, couple of the guys that I knew died from from our own fucking artillery round, uh, not artillery, but a, a mortar round, that was uh, that was pretty shocking. You know, we're supposed to kill the enemy. You know, our weapons have bullets that go out towards them, and to have something tragedy like that happen, I was like, are you, what the fuck are we doing? And it just it just really put more, even more things in perspective. Like, yeah, there was a lot of gnarly things that I saw and experienced there, but to see something that you controlled that went completely south, uh, that was uh, that was a uh, shocker. Yeah, uh, there was a lot of lessons from that completely. Yeah, any that uh, that you learned from that deployment that on subsequent deployments saved your life. Well, definitely showing more of my body. <laughs> I remember my second deployment. I, I fought uh, for still current. I fought from a trench for for quite a bit of time, and I got to the point where I'm tired of like eating fucking rocks, shooting at my face, like hitting me from the ground from the rounds hitting. And so I just started to literally show my upper torso. I'm like, I'm gonna give these bitches more to shoot at because this is getting way too close to my head. And I had this fear of my head. And you know, even when I made it to special operations, you know. The thing is, you're a special operator. You wear a ball cap, and like motherfuckers are wearing ball caps. I'm like, dog, you haven't been shot. I'm wearing my helmet all the time. Like, y'all are dumb. And uh, so that was a lesson I took away. And simple or smaller, you know, it is what it was. But um, so the one thing I learned from that deployment was one real great thing I learned from the deployment is that not everyone is in the fight like you are. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember one particular time uh we we're in this like 360 position uh once we actually moved out of the city of fallujah we started doing these like missions around the city around these other uh neighboring areas and we're doing these presence patrols and uh we're basically trying to like relocate and retarget surgeon fighter cells and i remember i'm in this 360 it's the middle of fucking nowhere it's dark as shit i got seven bravos right the the some of the shittiest night vision out there at the time but at least we had it and i'm with my buddy and he's a machine gunner. I'm looking at him and we look around and everyone's fucking sleeping. Our own patrol is sleeping in this fucking 360. And we're like, are you fucking kidding me, dude? So like, we're just heightened alert. And I realized like, dude, these motherfuckers aren't about this life. They're, they're not worried. They haven't hit that aha moment where they realize they might've seen death. They might've shot some guns, but they have, it hasn't clicked for them yet. The importance of like showing up and like, dude, you're, if you're putting on armor, dude, you're here to fight. There is no in between. There is no sightseeing. And I realized that not everyone is a fucking same and combat clearly does not define who you are in your performance. Um, which there's a big facade in the military. A lot of people think, Oh, this person's a fucking epic fighter like dude that guy's a piece of shit he's a horrible leader he doesn't even take care of you when you're back at home he's a piece of shit oh but he was a great gunfighter because you saw him fucking shoot a machine gun belt but bitch did you see him sleeping over here like what kind of professional is that and i and i just realized that we're not all the same and uh literally you have to fucking rely on yourself in a wartime situation you cannot expect everyone to have the same uh, mentality you have to to fight and to survive. Did you see a disparity between that unit and once you were in full blown Marsoc of there being less of of that inconsistency? Yeah, when I left the infantry, uh, man, it was night and day. I left because I did not like the way it was going. My sniper platoon was getting really watered down. A lot of a lot of segregation where there was like no incentive to want to become a school trained scout sniper. It was like, hey, you're in the sniper platoon, kumbaya. I'm like. I don't believe in hazing, but I believe in accountability and I believe in discipline and I believe in uh, there's a fucking standard. And if you have no incentive to, to take my job one day, why are you going to show up when A, you don't have to and B, you don't want to? And I'm like, this is just not for fucking for me. And when I left in 2006, beginning of 2006, I got to uh, Force Reconnaissance was the first place I went to. And I was like, dude, these motherfuckers all want to be here. They're all super senior guys. They all have various levels of deployment experience or just life experience. And they're hungry. These are older fucking dudes. I was I was like one of the youngest guys there. These are guys in like their, at the time, mid thirties and I'm in my young twenties. Uh, I think I just turned 21 at the time actually. 
and they have families. They're they have investment portfolios. They got rental. <laughs> they got rental properties. They they're just a different breed of people. Yeah. They're not a bunch of punk ass 18 year old kids, yeah. you know, cleaning guns at armory all day. They yeah. have a different perspective. And that was like, I'm at the right place. Yeah. Uh, before we get into your time and, and deployments there, I, I am curious the once you came back from that uh, Fallujah deployment, the period between then and when you went on the Steel Curtain deployment, how, how was your time back home? Was it, were there, was it tough for you to be back there? And, or was it a super quick turnaround and you were just laser focused on getting back? It was, I was fine, I think. Um, <clears throat> you know, we one great thing that that battalion did when we got back from Fallujah, we had a Marine Corps ball, and I was in sniper school at the time, and they brought out all the family members of our wounded and, and killed in action, and that was so much closure for the guys. And, it, fuck, it was closure for me to see our friends that were amputees from that deployment that were there. We are all getting shit-faced at the Pachanga, you know, open bar, <laughs> you know, like... Fucking Pachanga. Yeah, the fucking Pachanga, awesome. dude. Yeah, and it was, um, that was a lot of closure for people. So I don't know if they consciously thought about it that way, but that was the best experience I ever had. The best Marine Corps ball I've ever been part of because we got to see and give thanks and praise to these these men's mothers yeah. that were there. And it was fucking powerful. So, but anyways, it was back on the deployment. It was, we were just back in the grind again. I'm a school trained sniper now. So I have, I've had my own team, a lot of responsibility and it's just train, 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 get ready to go. And uh, I definitely had this Fallujah mindset. And so I was like super amped. And then we get to our, our first place in the Iraq for the second deployment. And I'm like, this is not like Fallujah. It was just different fighting. I mean, fuck, now we have like a year and a half time span. TTPs are different. I'm in a different area. Like, but we all had this like Fallujah, like the, the survivors essentially had this like different mindset. And, uh, but some guys were always in the red still because they were expecting it. They weren't adaptive. And luckily in the sniper platoon, even though we're in the infantry battalion, there was a lot of adaptive mindsets there. And so it was easier to kind of like flex, but I would say it was pretty easy. Yeah. What, um, <laughs> How would you characterize the steel curtain operation? And I guess on top of that, what what was communicated to you as to why you were there and, and kind of what the big mish was? So <clears throat> I would say that deployment really was eye-opening for me. We, we were a MU. I think we were the 13th MU, and a lot of my military memory, I remember a lot of the, the trauma-based stuff, a lot of the statistics stuff I really don't recall that well. But uh, we were on a, on a muse. So basically we were on a ship and we uh, floated out of San Diego to, I think our first place was Hawaii. We were there for a week and a half, burned that fucking place down. Uh, I was underage drinking. Everyone on my team was above the age of 21. So they're like feeding me drinks and I'm in charge. I'm a team leader for my sniper team. And we burned that fucking place down. Then we go to Australia and we literally burned, we were in Darwin, Australia. We Dude. literally burned that place down. It's like a, a carbon copy of my, uh, <laughs> of one of my deployments. It's the same exact shit. Uh, working with Norforce. Yeah. And Dar out of Darwin. Yeah. And then like you're there and we're, I think we're doing like a week and a half of training and out there at the time, if you start a fire, you have to put it out. So we literally burned that <laughs> fucking place down uh, just from like blanks and like, you know, flashbangs here and there. And then uh, we party there. Then we go to, we go to uh, Singapore and yeah, Singapore and Hong Kong. And then we go to Iraq. Yeah, that's fucking crazy. So we have this like super chill entry yeah. level. And then we just have this compressed deployment. We get to Iraq and you're kind of like, man, I've been fucking getting tattoos and getting shit faced. Now I have to work. And then you're coming there in like the winter time. So it's like super fucking like windy cold. And I don't want like, I don't know about you, but like I never like to wear like a bunch of warming layers. Cause I didn't, I needed my dexterity and to move yeah. around. And uh, so, so to go have to play, you know, I sat on a couch this whole time. Now I had to go in onto the field. Like this sucks. And, but it was a very compressed timeline, and we were told that you know we're gonna we're gonna hit this one this one town. Well, this one town or the one city became another city, became another city, became another city, and I really realized that there was two wars going on uh, in Iraq. There was a war that the men were fighting, and there was a fucking war that uh, people were creating for the men that were fighting. I saw both perspectives because we never lived at a base; we always lived out in these cities that we're, we're patrolling through and we're pushing through. Uh, but when we come back to these big um, civilization bases to to refit, rearm, I got introduced to the 
non-combat side of people who their whole purpose in life is to tell you to clean your fucking uniform before you come into the chow hall or you can't bring that in here. Just a bunch of dumb shit. I'm like, bitch, you have no idea what we've been doing. Like they just, they were living in a different La La Land. Their whole deployment was making sure that there was fucking ice cream ready to go in. And I, I am not the type of guy, I'm not a badge holder that says, if you were, they call them pogues, right? I'm not a person like, if you didn't fight in combat or you didn't employ, you're not nothing. No, but if you're a piece of shit yelling at guys because their fucking uniform was dirty when they literally came off a fucking truck with body bags and you're saying you can't come into the chow hall because your uniform's dirty and they don't have a cover on like you're just a cock bag dude yeah and uh that was a big alarming thing because they kept on asking more and more from us and we kept on getting extended and extended uh for this deployment and uh it was so it wasn't like fallujah but fallujah <clears throat> was this like kind of like singular place drawn out this was a very compressed timeline you know we're looking about one to two days through each city i mean fuck, we cleared probably like six cities and violence you know a lot of violence and um it was it was just a different perspective for me that I, I was not used to because what part of the country were you in so we did um uh, like Useba, karbala ubaidi new ubaidi hit uh so whatever part of like an iraq that is i guess if you if you were to cut the country into thirds top you're, third middle third bottom third you're talking to a guy who could, did not know how to play football at my yeah. senior year yeah you're talking to a guy who did 15 and a half years in the military that you asked me geographic stuff. I was a dude that was good at my job. Yep. I didn't go past that. So you're not the map guy. I am not the map yeah. guy. Sorry. Um, from the contrast between being stationary and then moving around, did that impact uh, your guys' your guys's efficacy at all in terms of your ability to, to wage violence, or, or did it uh, actually help? It helped, man. Like back in the day, <clears throat> like I know there's that book Shooter, and I think he talked about this uh, – mobile sniper team well my fucking team was doing that and working with these infantry battalions or these not battalions but infantry uh companies these young officers these young lieutenants are like hey i want to best employ you and we were johnny on the spot we were good at our jobs so like they would give us all the support we needed because if we were able to bring back actual intelligence these dudes were actually able to do their job and so my my four-man team is in the humvees driving around like really unconventional shit that was quite dangerous but we mitigated as best as we could um, IEDs weren't as crazy of a thing back then. It was more V-bids and like house, house, uh, like death houses, uh, kill houses ambushed. Um, but we had a lot of freedom of maneuver to do that. We were still able to employ ourselves as a sniper element. Uh, so I mean, shit, we were going out as four man teams, linking up the reconnaissance guys who were just by ourselves, you know, a bunch of like senior guys, like an E6, maybe. And uh, we're out there for days at a time, just literally reporting back information. And we had so much autonomy to to influence the battle space and to report back to, like, you know, big caller people that are planning missions and planning routes. And it was honestly one of the, it was a greater deployment because we had so much freedom of movement and that gave us so much more ability to be deadly because instead of just you know staying in one place, we're actually able to influence by, hey, here's a route, here's this don't do this, do this. And that information to be relayed back to see it executed was like pretty powerful. Like these four dudes that were just burning down fucking Hawaii, yeah. you know, underage drinking, getting kicked out of Dukes, getting, yeah, getting, <laughs> getting kicked out of all this shit. Now yeah. we're like briefing some, yeah. some fucking officer and they're, they're planning these like next level missions. That's badass. Was there an operation that stood out as being the most wildly successful on that deployment? What was the big win? I don't know if there was a win really yeah uh, generally every place we went to we took casualties and i mean if you call a win taking over the, the city sure I, there was no like we made it to the top of the hill we planted a flag it was like we went through like these seven cities and then we were done with the deployment and then through that course we had casualties and we're like now we're back on a fucking ship without those dudes and we're like okay it was just it's just once again it's like weird i guess you have to like experience it you know yeah was there one that uh that was the biggest kick in the dick yeah um i think i was in um i think it was you don't ask me where the fuck that's out on the map um but one of my one of my guys on he was actually my assistant team leader in my sniper team he got kicked out of my platoon prior to this deployment because he wasn't going to take off his hog's tooth his uh sniper necklace that you get when you graduate it's a 762 round it's the round that's meant for you so as long as you wear it you're uh, supposed to be protected from the enemy sniper because that's the only person worthy to take your life 
And at the time I had a really toxic platoon sergeant who was super like equal rights to everybody and no more sniper school t-shirts, only platoon shirts and very this like unanimous cross the board type of shit. And um, it was very, very volatile in that platoon. It was very toxic and it was a lot of good old boy stuff and there was no unity. And that's when I started to get the bad taste in my mouth. Like I cannot stay here. Well, my guy, John Longoria, who was my sister's team leader, didn't take off his ship and I got they kicked, kicked him out for that. Kicked him out of my platoon. The fuck is that? Yeah. We were actually at this place called 29 Palms doing this like combined armed exercise. And, um, my platoon sergeant comes in and he's like, Hey, you fucking guys, you're taking off your necklaces. And these are dudes that I went to boot camp with school of infantry with sniper school with all these guys, my first deployment, second deployment now or before the second deployment. And they're all like looking around. He's like, you guys fucking better take off your shit. And I'm going to want to come back and better be off. And my guys are like, man, fuck you. And I'm like, dudes, like we worked our ass off to get here. Just take it off this bitch to come back and we'll put it back on. And they were like, not having that. And, um, I, I questioned myself if that was like the, the right move for me. Like, I don't feel like I fucking bend the knee for anybody. I just feel like I gained the game. The military is a big ass game. Life is a big ass game. And so you can like bend the knee and like be a fucking beta, or you can just like game the system and do what it takes to accomplish the mission. And that's what I feel the decision I made. These other guys died on their cross and they got kicked out for that shit. And we're on this, uh, I remember we're clearing through this, uh, this village, uh, uh, Beatty, I think that's what it was. And I'm on the rooftop and I just, I just coming up there to set up overwatch position. The grunts were up there just like murking shit. And, um, I get up there, I get engaged in the fight, dies down, even time comes and my, this platoon <clears throat> sergeant comes up to me. He's like, Hey, uh, uh, Longoria is dead. And I just looked up and I said, fuck you. I was so pissed and I was so hurt. Uh, basically John, uh, his squad, his fire team walked into this, uh, kill house that had basically a uh, machine gun bunker set up and fucking machine gun beat it down on the door. And John was fucking yay tall, the smallest dude out there, shortest guy out there. And he walked through the door and just got fucking mowed in half. And, uh, it like, it fucked me up. John was a close friend of mine. He just was everything to me. And, uh, I was already butthurt that these guys were kicked out of our fucking platoon for the most dumbest thing. Like that was just an emotional decision that this fucking douchebag made. And, you know, what if John was with my team? Would he be alive? Would he be dead? You know? Um, so that really bothered me. And I had this like disgruntled taste in my mouth for a very long time until I just, I had to let it go. Yeah. Uh, but that was the, probably the biggest kick in the dick was, uh, losing John. I mean, we lost a whole fucking squad. Don't get me wrong. Like all those fucking poor bastards, you know, my heart goes out to all of them. But, um, uh, John was my dude. We did everything together. And to, to see how that kind of played out, it was just, one of those things is like, fuck, if I would have went left, would we not have died? You know, if I would have went right, would he would have been alive? And um, some of those unexplainable things like how me and not him or how him and not me or so th those types of uh, combat or trauma situations really plagued me for quite a long time. Yeah, no, I can imagine that's uh, that's rough. Do you still have your hog's tooth necklace? I do. Yeah. You're not wearing it, though. I'm not wearing it, no. Is that something that... Uh you keep in a special place or like, is it a big deal to you that way? It was a big deal. Uh, I was definitely had a lot of ego in the military. I think you have to, to a certain degree to survive and to not be fucking stepped over because the great thing about the military is you can just do what you're told and you will receive whatever outcome that someone else has is destined for you. But if you speak up and stand your ground and fucking use literally the uniform code of military justice to fucking help you out, ask the comment out for a promotion, ask the comment for a promotion. And I love dude, that story, so many, by the way. Dude, you should look at the comments in that post people were like well you're the fucking problem or you just talking shit i'm like whatever man. Well, so to me that highlights what you said earlier is they don't make them like they used to they don't make them like they used to the military and is just not what it used to be it's not which i hate i mean it fucking pains me uh, to see guys like general millie who i can't fucking stand i can't believe he's he's the guy uh, and austin like those dynamic duo of dipshittery uh, just boggles my fucking mind. Um, <clears throat> that's a whole nother subject. That's an entire podcast. Um, all right. So you wrap that deployment up. It's first half vacation. Second half is turning and burning. Uh, take some heavies. You come home at that point you were disgruntled and you're like, I got to do something fucking bigger and better than this. Yeah. The force recon guys that were on the boat because that whole workup before that deployment, I was called the MSPF. I was the MSPF sniper team leader. So the maritime special purpose force, sniper team leader. So I, my team 
worked hand in hand with the force of constants guys. So I had a really great relationship with them. And I remember being out in like some like cold ass, I forget where we're at, uh, near like, um, uh, doesn't matter. This kind of training area, <clears throat> my, we, we insert with, uh, through a CH 47, my team patrols in, it's like cold and wet and like near Bridgeport. So it's fucking really cold. And, um, we're sitting in this like water hole of a bush for like four days reporting on a target with no objective, you know, like no peep, no, no pattern of life happening. And, um, you know, we're setting out the long wire every day to like just send reports back to the ship. And we're waiting on like the fourth, fourth and a half day for that night to come in. So the force team can come in and now match like, people magically appear on the target side. And <laughs> we're sitting <laughs> that back. Sounds so fucking familiar. It's yeah, ridiculous. We're sitting back all these reports <laughs> and, uh, all these spot reps and, I remember the guys, the force recon guys, they come in and they just like do their fucking job and they leave. I'm like, how do I get that? I'm like, what the fuck? They're, they're packs. They don't even have packs. They're, they're not carrying a 15 pound gun. Uh, and you know, for training wise, like these dudes are done with the missions. So they index, they end the mission. And then they end up just remaining overnight at this training site. This, this target objective objective, they bring in like this, like white box truck and they have like I didn't know what hot rats were back then or wet hots or something like that. It was like, they had like coffee and soup and like food. I'm like, what the fuck? And they're taking <laughs> care of us. I'm like taking care of my team. I'm like, dude, these dudes are fucking epic, right? They weren't selfish douches. And uh, so like, I knew that I needed to be around those types of people if I wanted to grow. And uh, and that's exactly what I did. I I'd asked them all the time, like, hey, on the ship, what's what's dive school like? Uh, what should I do for recon school? Or how many of this I got to do? And did you sound like that? Absolutely, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know, absolutely, <laughs> definitely the high pitch, high pitch voice. Yeah, I if you were if you were in that platoon and you would talk to me about anything, like, yeah. what was it like? You know, I just I wanted information because I, you know, now I know looking back a little bit more skill set. You know, you having the to visualize, you have to have that emotion with yeah. it to 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 actually bring it about. And so when these dudes are telling me stories, and I have like more combat experience than probably half those guys at this point, and not ego measuring, but just like experience. But I'm so like, thrilled with like, dude, what was it like to run on the beach with a pack? Yeah. What was it like to 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 tie your fucking hands and swim? Like, how did you do that? Like, I'm just mind blown because I have no idea what these guys have been through. Yeah. And so I got the information that I needed to sign up, and when I got back home. Uh, I remember going to see my mom and dad and I like bring my camis. I swim in, swim in the U, U, uh, YMCA pool and I get in trouble because I'm putting my head underwater, but I didn't give a fuck. And I sucked at swimming, so I needed all the help I could. So it was worth getting yelled at. And I went back uh, back to work and I showed up at like five o'clock at a poolside and it was all fucking, that was it. Was there resistance with your uh, sniper group that you were leaving? Like, did they not want to let you go or were they like, yep, yeah, fucking sign, sign the thing and... <laughs> Uh, so I got lied to, they, they told me that they were going to send me to ranger school, my infantry battalion. That was like this, like ploy to keep me there. Cause I was next in line to take over the sniper platoon. And, um, I'm like six. So I started like learning the ranger creed and all this type of shit. And, uh, one of the corpsmen was a ranger. So I'm like getting on the scoop about like, how, what do you do there uh, with that same exact <laughs> voice? And, uh, I come back, I'm like, Hey, I'm here to pick up my orders for, uh, for a uh, ranger school. And they're like, well, you're not <laughs> ranger school. You're not going to ranger school. I'm like noted uh and then i went to my sniper platoon commander and he's like he was super supportive he was a big fan of me uh like this dude literally did set up missions for me specifically my team on deployment to, to not only neutralize the enemy but to like do big epic shit because he could rely on us and i had a solid team uh so this dude was a big super fan of myself and he had no pushback he's like whatever you need let me know and yeah. that was a really great uh great support right there yeah what was the process like of you know, getting in, being accepted, showing up, the training, the selection, all that stuff. Kind of similar to my boot camp question, like what your expectations were versus the reality. For like reconnaissance? Yeah. <clears throat> so really reconnaissance was, um, I knew that I needed to get through initial screening and that was consisted of um, like a 500 meter swim, 30 minute tread water in your camis. Um, followed by like a 25 meter underwater crossover. And then you had to do a PFT. So like three mile run, pull-ups and uh, sit-ups. And I knew that was the initial thing to get in. You had to have a certain time. And so, but everything past that, you were like learning why you're there. And it was really just land navigation and rock running. That was, that was the premise of learning. Yeah. And so, but I was excited for the whole thing. Um, I had a few friends that were my sniper school instructors that were now force reconnaissance Marines 
like I said, I, I worked with them uh, for almost an entire workup. So I had friendships with them and we just kind of see how they operate and like kind of ask questions here and there and kind of see what they do when they're not doing training missions. But, um, you know, <laughs> really the, the true kick of the dick for me when it be, to become a reconnaissance Marine was RIP, a recon indoctrination program. And that was a two week program, ran at recon battalion. So we have reconnaissance battalion and force reconnaissance. Reconnaissance battalion uh, worked for infantry battalions and stuff like that, where force reconnaissance was the uh, deep target reconnaissance, um, uh, direct action, uh, long range reconnaissance patrol type of mission that worked for the MEF, the Marine Expeditionary Force. And so there was like some like disgruntlement that I was going to rip to, but I was automatically going to force reconnaissance as long as I passed. And um, there was a lot of like hate from some of my instructors but it is what it was. But that thing was like a kick in the dick. You know, we did nothing but constant back-to-back -back screenings, which I was not a great swimmer through any of this process. I got better along the way, obviously, because I got pushed and I, I learned that if I don't keep up, I'm going to wash out. And that just was like a non-negotiable that could not happen for me. Um, but we did a lot of hard things and uh, running was one of them and swimming was one of them. And every day I like wanted to quit there. It would like suck so bad. It was like... <clears throat> no matter how long or short the day was, it was like, you were like mentally tapped. At least I was. And, you know, being a, a two deployment guy, a little bit senior than everyone else, everyone else, there was like 18 year olds. Uh, it was a big culture shock. But what I realized when I actually got a chance to go to BRC, the reconnaissance school uh, down in Coronado, California, it was fucking easy. Relatively speaking, like this hard shit that I had just been doing for like a couple of weeks capitalized with the I had to do like a force indox. I had to do a separate indoctrination to, to get into force reconnaissance on top of to become a reconnaissance Marine. And all these little hard gates were like prepping me basically mentally and physically to go to recon school and like learn the process of how to be a reconnaissance Marine. And I really excelled there. I had an upper hand. I was already a scout sniper. So a lot of the information and knowledge was very uh, across the board the same. Really the only thing truly I took away from was like nautical navigation and not, yeah, basically like anything aquatics and nautical, um, rubber boats and, you know, maps and plotting and shit and lat long and everything else was like, I've already done this. This is fun. Now I'm like doing it and I'm like, you know, competing against, you know, helmets all day, you know, like the, the fucking buds guys are there and we're all talking shit to each other. And it was just like this com camaraderie of like people who are like in the suck, yeah. you know, and there's like this, like this, I don't know about this conception, but it's really weird to see like these basic boring buildings and there's so much happiness happening inside them. Like you don't know there's a bunch of like shaved head motherfuckers in there getting ready to go hit the surf. You just see a bunch of dudes running and like doing gnarly stuff. And with the beach right there, I mean, it's always a playground. Yeah. How so, long is BRC? Oh man. Shit. You're asking me timelines again. Um, maybe like a month and a half, two months, yeah. maybe. Um, and it was a blast for me. I was a summer class. So I think I started in May and I thought I was like top shit. You know, we're starting our days at like four 30 in the morning, five o'clock in the morning. I'd get off around like the same time in the evening time. And I'd go across, I'd go to, um, Mary calendars on Coronado. Yeah. I would do happy hour <laughs> and then I would go across the bridge and I'd go down Pacific beach down to Cabo Cantina at the time. And they had happy hour from like, I think seven to nine. I would double fist Pacificos and Patron Silver and just study my flashcards for my, for my next day test. And I literally did that every day that I was in Coronado, uh, that we weren't working or running up and down the beach all night. And it was a blast. I had a really good time. And, um, uh, I was always pissed off that the, the bud students were always getting jacked, like more jacked. You guys got all the food in the chow hall. They're like, you the Marines are like, you already had your one chicken breast. I'm like, bitch, I haven't eaten all day. Yeah. You know, I'm like, I get one chicken breast or I'm eating my MRE in the surf while you guys, I mean, you, you definitely earned your meal and buds. But, uh, you know, as we run down the beach, the same guys I see start with the class, they're just, their pecs are bigger, their backs are bigger. They're just doing pull-ups and UDT shorts. I'm like, we're malnutrition, <laughs> just looking like, just washed out like swabbies and like, it was, it was a fun thing. It was really enjoyable because I saw this thing on Discovery Channel my entire time, not BRC, recon school, but I saw buds. And so to be on the same beach and to do the same obstacle course and to see that GI Jane vibe kind of happen, yeah. it was like surreal. And that's probably what made my military career so epic for so, me. So not the Charlie Sheen vibe, the GI Jane vibe. Oh, yeah. You guys are definitely not as hardcore as like yeah. Charlie Sheen, but uh, definitely more GI Jane, you know? <laughs> All right, guys, I know, uh, as you can see, I have a beard. 
Uh, our good friends at Manscaped now offer the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. Uh, and I'm going to level with you. You can do the face beard or you can do the, uh, the groin beard. You can still use this uh, in all the places you've been using it before. However, this is designed for the beard. And since I have one, they sent me this kit and it's phenomenal. Uh, the guard system is great. Uh, it does not snag uh, the way a lot of other beard trimmers do and have. Uh, it's got a titanium blade that, uh, you know, is very sharp yet still uh, gentle enough to not uh, screw your face up and, and give you the nicks and cuts that, uh, that again, a lot of other products do. Um, this cordless trimmer, uh, it has one, this one guard does 20 different lengths. So, if you want to, uh, you know, give yourself a face mullet and, uh, you know, business in the front and party down below, if you will, uh, you, you certainly can do that. There's a lot of adjustability with it. Um, I, I will say this titanium blade is kind of the, uh, the varsity squad of this unit, if you will. It, um, it's really, really high quality, and you can tell when you're using it um, both in, in its action and just looking at it, feeling it. Uh, it's a very, very high quality piece of gear, uh, and it keeps my beard looking the way that it does. What's awesome is they also have beard shampoo, because uh, God knows you can get some stuff in the beard. You've got beard oil to give it uh, that lay down shine that uh, all the ladies love. You've got uh, beard conditioner, which again, if you're in the shower and you want to uh, fluff it up a little bit, that's your huckleberry. And uh, you got the beard balm, uh, which, again, if you uh, don't like quite the oil uh, but want more of a balm, you've got that. There's a, a beard brush, kind of similar to almost like a curry comb, uh, and then also your wooden beard comb, which uh, I use the hell out of this thing. So uh, this complete kit is awesome. Um, it, it's new from them. They've uh, historically been uh, kind of the nether regions uh, manscaping products, uh, which again, uh, I still use and are still phenomenal and you can take the guard off uh, and still use it uh, for this, but, uh, you can get 20% off and free shipping, uh, with the code mic drop, all one word at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. That's mic drop. If you have a beard, order this. If you want to shave your pubes, order it also, and you can still use those products on your face or wherever you feel like using them. But Manscaped has been great. I use their product. I have for a number of years. Uh, they are my go-to uh, trimming piece of gear. So uh, go check them out. That's manscaped.com. Mic drop, all one word for 20% off and free shipping. Do it. Uh, all right. So you, like you go through that and, uh, and it's sounds like uh, it was more of a cakewalk again, comparatively not to minimize the training, but uh, once you finished that, then where did you go? So once I finished that, I, <clears throat> and just to be clear, BRC was difficult. There was a lot of times, uh, you know, late night. I mean, do were fucking the, the up and down the sand dunes, you know, there's plenty of times that it sucked, but I learned at that point, like it's part of the process and nothing was going to stop me. So I'd never, I I'd never thought I wasn't going to graduate uh, yeah. BRC. Uh, but after that process, I went to jump school. Sorry. I went to yeah, I went to jump school, came back. Nope. I went to Sears School on Coronado on Long Island, North Island. Um, then I went to jump school. And then when I came, when I was at jump school, Marsoc actually stood up. So force reconnaissance, uh, first force reconnaissance down at Camp Pendleton took down our flag and they hoisted up the Marsoc first MSOB at the time, Marine Special Operations Battalion. And um, I come back to a whole new like construct. I was like, what the fuck just happened? Uh, instantly, like more money magically appeared and new training missions started happening. I remember I got back from jump school, my whole, um, my whole force company now Marslock, we're doing this like gnarly, like rock run combatives, like obstacle course day, like really hardcore shit on, the, on every Friday. We did something pretty gnarly in uh stuff that was not easy. And I remember having a brief by our commander, like everyone's on relaxed grooming standards. You're gonna get no shaved shits, and uh, people are gonna start wearing civilian clothes around here. We're like, dude, we're like, we made it. This is it. I'm like a fucking Jason Bourne. This is before Jason Bourne, and um, we we're all super excited. And that literally lasted like a week, if that. And then you know the Marine Corps weenie came and like you're shaving and you suck and play small again and do as I just yeah. a bunch of weird shit and cover up your tattoos. Cover up your. I mean, everyone there was kind of tattooed. And it was at the yeah, people weren't as douchey back then. The policies 
were not as lean as when I first came in. This is like 2007 time frame now, and it, it was kind of ish, whatever. Yeah. But uh, the uh, the mindset was we switched from uh, these force companies or these force platoons to these uh, special operations teams uh, or, you know, MSOT, Marine Special Operations Team. And uh, so now we're like a 14-man team or actually we're like a seven-man team. Uh, now we're broken up doing direct action and special reconnaissance. So we have two of those teams on each uh, platoon. And we had two platoons per company at the time. And uh, we're getting told we're preparing to go to Iraq. And really, we had this influx of, we, we had access now to the NSW uh, that they're, that, uh, I forget what it's called, but like the armory where like they have all the Gucci guns. And at this time also, uh, Det 1, Detachment 1 was Marslock or the Marine Corps' first special operations unit that was actually doing stuff in OF1, OF2. And then they were disbanded and they basically integrated into Marsock. So we had these like crazy dudes with like gnarly backgrounds. Like every one of them was a ranger. Every one of them was like a jump dive, free fall sniper, fucking you name it. They were that. Uh, a lot of ex uh, experience with like various applications, working with uh, NSW, working with uh, Army Army Special Missions Units and uh, coming in to see these Titans. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. Cause I'm just a young kid. I'm, I literally think I made it. I'm a fucking show off and completely immature and these dudes are like we're here to fucking do work and i'm like me too i'm also <laughs> just gonna like wear flip-flops all day in a tank top and like yeah. be a fucking kid <laughs> yeah so uh but it was it was interesting for sure that's wild you know i was thinking about it if if you were there and you went through brc in like 07 uh 2006 i think it went to brc yeah. so i mean i was a seal instructor at that time so there's a a solid possibility that uh, that we saw each other on on Coronado or NAB Coronado at that time, which is kind of wild. Um, <clears throat> how long did you, or how long did it take from the time that you kind of joined, uh, got got through BRC and formed up with these guys until you actually deployed with them? Uh, <clears throat> maybe five, six months potentially. Was that drinking from a fire hose in that that amount? It was a lot because there was a lot more eyes on us now that we are a special operations unit. So we had a lot more certifications we needed to go to, a lot more qualifications we needed to have because at that time, SOCOM would come down and like check us off like, hey, are they able to do X, Y, and Z? This mission essential task list. Are you doing what every other, you know, uh, special operations unit is doing and capable of? So that part was like really cool because there was a lot of, you know, it was the best training I ever had. All the weapons I could possibly imagine, way more access than I had as a sniper in the infantry. I was a sniper again at this time for this deployment or for this workup. So, I mean, I had fucking four sniper rifles to myself, wow. um, you know, two sets of nods. I had three suppressors for multiple guns. Like I, it was, it was like a dream come true. I'm flying on black Hawks one sixtieth, and I'm wearing multicam. Like I'm literally doing I'm crazy urban stuff. I'm doing all sorts of shit that I never got to do in the infantry. And I was like, this is where I'm supposed to be at. This is like super ninja. Yeah. And, um, we're, we're getting ready to deploy. And once again, I find myself on a, on a MU. We're supporting a MU because at the time, force reconnaissance platoons or companies were deploying with MUs. They were like the, the, the SIL team or SIL platoon on, on, a, on a boat. And uh, they're like, oh, we're going to Iraq. And we're like, okay, what are we doing in Iraq? We're like no one fucking knew. And, uh, but then we ended up finding ourselves going to Afghanistan. So I'm like, oh, this is even cooler. We got diverted, like, yeah. just like in the movie, you know, G.I. <laughs> Jane, you know, they, they got diverted. G. G. Yeah, man. G. I mean, G.I. Jane is truth. I, you guys just need to accept it. But, uh, um, <laughs> there's no checks there. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Close. There's yeah. Been, there's been a few that have tried, but, uh, man, that's wild. So, uh, so the, the very first deployment you did, uh, as a Marsat guy was to Afghanistan. Yeah. It was, uh, in the, uh, Helmand, Helmand Valley. Yeah. Obviously, there's a big difference between where you were uh, or the, the unit uh, that you were with versus where you're at now. Was it blatantly obvious um, immediately on the ground, uh, you know, that it was like varsity squad now and, and what you were doing and who you were working with and how you were conducting business was just on a whole different fucking level? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <clears throat> I was exposed to all different types of TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures that I was never exposed to in the infantry. I mean, fuck, in the infantry. I remember waiting for, we found an IED on my second deployment and we were waiting there for a day and a half for an EOD tech to come and deal with it. Well, I have an EOD tech with me, you know, like I have all these different assets and a lot of beeps and squeaks type of shit happening where they're targeting things. I'm like, you can do that. So like engaging 
targets was like way easier to do. Uh, and so it was, uh, it was a whole new level. I mean, we're the whole deployment. We're in gun trucks. I was never in a truck, had a deployment where I was in a truck the entire time. So I'm a trunk monkey. So I'm in the back of this GMV, you know, super heavy tactical Humvee vehicle. And I have a Sasser, a 50 cal sniper rifle and a swing mount. Then I got a 240 golf on a swing mount and two sniper rifles in the back. I got my carbine. I got a fucking, you know, 60 millimeter mortar. I got everything. I'm like, this is epic. I got my Gatorade protein shakes, which are like straight <laughs> garbage, you know, that's, you know, and I'm just like this, like big powdery dust ball. And I fucking hate everything because yeah. my team is nice and warm inside and they're not dirty. And I'm just like, they're like, Cody, hand me a water. I'm like, fuck you, get your own water. You know, like I'm just this disgruntled person in the back just eating moon dust. Yeah. God so, damn. What uh, What was the first engagement like uh, when you were there? Man, it was completely different because I was so used to closer engagements. When I got to Afghanistan, it was much further engagement. So I'm like, you know, 100, 200 meters, sometimes out to like 700 plus meters. And that was new. I was not expecting something like that because um, why would I? I've never been to Afghanistan at this point. Um, but the, I remember the first engagement, uh, we had, it was epic. I mean, it was, life was simple back then. Everything, especially in a vehicle, everything is an L shape. Yeah. You set up an L shape. We conduct humanitarian assistance. We gather information and then guess what happens? People want to fight. Then you fight and you're already set up for, to do damage. And, uh, it was pretty normal, but I remember my team leader at the time, he was like, Oh, we got in a firefight. I'm like, dude, this is just nothing. Cause I was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. It was in Fallujah. Like, cause I was a dick and I'm like, man, some of these guys are losing their fucking mind. I'm like, yeah, it's it just gnarly. But I'm like, but you guys don't know what it's like. It was much crazier back then. So, you know, I guess I was that guy back then, but, uh, yeah. you know, it was, it was, it was fun. Was there, um, kind of similarly, to you know, my other question about both deployments, were there operations that stuck out as being uh, exceptionally uh, that, that went exceptionally well, and or were there any that uh, you know were like, "Holy shit, we just got our ass handed to us"? Uh, not really ass handed to us, and exceptionally well, I think got shot down before the inception of it. So during like we had this mission, I was a free fall team, and so we we submitted this package to to hey ho in a uh, high altitude high high opening and i'm just like this is fucking epic dude i have like velcro ak mags like we're gonna we're gonna jump in and we're gonna do a remain behind in this village and set up and there's a bunch of intelligence that there's like a cell there and we're basically gonna wait for them to conduct their meetings and like do till death and we submit this target pack we submit this mission and i'm like dude this is happening bro this is crazy and it got denied. They're like, who the fuck do you guys think you are? The only people doing that mission was tier one units. Yeah. Um, and GI Jane. Yeah. And GI Jane, you know, she didn't make the cut for that though. So I will give yeah. you that credit. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Charlie Sheen was actually there though. But yeah. uh, uh, so we, nothing too crazy, but it was just like a bunch of fun stuff that I never experienced. You know, now I'm working with other soft units from around the globe, uh, checks and, you know, using their guns and their assets and uh, dealing with uh, army green rays now. And, just a whole different it was more like this wild west there wasn't many fire bases there there wasn't a lot of conventional this is a big uh, big soft little conventional uh, environment so there's only special operations guys out there for the most part and you really had free reign to do what needed to happen and we we operate on a three-day cycle so three-day combat reconnaissance patrol three days out three days back three days out three days back and one mission that went completely south, and I, I still remember to this day because it fucking screwed over spaghetti night. Um, and we had the best, this a local national on our base made the best spaghetti, that type of spaghetti that like eats through your tray that you can see through yeah. it, it becomes transparent. Oh my God, it was so good. It stains Tupperware. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, we go out on this three-day mission, and uh, I was really worried because a couple days prior, I was in the gym allowing my ego to lift, and... Uh, a lot of guys were into like rock climbing back then, at least in the in the teams. And I'm like doing like two finger pull ups. Why I'm like, oh look, guys, I can do it too. And my forearms are so shot, I couldn't even like grip my rifle. Yeah. And I was like, dude, I cannot go out on patrol like this. And luckily, it all buffed out before we went out. But it was our time to go up for this uh, mission. And uh, at the time, we had a trailer platoon, so we had an infantry squad, infantry platoon attached to us that were like our drivers and other type of stuff. And they were our fast guys essentially a lot of them were good some of them sucked but the leadership was kind of like horrible 
And I remember this, this captain who was super eager, super motivated, who was not one of our people. Uh, we get in this L shape. We, uh, my sniper team's on the outside. We're doing cordon. We're hitting up squirters, dealing with a lot of that type of stuff. And he pursues these, uh, these basically evading Taliban fighters. And he's like, drive, drive through the wall. And he tells his driver to like drive this GMV through this like ancient mud wall. And you know, these mud walls, the type that take like shit ton of charges to blow a hole in it. He drives his Humvee through it, rips up the whole front end. And long story short, we win the, what we win the fight victory, but there's this like busted truck. Well, at this time, we've already destroyed so many uh, GMVs. We are calling it airstrikes on them because we had an old Russian mine, get a, a tire buster or some like, you know, something fucked up on it. And they're like, you guys have destroyed enough government property. <laughs> so you guys are waiting for the Brits to come haul you out. Jesus. And I'm like, and I'm so pissed because I'm going to be back tonight and I'm going to smash the spaghetti. And this dude's kind of like a moron. And at this time, our, our uh, Afghan National Army, they, they got so high, they ate all their MREs and they're like, give me fucking more food. And we're like, bitch, you ain't got no more food. You got what you got. And they're like, it got really volatile for a second. And so they do what they did best. They go into the town, they pillage that shit. They come back and they get their food and their chai and, and more fucking weed. And they're doing the thing and I find myself uh, on watch and it's like later that night time and villagers start coming back and they're burying their dead and uh, like, you know, the fighters and shit like that. And there was this ridge line in the background that uh, we were taking like shots from and uh, signal intelligence was saying like, Hey, there's some cells up there. They're regrouping to come down and fight. Well, we were also one of the few elements at the time to Winchester. So basically rid all the ordnance in a B one bomber, uh, at the time, and they uh, called in this airstrike on this ridge line. Well, that information did not get sent over the radio chatter. It's like a zero two in the morning type of type of operation. And I'm laying in the back of my gun truck, kind of like bundled up as much as possible because it was cold as shit. And the whole fucking everything just starts to shake and tremble. I'm like, oh my god, uh, what, what is it Armageddon? I think was a call sign or whatever. At the time, like we're being overran, like. <laughs> Help, there's not going to be any Americans left. And I'm like, dude, it was so violent. Our trucks are just getting pelted by like, you know, rocks and debris and uh, all these secondary explosions are taking place in this ridge line. And it was super gnarly. And long story short, we had to wait like two more extra days. So we're out there like five days now. And you're just hanging out to fucking dry. Yeah, dude. And it was so stupid. We were like pissed because we couldn't maneuver. We basically just like wagon wheeled around and set up a security posture. We weren't doing any patrols. Like we just <clears throat> fucked up this village. They know where we're at. We just dropped a shit ton of, you know, ordnance on this ridge line. Like we're just kind of sitting ducks out here. So it was like very shitty to be there. Uh, and we had to wait these extra days for the Brits to come in with their tracks and like basically like haul this thing out. So we had plenty of opportunity to get back late on IUDs and all type of stuff. And luckily we got back home safely with no issues. Um, the perks of Afghanistan at that time, there wasn't a lot of main MSRs. It was kind of like find the route that you don't see any tracks on and go that way the only thing we had to worry about was like old russian back laid uh, mines that were there from their their involvement yeah jesus how long was that deployment uh that was a six month deployment six month. and was pretty much the whole deployment uh, conducted in, in a similar fashion yeah. yeah we did a couple of like company operations where we had like the whole both platoons out at the same time but it was generally just three days out three days back and on that cycle yeah you go back uh, what was the turnaround time from that deployment until you went back over Probably so. I get on that deployment. I had a chance to go to. Uh, I didn't have a chance. They were we were starting up the Marslock Schoolhouse down in North Carolina, and there was a list of guys that already had like slots to go there. I was not one of them, uh, but at the time I wanted to go to a uh, trial for a special missions unit. So I'm like, well, fuck. If I go out to the East Coast, I'm probably gonna increase my chances to like be able to go try out. So I took uh, one of the guys in my team, in my platoon's uh, orders out there. So. I got back from the deployment and 30 days later, I was on the East Coast and I was there um, basically the whole first, I don't know, two months, three months. We're basically creating the curriculum for what would be now called ITC individual training course. And uh, that's like the nine month program for all the Marsat guys. And we're going through the process ourselves to basically prove it. We call it op, uh, instructor development course or instructor agility training. Doesn't matter, whatever it was. <clears throat> so we're doing like all the shit, proving the concepts, getting our check rides. Uh, and then I was teaching our special reconnaissance. And then I was also teaching our sniper school or our advanced sniper course. And so probably about, 
this is September 2007, 2008, I was there. So just about um, beginning of the following year, uh, I was um, running our, I was not running it, I was at our selection. I was a uh, guest cadre in there. And I get a phone call from my boss and he's like, hey, dude, uh, do you want to deploy to Afghanistan? There's a, um, like a desk job billet open. And I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. Because I knew if I could get to Afghanistan, I could find my way to a team. So I'm like, let's do it. So the turn and burn from coming back from my first Mars like deployment going out on my second one was probably maybe seven months. It was pretty quick. Yeah. And so, um, you know, this now, cause a billet at the schoolhouse is about like a three year commitment, three, four year commitment. So I was only there, we did the math cause I, I deployed a uh, once and I was at all these schools. So I was really only in the schoolhouse for like a year and a half. Uh, but I came back from selection, uh, grabbed all my guns and shit. They're like, you don't need all that. You're filling a, I call it, they call it an IA billet, an individual augmentation billet. So essentially my mission was to, um, go work at the, uh, Siege of Soto combined joint special operations task force in Afghanistan. And I was going to work some desk job and fucking crunch numbers, which I'm not above anything. Um, it was my first joint billet. And I learned from a young age in the military that like to diversify yourself, to make you like more of an asset. So I was open for that experience. Uh, so I deploy and <clears throat> I'm like, this is fucking stupid. I, I saw behind the <laughs> curtain and I'm like, not only was my job title stupid, but I just realized how much wasted assets are out there and how much people behind a fucking computer screen do not give a fuck about the men and women on the objective. Um, it was very apparent. They were definitely out there for their ice cream and their fucking bronze stars in the deployment. Uh, it was a culture shock, but you know, I did what I did best and I made shit happen. I fucking owned my job. I found all the gaps. I plugged them and I started making contacts and connections with everyone there. And to, I'm like, well, how can I best support the mission? for the men down range. So I made, you know, with the supply people, the contracting people, uh, the medics, like all these types of things. Uh, I just started like befriending these people. I was also doing, um, part of the B doc for the PSD, uh, for the base. So like driving the commander around and, you know, learning a little bit about, a uh, little bit about that and doing, tr doing, uh, you know, high speed SUV runs to, uh, to the embassy and, you know, really feeling like a badass and doing really anything I could to get outside that stupid office, which, you know, I never understood this about the military and there's a lot of jobs like this too, where it's, if you're there, you're working yeah. vice. It's that perception of it, whether you did your job or not, like they want you in the office cause they want everyone to suffer collectively. And I was like, whatever I got to do to avoid this, like that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Were there any close calls on that deployment for you? <clears throat> uh, yeah, because so <laughs> on that deployment, probably about like a month into it, I started to look for gaps that I could fill. So I started to read all the reports from the Raider teams that were coming in and I found this one specific team down at uh, this FOB called FOB Robinson in, in Hellman Valley. And they were dealing with a lot of sniper and a lot of sniper stuff. And I had a lot of experience with counter sniper uh, from my previous deployments. And so I would go up to uh, the CG Soda commander and the CG Soda sergeant major every day and be like, sir, there's this fucking gap that I can fill. And we were homies. Like this dude had a picture of me, um, you know, <laughs> picture getting me. into some weird shit. Yeah. I mean, well, so, a little quick backstory. So you saw that post that I did about saying I asked the comment on the Marine yeah. Corps to promote me. Well, the true backstory is that morning I re-enlisted. I was a, already a staff sergeant. I was an E6 and I was selected for gunnery sergeant. So I was already just waiting. I was so junior. I had to like wait my whole year before I actually pinned on the rank, but I was, it was already mine. I just had to not fuck up. Well, working at a combined joint unit, <clears throat> they, um, it's like everyone there is like an E6 and you're like a peasant. Yeah. And the E7s had a little bit more fluff. And I'm like, fuck, I'm trying to get like, <clears throat> peed on people thinking I like some chump. So I asked the CGSO commander to promote me, to, to re-enlist me that day. So he did. And he's a little short guy. Uh, Douglas Bulldog was his name. You ever heard that name? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So good old, good old, general, uh, good old Doug Bulldog. Uh, he uh, re-enlists me and I give him this big ass hug. And PAO is there, the combat camera guys. They took a picture of it. I'm like, yo, give me that shit. And that's the day, as soon as I got re-enlisted, I went to this big brief where the combat Marine Corps was at. And that's when I asked like, hey, sir, I'm selected for gunnery sergeant. Can you promote me? And the fucking crowd was wild. And that's the backstory of that story. Well, I got, so now I'm briefing the, the commander every fucking Friday for like the battle update brief or whatever they called it. Some other thing, right? Another PowerPoint to do. Yeah. 
And towards the end, the combat camera does this like thing where like, sir, here's the picture of the week. And it's like some fucking dog attacking somebody or like some, some victory story, right? Something epic on the battlefield. And then he's like, sir, I got one more picture for you. And I took into Photoshop this picture of a bulldog and myself. I hugged him and like I'm towering over him. And I put a big ass heart around it. And I said, see, just sort of alpha BFFs, dude, he pressed that slide. And I'm in, there's like 75 very senior leaders and officers enlisted in this room. He presses a button on his remote and dude, big as shit. I pop up on all these monitors and it says the heart with the BFFs and people were like, what the fuck? Losing their mind. And Doug just laughs, dude. He's like, yes, printed that shit out, put it on his refrigerator yeah, awesome. in his awesome, in his, in his office. And you know, every day, man, I'm just like, dude, I'm a force multiplier, right? That's our job. Find a capability gap and find ways to fucking facilitate and plug it. So every day I'm asking, hey, sir, I found this, this gap in this team. Uh, the sniper of the team, he's not, gonna, he's not coming back. They're a man short. I can fill this gap. I know what to do. He's like, we need you here. You know, that, that story. And he wasn't wrong. Well, one day I'm uh, flying out to another base uh, just to like get some reporting from the guys and to meet some of these faces that I've been talking to on the phone. And on the way back of this C-130, they call it a trash flight. It was like the last night red-eye flight. It was me and my SEAL buddy. And just a crew and on the way back, heading back to Bagram, there was this fucking explosion inside the aircraft and the hydraulic uh, machine like exploded and like it's leaking fluid everywhere. And the flaps, the plane is like yawing in the sky now. And they're like, we can't get the flaps down, the landing gear down. We're like, fuck, we're going to die. And, you know, our gear is like strapped to the center of the aircraft. And I instantly get up and start throwing parachutes towards the ramp because <laughs> the parachutes that were next Holy to fuck. us. Yeah, it's like it was fucking gnarly the parachutes that were next to us are just getting sprayed with this hydraulic fluid. I'm like, fuck that shit. I throw these other ones towards the ramp and the crew is start throwing us cans of fluid. And we're like using our Gerber to crack open the cans. And we're like trying to fill it into this reservoir as quick as we possibly can. And we're breathing in all this nasty shit. It's like, it's like, it's like obviously deadly as shit. And it's very painful to breathe. It's like hot, steamy poison mist, right? And it's just going everywhere. And they finally get enough pressure to like lower the ramps or to lower the landing gear and to adjust the flaps when we touch down. And I'm yeah. like, oh, just another day in paradise. Well, we get down there and there's a whole like crew ready to like take us to the, to the hospital. Cause like we're drenched in hydraulic fluid from head to toe and uh, get to the hospital. And I feel like the biggest bitch. There's like dudes fucking dying. There's dudes missing limbs. There's bullet hole fucking people. I'm just like, fuck, I just had hydraulic fluid and and i was a douche super douche at the time like there's all these like hot air force nurses like <laughs> is your chest okay and i'm like the guy like did you put did you put something in this iv because i think i'm in love like i'm just like i'm like this is a new experience for me and i'm just like running with it right and uh long story short everything you know at the time seems to buff out and the next day uh bulldog comes down he gives this my still buddy and i uh these uh army uh army accommodation medals and he's like, oh, these, these guys did a great job, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, we're going to send Alfred to Fod Robinson. And, you know, basically he's like, go out there. And after 30 days, if you're not impacting the battlefield, I'm bringing you back. I'm like, yes, sir. Well, I spent the rest of my deployment out there with this uh, MSOT, this Marine Raider team. And I get to the team and my mind is blown because we were still like a force reconnaissance special operations unit from my previous deployment. But in that gap of time, now with their MSOT, they're, they're, they're a 14 plus man team. They have their own engineers. They have basically every asset. And what made MARSOC great and still does is that we're self-enabled special operations units. So we don't take augments from other people. We have everything internal to us. We just have those attachments from the big Marine Corps. Uh, and we, we have them specialized into our team. So we deploy with everybody. So it's almost like the same uh, formula as the tier one guys, kind of. Yeah, basically. So we're just fully enabled. So like you can literally drop, we, we can deploy ourselves, redeploy ourselves. And we have every asset that we need to conduct any type of special operations mission. Yeah. And I was like really blown away. And everyone's in like woodland camis and beards. I'm like, what the fuck? Like it was just completely, I mean, they're flying in on sixties every night conducting raids. I'm like, this is shit I've never done. I was completely new on ATVs and dirt bikes. I'm like, bro, this is the big leagues. And so I get to this team and, you know, a couple of the guys were my sniper school instructors, uh, other guys I knew when I was a sniper in the infantry, cause they were force reconnaissance guys I was looking up to. And 
some of the guys I actually put through school, actually the team leader, Matt Manukian, he was a, uh, the MSOT team leader at the time. I actually put him through the first MARSOC ITC. I was a, I was a, uh, I was a like I said, taught observation and reconnaissance, all this other type of shit. And so it was really cool uh, to experience all that type of stuff. And then I just fit in with a team. Did you guys get some? <laughs> Fuck yeah, like all the time. It was like, it was so gnarly and we were making such big headlines uh, that word got back to the states that cody alford who was to fill an individual augmentation billet being fucking desk jockey was on battle rosters conducting missions where we're taking casualties where we're fucking calling airstrikes where we're calling in resupplies and all this other type of shit and it it really started to alarm people in the back they're like if we lose a guy that's supposed to fill a desk job like this could be bad for us like it was it was weird like i I don't know, my whole Marine Corps career, like I had never stayed off anyone's radar. I was always on someone's radar. Uh, it wasn't always for bad things. I don't think it was never ever really for bad things, but except for a few, but. But now you're doing naked cartwheels on the. Now I'm doing naked radio. cartwheels on, on uh, ATVs. And uh, it was, it was a great, it was a great time. I learned so much in that deployment and these guys took me in and like basically spun me up and like how things are done now, because even though I was at the schoolhouse and I had all this experience, they're they're doing it they're 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 new so it was i was all open ears i mean we're working with the uae soft and uh i have now i have a whole afghan national army unit that i'm working with vice just a couple of guys um do you guys have any dogs we did have dogs we had a uh, perda per purdy perda was her name and he was a uh, we had he was an army dog handler i forget his name specifically but perda was his dog and uh this like fucking massive german shepherd which did not like explosions and we always had to like throw him throw him over walls and shit like that and he just was like you're like Ugh, please don't eat me uh but he was all about his job and his handler was super epic i mean the army really fucking gave us like a, a, a fucking top tier dude uh this this is way back before we had our own internal dogs and um that was the only thing we did not have organic to us at yeah. that time but uh yeah that that whole deployment was that was pretty gnarly it was a bunch of like everything that i wanted to do in the marine corps all wrapped into like one deployment yeah as you guys know, uh, health and fitness is a big part of my daily routine and my lifestyle. I have a number of guests that come on that, uh, you know, that we talk about all, all sorts of things, health and fitness related, uh, diet, nutrition, et cetera. Uh, I started taking athletic greens a few months ago here uh, for that reason is that it's a uh, all, all encompassing vitamin and mineral supplement, 75 vitamins and minerals. Uh, it's lifestyle friendly, whether you do keto, paleo, vegan, it's dairy free, gluten free, uh, less than one gram of sugar. There's no uh, GMOs or nasty chemicals. There's no artificial anything in it. Uh, and it's just very nutrient dense and uh, and gives you that that supplementation that you need to combat cold and flu season coming up to bolster your immune system uh, and just help with a with a healthy lifestyle. Um, right now, the, the subscription, if you sign up for it, comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which again uh, is, is crucial to uh, immune support, as well as five uh, on-the-go packets uh, with that first purchase. Um, whether you want to invest in, in your health or just supplement an, an already existing protocol that you have, uh, Athletic Greens has been a, a phenomenal staple uh, that I've added into my regimen, and I couldn't be happier to be working with them. Uh, if you want in on that deal, go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop. Um, and they, they do a phenomenal job at uh, all the things that uh, health and fitness um, wise need to be done on a daily basis. So check them out. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash mic drop and they will hook you up with that uh, special deal. Was there a, a mission that stood out as being uh, epic, the most epic? Yeah. Yeah. Uh it was uh, basically <clears throat> our whole job was to provide disruption operations. We were um, conducting missions. So at the time, village stability operations was kicking off. And for people that don't know what that means, basically like embedding a special operations unit inside of a village so they can build that local rapport and build some fucking schools and bridges and wells and basically like start a militia and make these people self-sufficient, right? And so, and defend themselves from like the fucking horribleness over there. So we, we plan this mission. We fly in, uh, super epic, dude. You know, just, I love it, dude. I love the silence that comes from like the violent sound of a helicopter when all you see is the green eyes and everyone's just like fucking in the zone. You're like, oh yes, this is it. Well, 
we were having 160 us insert us the whole time. Well, then they kinked it. And they were trying to bring in the Marine Air Wing to give them some love. And I love you, Marine Air Wing, but they're just, they're not trained like the 160th, unfortunately. And it's not like they're not capable. They just don't get the training. Uh, and so now they're telling us we're going to insert with Ospreys. And we're like, fuck that shit. Because Ospreys at this time were fairly new aircraft and they were browning out on inserts. They're props are hitting terrain they're flipping over they're crashing like i'm just like dude this is it's a big school bus with like is it a helicopter is it an airplane what is it and uh so they're telling us we're inserting with this uh, marine air wing unit we're like fuck this sucks like the chances are already high so we we insert we do this like long like 4k patrol to this uh back guy you know backyard of the uh, you know shitheads territory and so we didn't have to worry about like ieds or stuff like that so it was really cool and uh we go up to this uh, compound that we're going to take over. We set up our, uh, you familiar with like a um, jack charge? Hmm. Basically, it was like um, your data sheet, three blocks of C4, 100 foot of a deck cord, 50 foot of deck cord. And I mean, we had two of these placed and basically it blow like a man sized hole in these like big three foot, you know, ancient walls. We go inside uh, and secure the objective, uh, wrap up men's military age males get follow on intelligence, sit on patrols, basically secure the whole site. And then we basically bunker ourselves up in the same building that we just blew up uh, to get into it. And our whole mission was to ambush shit. So later that morning, uh, like super early, like 0304, we sent out an ambush uh, team to basically go set up a, a fucking kill house. And they were going to draw in the fucking fighters and we were all going to fucking kill them. Sounds really cool. And I remember being on in our compound that we took over originally, um, and the I hear on the radio like, I got th I got three guys, I, I see five people, and like dude, like numbers are increasing and, and the in information's increasing, and basically what they're doing, they're talking about these guys are just walking by their their ambush house, and the comms go quiet, and we're like, what the fuck's going on? And then you just hear like suppressors going off in the background. You're like, epic. You know, then you hear grenades and you hear machine guns and it's like fucking all out violence. And long story short, they, they smoke a couple of these guys, uh, but the rest of the fighters uh, move, flee to this like deflate in the surrounding area. So our point now was they're scoping these dudes out and I was a sniper and uh, Matt, my team leader was like, Hey, I need you to patrol over there. And fucking go support these dudes i'm like you want me to fucking patrol from here to there by myself sure that sounds like a good idea so i'm patrolling with my 300 wind mag and my carbine and i'm like checking everything left and right because i'm like i felt like a badass going by myself but i was also like this is fucking stupid and i was just linking up with the uh, remain behind element that was going to bring me into their stronghold and so long story short i get there no big deal well we end up sending out a patrol to like basically eradicate the, the remaining fighters well, there was a charge thrown and long story short, uh, one of the walls of the compound that we're uh, basically moving into crumbled and it hit one of our UAE partner forces, broke his fucking feet, uh, his uh, pelvic bone. And this guy was massive. And we're like, fuck, shit's real. And we're taking fire from the outside. So now we're pinned down this very small, maybe eight by eight, very shitty building, if you want to call it that. Well, we had no Skedka. We had no stretcher with us. We had no morphine on us. We're like, shit. So the uh, lieutenant from the UAE, him and I ran back through this like volley of fire to our stronghold to grab the Skedko, the morphine, and another medical bag. And on the way back, we're like, we're you know, kind of patrolling before we hit this like limit advance where we have to like run to the objective uh, where the guys are at. And he's like, oh, Cody, it's okay. We're safe. They won't, they won't kill us. I'm like, dude, just cause you're Muslim, they're going to fucking murder you. Just like they're going to murder me. Do you like you're delusional? And these guys had, a, they were great dudes. But they had a different mindset. They would, we'd find out that they weren't even condition one going on patrol. They just, I'm like, damn, these guys are always on fire. Like, no, they just weren't ever charged back and ready to go and these are the uae guys yeah it was the yeah. uae soft guys and uh he's like cody don't worry he's like we're safe i'm like dude we're not fucking safe and soon as he said that shit we're coming back now with a skeco and a morphine in the medical bag soon as he said cody we're safe pff, literally just eat shit like right in front of us we just get zipped by a machine gun and we caught ourselves in an l shape and i'm like oh, we are so fucked and the only terrain around us like this little micro terrain probably smaller than the, not even a mound big as this and we're both and i was a pretty big guy back then with all my kids and so was he and we're hiding behind this like micro terrain just like eating fucking incoming rounds all around us and i'm like fuck me and i can see 
I can see in the distance, probably about 60, 70 yards was our little, this eight by eight building that the rest of the team was in that we we're bringing back where the casualty was at. And I'm on the radio. I'm like, fuck. And I'm like, you're not trying to move. Cause literally they are, it was extremely danger close. Something I was used to, but I was just like, God damn, how many more times is going to happen? You, you're going to run out of lucky cards every now and then. And so I'm like, all right, pop smoke. They're like, all right, we're going to pop smoke. And as soon as we go, as soon as we pop it, you run. I'm like, fuck you. As soon as it billows <laughs> and you lay down multiple machine gun fire, we're going to get the fuck up and run. And it was one of those things where you can't, you can't stop and like, is it the perfect conditions? It was like, okay, as soon as you get up, you have to go. There is no second guessing yourself. So you have to commit. And it was a rush. It was fun. I, th I think I smiled and laughed the whole time running there, but the, probably just because I was scared that I was going to get like murked, you know, in the middle of this like field and that was going to be the end of my life. Do you have any idea how many opposing forces there were? We had uh, about five individuals that we were fucking seeking out at this point. Yeah. Uh, luckily, uh, later on, once we got this casualty back, uh, we called in, you know, Marine aviation, the, the Cobra pilots, those dudes are savage. Dude. Those are, those guys are like epic. And, uh, they just came in and we, we luckily when you call in a medevac, you usually have a gun support with them. And, uh, how at the time gun support worked is if you call in a medevac, you could use that gun support to, to do what you needed to do. Cause their, their mission is to provide coverage for the bird for the medevac and they just came there and like mowed shit down did what they do best uh 60 drops down pj's load up our dude and he takes off and we got out of this like gnarly l, l shape but that was that was definitely like the closest closest time on that deployment I'm like dude this is it this is this is fucking it i'm yeah. exposed and i'm gonna get mowed yeah man um uh, how many deployments uh from like after that how many more deployments did you do so this was my fourth <clears throat> deployment. So I had three more deployments after that. And were they both or Afghanistan, Iraq? Uh, the, yep. After that, I went to uh, Africa. And then uh, after Africa, I went to Afghanistan again. Then I went to Iraq for my final deployment. Okay. Um, coming back from that Afghanistan deployment where you were you basically uh, C three PO backpacked your way into into combat. I definitely did. Um, did. Was there? How did that wrap up? Like, because you were supposed to be at a a desk job. At what point did you transition back to that and ultimately come home? How did that whole thing work? Yeah, it, I mean, it ended on a bad note. One of the uh, military office, the Marine officers that was in charge of the desk quadrant that I was supposed to be operating in. Honestly, at the time, he was super jealous that I was going to do shit. He was new to the organization. He wasn't getting some, and he was butthurt that he was fucking doing this job. And my last 30, about 30, 40 days, he called me back. I'm like, dude, why didn't you just let me finish my time out there? Like those dudes, yes, I want to be out there, but it's not like I'm just having fucking fun. Like yeah. these dudes need me, um, whether I'm loading ammo for them, building charges or, or supporting on a mission, like they need me in some capacity because they're literally down a guy. That's why I'm there for the whole reason. And uh, he brought me back and he's like, you're going to do this job. You're going to redeploy with me. And I was just really butthurt. And I had this like chip on my shoulder uh, because I'm like, dude, are we out here to fight and win? Or are we just out here to play like insecurities and like make everyone miserable together? Um, so that deployment ended. I come back to the schoolhouse. And at that point, um, I went to become a CQB instructor for a schoolhouse and I finished my time out uh, as a CQB instructor before I um, <clears throat> essentially picked up the next rank, that gunny, the, the rank that I asked to get promoted on. Yeah. So now and you're in E7. Now I'm in E7, and I get a phone call from um, from an officer, a team leader over at our 3rd Battalion. He's like, hey, dude, you want to come be my team leader? And I put this guy through, I think, the second class of ITC. And I'm like, fuck yeah. I'm like, someone called me and asked me if I want to be a team, a team chief. I'm sorry, a team chief. Uh, I'm like, the senior enlisted guy of a team, like I felt like a badass. I'm like, what a dream come true. Like what an honor, you know, there's only 16 of those guys per company. And we have three battalions and three companies per battalion. And I'm like, dude, this is badass. This is big leagues for me. And so I check into uh, our third battalion. And as soon as I walk in, they're like, Hey, you're deploying in like four months. You're going to Africa. I'm like, what? <laughs> and back in the day I was, since I was a prior recon guy, I, I was a threat uh, for this particular battalion because we weren't fucking stupid. We weren't pushovers and we were, ver we were very verbal. We we're like, this is dumb. Why are we doing training like this? Our third battalion back in the day was our, our bastard battalion. A lot of good guys, but a lot of guys that didn't belong there at the same time. And 
there was leadership uh, that went along with that as well. And so because our main, our main moving parts were our first battalion, which was prior first force reconnaissance guys, and then our second battalion, which was prior second force reconnaissance guys from the East Coast, so East Coast and West Coast. Then we had our third battalion, which managed all of our other special operations engagements that SOFT does, right? South America, various different comms out there. And um, so they, they kicked me out the door very quickly. So I'm on this quick turnaround. I've never been to Africa. I have no idea what we're doing. And my guys have plenty of experience in like Kenya and Senegal. And there I'm like, wait, wait a second. We, who's the, like, how do we get out there? Like, oh, we just buy our flights and we coordinate for the C-130. I'm like, or the, the C-17. I'm like, we do all this shit? I'm like, are you serious? Like it was a whole new system. And I was like, fuck. And we're going to Africa. I'm like, dude, I'm probably going to come back home. And my team guys are going to come back home. This is epic. You know, it was like a new experience for me. I'm, you know, I'm civilian entire 90% of the time. I'm working at the embassy here and there. And I'm driving a dope ass like land cruiser. And, you know, just, it was a whole new version of this like evolution of my military career that I was like super stoked on. And, uh, cause I never had that opportunity to do that. And that deployment was basically like three months. It was just shy like of like, I was like short for my team, like seven days or something stupid to rate a deployment out of it. Uh, because at this time there was this concept of they were going to create a fourth team at the time. There was no fourth team in any of the companies. And since Afghanistan was just like the main, the main thing at the time, they were looking at our third battalion to augment a first battalion company well, they were looking at all the roster numbers, who had all the experience, who had all the leadership. And my team was one of the courses of action that Marslock as a whole chose to become that fourth augmentation team. So they're like, they redeploy us. So we leave Africa, we come back home and I find myself heading to uh, California to go coordinate with first Raider battalion. And, uh, being that the place that I started from, I was like super stoked to get back there, but I realized it changed a lot. A lot of fucking chip on the shoulders, a lot of, I've done, they call we call it seasons. Like, you know, I'm Bravo company season one, season two. I'm like, okay, fucking hard ass. Like you're not the only one that's been here. And it was just like a different dynamics. And I was representing a third battalion team. So I had some, some of my guys, basically all my guys were ITC students that I put through, um, or they happened to graduate, you know, while I was on another team or doing something like that. And solid fucking team, solid team. And, but we were came from a third battalion that didn't have a good reputation. So there was a lot of animosity. Like, oh, you guys are just from a third team. I'm like, what kind of professional are you? And this is coming from like a leadership platform. And so, um, you know, I came back home, got the mission, like what we're doing and what our timeline was. And it was super epic. Basically I got to build out my own calendar to train my entire team. We had all the assets we needed because we were the main effort for Marsoc because this is such a big deal uh, because the battlefield, in Afghanistan was changing and they needed to adapt and overcome. And so to be, to be part of that was super rad. And, you know, my team crushed everything we did in training. They, there was definitely no, we were the underdog, but I think it just fueled the guys more. And a lot of these guys got to do maybe Iraq with the infantry battalion. And they were really hungry to go to war, <clears throat> um, which helped, but what really helped me, I had like great, great uh, element leaders. I had great leadership, uh, supporting leadership that would just, set the say set the presidents for like what's to be expected and train these guys up and gave them everything they needed what was that uh deployment like i mean so kind of running all your own shit i mean when you showed up did you feel more prepared than you had uh, in previous deployments because you're kind of running running your own show or what what was that like yeah i mean when we got to afghanistan my team was <clears> definitely <throat> prepared to do whatever we needed to do what was not what we were not prepared for was like the amount of pushback we were gonna get we were the bastard fucking team you know, we had, they only had equipment like vehicle gun trucks and communication suites for three teams. So like my comm guys are out piecemealing the stuff together. My, my motor T guys are out piecemealing trucks together. And we were like an afterthought, but when we were, we were used to it. So yeah. we adopted and overcome and they kick us out to like the most like shittiest, like Northern, like fucking out there location. And, uh, we were like, okay, this is it. But I mean, we were absolutely prepared for what we did. And my guys were so hungry to just be successful at their job and being able to employ themselves. Uh, you know, they maximized the entire battlefield and they maximized their whole time there. Was there a specified mission when you got on the ground or? Yeah, our main thing was the village stability operation. So there was a lot of the teams that were actually in a village. 
uh, my particular team, we were attached. We weren't attached, but we stayed on a facility that the Marines occupied in the Afghan National Army. Well, at this time, I had my own Afghan Special Forces team with me. And the Marine Corps at the time, I don't know if it's changed, but they did not like Afghans of any type with weapons on their base. So we had to like partition off the Marine base. We're like taking over some of their bases. We're building out our own team houses because we're individual. I had to put up like gates and security. So I got Marines, my special operations team, my Afghan special operations team, and then another wall. And then I have whole Afghan National Army Battalion, uh, which I did not manage or run. And uh, it was it was cool. I mean, you, we literally were the underdogs the entire time. And like my guys, like we're just doing massive, amazing things that – I would say it wasn't the deployment they probably wished for. Like they weren't free falling in and like, you know, fast ripping from the helicopter and doing raids every night. Uh, but the mission really at that point was to advise and assist. We did a lot of accompanying before. So advice, triple A, we would call it. But this time we were at that phase line where they're downsizing Afghanistan and we we're just really supposed to employ our special operations partner forces and make them the face of the, the Afghan government. And my, a lot of my younger guys were not really feeling that vibe. My, my captain at the time always wanted to go on patrols. And this is my third time back to Hellman Valley. I'm like, bro, like, that's not our fucking mission. I was never afraid of death. I wasn't afraid of war or conflict or, you know, I never wanted to lose guys, but I knew that was part of the outcome when you play with fire. But I also was a real life player. I'm like, dude, we're not here to win the war on terror in six months. And a lot of these younger guys that were eager wanted to win the war in six months. I'm like, that makes no sense. We're literally downsizing. Why don't we truly just employ these fucking guys, these partner forces that we're here for? Because we're about to leave these dudes in like a matter of no time. And so that was really hard to convey against guys that, I mean, what do you expect? They want to get in the fight, right? They're special operators now. They, they have all these assets. They have all this training. They want to go put it to the test. And I get that. So being like that, that figure to like, this is probably not the best use of our like assets or like our, our manpower that was a tough one that caused like some rifts here and there, but I think the guys like saw the bigger picture, but you know, being that guy now who got to experience all these other things previously now in a position where I'm like, okay, I can say, Hey dude, let's just go out there and throttle it down. But I can't justify, and I'm not going to justify how I'm going to lose a fucking guy just to do a pointless presence patrol just to get some. just to fucking get some like that's so stupid. And at the same time too, the Taliban at this point, they really turned into a, a true, mob type of mindset where they realize, hey, we're pushing guns, drugs, and, and trafficking. If we just don't fuck with these dudes, they're going to leave here. You know, they if we just let them alone, we just we just worry about like the things that are producing us money. So they started gaming the system. They started to game the system, yeah. and, and rightfully so. Why wouldn't you? <clears throat> yeah. What uh, Seeing the, I'm going to jump around a little bit here, but seeing the um, the evacuation of Afghanistan and, and the way that it went down, I think after the fact, not just how we botched it, but you know what took place in the in the days and weeks after the work that you did with the Afghan national guys was it a surprise to you to see that happen, or did uh, or were you like, yeah, I remember working with these guys, and I'm not at all shocked that it went down the way that it did, like without like a fight and stuff. Well, I mean, I know some of them did, but just right. you know, just like were you shocked at how how everything panned out? Well, I was not shocked that after 20 years of looking for weapons of mass destruction that we left a place that had no involvement into the whole global war on terrorism. Uh, I wasn't shocked in how it went. I mean, what did people expect? Look at every other military occupation war we've been in. How do you, how do you think it's going to go down, <clears throat> right? And when I look at the bigger picture of Afghanistan, like, dude, we, we fucked that place up not just in war, but like, dude, we, we literally said, Hey, guess what? We're going to bring in our, our way of living. We're going to take away your power. Oh, by the way, when we leave, you're fucked. You have nothing in place. Like what do you expect's going to happen? You know, I had to put myself in that situation. I'm watching this thing, this debacle happen on the news. Like, dude, if I had a family look after, yeah. you think I'm going to go try to fight the red coats by myself? Or do you think I'm going to like focus on what matters <clears throat> most in my family and the, the long war, right? Because these guys are now going to have to like create that long game and they can't just fight emotionally. Like, Hey, let's put up a fight and stop the Taliban. Like, no dude, like yeah. that is not the opportune time. You have to wait for these guys to get established. Then you start your guerrilla warfare all over again. And you now become what they were. They were once they w once were. Uh, so, you know, how things went down on the Afghan side, like, Hey man, that's just never happened to us. So I have no room to talk one. 
Two, if I was in any of those guys' a situation, I would, and those guys care a lot about their family, the tradition, their, their people, their villages, that would be my main focus. Not trying to fucking kill these guys that now have access to, you know, all of our old left behind equipment that that's not the time to push the fight. It's like the whole hawk's tooth thing, dude, just play the fucking game. Now, wait till the dude turns his back and then start scheming, start making and devising your plan. And that's just how my mindset works. Uh, but, um, you know, I think all those Afghans that fought alongside us, I think those fucking dudes are brave as shit. Were there a lot of turds? There was a lot of American turds, yeah. you know, but I mean, we have no idea what it's like to truly walk in the shoes of them. You know, we have no idea what it's like to literally just have your whole entire life disrupted and turned upside down. Uh, so I will never ever cast shade on like what decisions they made because they were the ones that had to make them, you know? Yeah. Is it tough for you to, to see that happen? It's so I was never a war junkie. You know, I never re-enlisted because of America. I never re-enlisted because of the war and terror. I re-enlisted because I loved my job and I loved looking out for the dudes that I worked with. Yeah, That was my why. It wasn't nothing else. And, um, but when that saw that, that shit happened, I'm like, I just wasn't surprised. Like, what the fuck do you expect? And we have this whole generation of brainwashed people who think that we're doing true justice. No, dude, like, it's about money. It's always about money. And when the money stops or people get too much wind of something, guess what happens? You have to have drastic change. And I just felt so disgusted for all my friends who were about the war effort, who believed in what they were doing. And I just, I'm like, how do you justify those lives when we just bounced out? It's just like, really? Yeah, no, I don't, yeah, I don't disagree. Um, and we'll get back to that. I want to get your take on some of the things that are happening now in other places too, but I would like to go back uh, one step and, and cover um, coming home from that Afghanistan deployment, regrouping, and then go to, going to Iraq. Man, so that was a, so I came back from that Afghan deployment, uh, came back from the deployment. And at this time I was, it was not the best time for me. I was, I found myself under investigation for many allegations. I had two investigations in Afghanistan. For like war crime shit? Uh, for all sorts of shit, disobeying direct orders, uh, assaulting uh, Marines and local nationals, disrespecting commissioned <clears throat> officers. Um, she, you didn't salute him, did you? Yeah, I, I might have I not smiled when I should have. Uh, but was all, it all just superfluous shit like that? Yeah, or? man, because I was a threat. Because I was going against someone who wanted to win the war in a very short amount of time. And I was, I was a voice of, I cared more about my dudes than I cared about a fucking award. And I have been to war enough to know that, listen, it is not our duty to win the war in six months. It's our duty to establish the right foothold to set up the next follow on team who is responsible for anything we do or fail to do on, during our six months. Right. Uh, it's not my job just to start something crazy that I'm not going to be able to see through for fruition. And then I fuck over the next team that's coming in to replace me. Like that doesn't make any sense. And that's, that's how we, that's how these teams screw each other over and, But I'm a different person. I view things completely different. Um, and so there was a lot of friction with me and this particular individual that, started these uh, allegations. And so I got my rights read to me multiple times on deployment. And I was just so toxic. I was so hurt that I was being betrayed by my own unit. People were turning their back against me. And all I cared about was my team. And I'll say this, right? And I won't go into much anymore into all that uh, because it is completely off my chest. Like everything's good to go. Like I have no hate anymore. I had, I did for like six years and it crushed me and it showed. Um, but my team had my back the entire time. And that's really hard to do, especially in special, our special operations team. And that says a lot. Yeah. And so um, I come back home and I go through this, like I'm still doing investigations and I'm on timeout. So I'm taken out of my team now and I'm in our operations section. And during this time, I'm like learning how you set up battalion training and fucking admin rifle ranges and shit that I've never had experience with, which is only making me stronger and more of an asset. But at the time, it was, it was a little hard. I'm, yeah. I'm still dealing with a lot of accusations. And literally, I, my name that I have blood and sweat for for that organization is being tarnished across the entire spectrum. I'm um, being used in case studies. I was called the, you know, there was... 
this basically they they made up these stories to like have these big seminars where um these command climate things and um this case study study that they're sharing the description is literally me to the t oh yeah just with like a, a, a different made-up title yeah and everyone knows it's me because I'm literally the big headlines for Marsaw because at this time, that's when tribalism came out. And tribalism, have you heard of that term? Yeah. Yeah. So like I was like the forefather, the grandfather of tribalism apparently. And and I'm having to break out in these little working groups and um, and this officer's like reading me this thing. I'm like, bitch, you know it's me. And uh, to watch all these dudes that I put through school that I have stood up for turn their backs against me, it fucking crushed me a lot. And I really had a victim mentality for the whole process. It's like a two and a half year thing. And, uh, when it, when it, I got acquitted of everything, when everything ended, you know, these losers, like the ones that were losers always, like they just stayed in their own bubble and the ones that were real G's, especially the officers that came up and apologized on how they like viewed me and judged me. They just were unsure. And I get that, right. There's a lot of rotten apples in the military and we never know what it's like. And there's always three sides of the story, your story, my story, and the truth. But it was really hard to, to be so giving to a cause and to have your, your, everyone's back turned against you. Yeah. Um, but luckily I, I did have a lot of great senior leaders that looked out for me and it only made me stronger and I'm grateful for everything. Anyways, well, once that all was ended, I went to Germany uh, to work a desk job there uh, at the uh, Sock Ford, West Africa. And I was managing a, a few countries in Africa. That's where all that happens. And I'm getting more, uh, more information and learning new things. I'm also selected for E8 Master Sergeant at this point. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah, dude. I I pin, pinned at a, I got selected at 11 and a half years. So That's at this crazy, point, man. I was like the fastest, I was the fastest promoted master sergeant in the Marine Corps, especially in Marsoc. Uh, I do my time in Germany. I come back home. And when I come back home, I come back to my original team and I get an email. It says, hey, do you want to be the operations chief uh, for Fox Company at 2nd Battalion? I'm like, Yes. And that was a huge honor. And I was always asking like, Hey, why is it my name on the roster to, to be part of this? And what the enlisted guys were telling me that the, the officers that were making these decisions didn't think that I had a good, uh, didn't think I had a good temperament and that I didn't work with officers very well, which I just didn't put up with shit no matter who you were. And i spoke my truth and I was always known for that in the military. And that does obviously not sit well with a lot of rule followers this is the way like bitch we're only alive nine times out of ten because we didn't do it the way we made it happen um so i was actually an alternate for this thing the, the guy who was selected above me he was retiring he dropped his appendix j so i was the alternate and so now i became the primary and that was everything to me i talked to my team like hey guys i'm fucking taking over an entire company now this is my natural progression. I'm just so stoked because my whole vision for Marslock, I wanted to be in charge of Marslock, dude. I knew that no one was going to love those dudes and look out for them and stand up for them as much as I would. Now, instead of 14 guys, I'm getting to look out for like 105 guys and to include my enablers and all that type of stuff. And so I check into this unit and 2nd Battalion is like epic, dude. Like I remember being on like my first Marslock deployment with my, with my headphones on, listening <laughs> to the radio, dude, just hearing like these stories of like, it's like little orphan Annie. We're all gathered around the radio, <laughs> the satcom radio. And they're talking about like being overran and gray space and like fucking these dudes up. And it was just like, holy shit. Like they are in it, you know? And this was like our sister, our sister, uh, battalion. Now I'm there and I, I see like, there's just so much just badass men. And, and the mentality there was honestly, I think even better than our first battalion. And I love my first battalion, but this second battalion guys were legacy legacy it was fucking discipline it was execute and that was it it was standard task condition standard and, and to be around that level of just like it yeah. just amped me up and i had just nothing but savages i was working with uh great leaders great everybody great subordinates anyways i check in they're like hey uh you know i'm an ops chief now i'm a master sergeant so this is all new dude like i i'm like a dude that says fuck a lot and now i'm in charge of like a shit ton of people you got the t-shirt i got yeah. the t-shirt it says freedom on the back you know no. so it it does work, <laughs> you know. And uh, they're like, "Hey, yeah, we're gonna go do. Uh, we're 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 going after ISIL." I'm like, "What the fuck is ISIL?" You know, ISIL. I'm like, "Did they make you guys or encourage or make you guys use ISIL and not ISIS?" Dude, we use like f <sighs> that shit drives me nuts. Dude, it was like you know the deal, bro. You know it's douchey. The next there's some lieutenant out there is like ISIL, ISIS, 
Issel, like there's like the different way to pronounce it, a new acronym that comes out. And if you don't know it, you're like douchey. Like back in the day, I remember we're going to illuminate the battle space with these tactics. I'm like, it was all these different catch faces, the alligator closest to the boat, all these stupid fucking military acronyms and isms. And it was like, you're not cool if you don't know them. And, but you don't know what the fuck's being brief. Cause no one talks with normal common sense. Anyways, they're talking about like all this ISIS shit. I'm like, dude, I, I just got done dealing with like Al Shabaab, AQIM, like all these other Africa stuff. Now I'm going to Iraq and I didn't, I didn't know any of this stuff. Um, because Iraq was completely different at this point. We're going to Northern Iraq. We're dealing, we're partner forces with the Kurds. And basically like this whole mission was like work with the Kurds, take them to their biblical birthright into Northern Iraq and then transfer from the Kurds to the Iraqis. And this is the whole time, the, this is 2016, uh, actually end of 2015 where the, the Mosul invasion happened. Um, so this is a whole new experience. And now I'm managing four special operations teams and just get into mentor and, and be around those guys and hold them to accountable, hold them standard and learn so much from them. And it was just a great experience. It was like literally the pinnacle of my career for sure. Was that deployment uh, busy from a combat standpoint? Absolutely. It was absolutely busy for the guys on the ground. I spent nine, 90% of my time in an operations center, uh, staring at like fucking massive walls, TV screens and getting stressed the fuck out watching shit happen. Uh, talking on four or five phones at a time. And my guys were, really pushing the battle space. They really were really trying to get that third A to do the company, uh, advise, assist in a company uh, role. And we had various programs taking place that our guys were doing some low, low, low impact um, type of operations or I guess low density operations. But we realized that we, these guys need guidance. Our partner forces need guidance. We were never getting proper coordination from them. So uh, our dudes did so well in the targeting aspect and the professionalism, we were able to get that final advice, assist, and a company. So now our guys are able to go out for uh, the flot, the forward line of troops, and conduct uh, battlefield operations. And that was extremely kinetic. And uh, our guys, and I had, shit, I went through, I think three, not went through, but I had the opportunity to work through like three SIL platoons, or three SIL teams. You know, I've had Green Berets I was managing. I was in charge of the, basically I was a, the Northern Iraq Special Operations uh, uh, Operations Chief. So wow. every operation for special operations going through, like it's coming through my desk. I'm coordinating with these guys and just seeing how people are operating. And it's just, it was really dynamic. And instead of just focusing on one team, I have like literally seven teams. Plus I'm managing teams in two other countries that are from my own unit uh, that are part of the same operation. And uh, so it was very intense, uh, but it was very kinetic and, um, uh, the great thing about it though, my team or not my team, my company had this really great, a uh, signal intelligence staff and, uh, all the nerd shit that you're like behind the closed doors. Like what are those guys doing? Well, these guys are doing next level targeting and it really made us so dynamic on the battlefield. Tier one units were coming to us for target packages. Cause we were the only ones targeting people. And we were doing, uh, we were doing things that have never been done before. So it was truly groundbreaking. And that just gave us more visibility, which gave us more support. Uh, but at the same time, the biggest restriction we had on this deployment was the cap, right? We can only have so many troops into Northern Iraq, special operations troops. We can only have so many uh, air assets. Uh, and the air assets we did have were managing back and forth between operations in Syria and Northern Iraq. So it made it very difficult to, to do this. And no American has died at this point, right? There hasn't been any like, you know, f American face on a battlefield and they were really, they probably didn't want American casualties to happen. And who the fuck wants that? But you have us out here playing with fire. Do you not want us to do our job? So it was an extremely dynamic deployment for the, for the men out there. And, uh, they, they just, they just made shit happen. It was powerful to watch. Was it all up in the Northern uh, area by Mosul or did you guys push West towards Syria at all ever? Uh, we had a couple guys go towards Syria and especially later deployments. They were doing more operations towards that but for our particular involvement. We basically took the Kurds from uh, their stronghold to, like I said, I'm probably saying it wrong, but like their biblical birthright where they said like, Hey, this is our, you know, by, by God terrain here. This is our line of a, our limit of advance. And they stopped operating. <clears throat> and that's when we switched over from working with the Kurds to Iraq, Iraqis, which is already a volatile environment. And half these Iraqis we were working with were fucking dudes we were fighting against. And they let us know, you know, it was very weird uh, because ISIS came in and like fucked up everything, you know, insurgency makes sense to me. 
you would start an insurgency if someone came in and fucked your shit up. For sure. But ISIS was completely different. I mean, this is like, they had no loyalty to any of these fucking people. They were like, fuck you. You're not part of this. Uh, we're just going to murder you. And the amount of propaganda that existed back then, the videos that I watched, uh, not because I got off on them, but I was really curious of how the mind of these fucking people work and the psychology and the ideology they have. Because you can, the reason why I will never win a war against terrorists, because you cannot kill an ideology. Uh, you just simply can't. You literally have to eradicate it to the root. And most Americans, especially the government, is not prepared to do that because there's no money in that, right? There's no follow on objectives for that. Um, and it's going to require a lot of fucking, a lot of go, go, go. And I just don't think people are ready for that type of commitment. Well, I think the, uh, like from a, a PR aesthetic standpoint, you know, most of the country wouldn't be behind what it would take to do that. Which is a good thing. I'm glad we don't have people like murder everybody because I always tell people, to, you know, I get young guys all the time and just kind of like a cyber, like, oh, I want to join. I've seen what you do. I'm like, dude, I, I don't. I don't boast or brag about the combat aspect. I, I brag about the fucking men I got to work with, the lessons I learned, the wisdoms obtained. So you can apply it and apply common sense. But, you know, war is absolutely stupid. There's so many people that feel like you they have to go to war to feel any form of merit for themselves and to be justified. And my career is wasted because I didn't get to go to war. I'm like, you just lack fucking gratitude in your life, dude. Like, why does why do we put war on a fucking pedestal? You know, out of and this is going to break a lot of people's feelings. Out of all the people that you know, I know, and the civilians know that they put on a pedestal, half those guys never did anything. If you want to call it that, if we want to say did something, did not do something, they were just on deployment. Mm -hmm. And out of everyone in Afghanistan, everyone in Iraq, not everyone is shooting somebody. Not everyone's dropping a fucking grenade pin or you know doing all these types of things. But yet we we put it on such a high regards, and it costs so much, so many lives. Fucking dudes feel inadequate. Yeah. And they, they're, you know, it's just, it's a never ending process and it's pretty sad, but you know, um, yeah, the ideology behind it all is crazy. And the fucking ISIS did a really great job, dude. Even their propaganda was top shelf production. And it makes you wonder like what limits do they have because yeah. they're prepared where we necessarily aren't. And, uh, did you see some gnarly shit on that deployment? Yeah. Um, uh, it's like I said, I spent. 90% of it uh, inside the operations center. We worked on a, on a three-letter agency base. And um, so I never barely saw sunlight. And this is not a woe is me story. It was just a complete new dynamics. And I was prepared to do whatever I had to do to support my men. Um, but watching, and I'm looking in like multiple ISR feeds, you know, the, dreader, the, prone, the drone feeds, and, you know, seeing fucking these ISIS fighters weld in their brothers right they're other fighters inside these mad max you know ve vehicle born ieds well in the men so they could not escape so their only option was to blow themselves up i'm like holy fuck dude that's just gnarly and these people are just doing it left and right it's seeing a bunch of gnarly shit uh i mean we were using various open source platforms to target people and to see what fucking dumbasses put into the internet world that we we're able to find them and find fix and finish i'm just like holy shit and i just think about like what's happening here i'm like oh man we're all fucked is there an example you can share from over there um selfies we were finding selfies and we were basically doing train analysis and sitting you know uh isr platforms out there and confirming denying and and you know targeting things yeah because people are fucking stupid um, so I just saw, and what really irks me, especially about the ISIS situation and just war in general is like the complete lack of life. There's no respect for life. And it's, it was just so crazy. It's just like, damn, these people don't even care. And I'm watching some of their propaganda videos. And there was this one particular one. It was like a three-story house and they had these young kids. So they had these men tied up in their chonies and their underwear, they're, they're, they're gag and bound, uh, in, in this house. And there's these young kids that are like in like desert digital with Glock 19s and like, dude, it's like dynamic music. It's young kids. Like how old? Uh, probably five, six years old. Oh wow! And, and it's like super 4k quality type of filming. And these kids are going to this house and they're doing CQB. They're doing training and they're, they're straight up murdering these fucking dudes and seeing the faces of these guys that are bound, right? They can run around the house they're dying dude they're they're jumping off the fucking rooftop uh they rather jump and kill themselves and get fucking killed by some fucking kid or anybody to be exact and 
I'm just saying to myself, like, dude, what a fucked up play. I'm literally in hell. This is not only was this filmed for propaganda purposes in a recruiting video, it's distributed to the masses and it just gets in your mind. You're like, dude, why the fuck am I here? And um, then I, you know, I, then I corroborate that with, uh, you know, seeing the guys getting welded into the vehicles or you're just like, dude, this is, this is a made up place. This cannot be a real place, which was super crazy because where I was based out of and where we kind of had some operations taking place, I had like the best steak dinner out there. I was, I got a haircut. I got, I got in a gunfight, got a haircut and a steak dinner all in the same 24 hour period. And it was mind blowing. There's, there's Maseratis and G wagons and Range Rovers driving around down the streets. And then just a couple hours this way, it's just straight carnage. And uh, I was just really mind blowing to see that. And that's someone's norm. And I don't know, man, just looking back at all that shit, I just, I realized how grateful I am just to be an American. Like we have our fucking issues. Of course we do. But damn, dude, like we get to talk right here and I'm not worried about like some random 105 shell coming in you here. should be, God damn it. I mean, hey, you never know what's yeah. oh, in the overhead. Yeah. Uh, why do you think that the, the societal norm over there is the way that it is? I mean, same reason it is here, dude. The societal norm for someone getting raped inside the road is people pulling out their phone and videotaping it. They're desensitized by it. You know, I remember as a kid growing up, you know, there was never the word bitch or like any form of like sexual into windows on TV. And now even your basic family network, there's some agenda being pushed or there's some like foul language. I mean, I'm, I'm a foul guy, but you know, there's this shit that's on common television and it's desensitizing people. I remember watching like, um, numero uno, like the, the Mexican news. I'm like, Holy shit. That's like raw and real type of news reporting in, in the, the, the American news is like, Oh, hi guys, there's a chance of rain. And obviously it's inaccurate and all this other crazy stuff. And, but it now became our norm. Yeah. Right. People see violence all the time. You have access to it on the internet <clears throat> and there, I, I just feel like, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop your life? Um, or are you just going to keep on moving? And it's just so sad because there's dreams and goals and visions out there. They might be different than mine, but they're humans and they're just, they're literally in hell. And you know, what sucks, especially when you watch like the evacuation of Afghanistan, evacuation, if you can call it that, the dismantling of Afghanistan, uh, there's the people, the what? The abortion of Afghanistan. Yeah, man. There, there's people that really need someone there yeah. that's going to stand up for them. That's going to give their fucking kid hope, you know, and and it's painful to watch because then I look at all the opportunities that exist here in America and all the divide we have. Oh, you don't like my hair color. You don't fucking like my, my president or all this stupid shit. I'm like, dude, you guys are so fucked up. Like you don't even deserve to fucking be in a place that gives you this freedom because there's people that would literally swim fucking on a fucking raft to get here for a chance. That's why immigrants crush it in America. People talk shit about immigrants. I'm like, bitch, because you're lazy. You know, fucking immigrants come up here and they fucking dominate because they want to win. They're like, fuck, you can do this in America where Americans are like, oh, look at the fucking next circus thing on TV or the next, you know, dog and pony show to distract me from what's really happening. And just so mind warped where these other countries, they, 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 they know what it's like. They have to hide books. They have to do secret schooling. They have to do secret churches and all this other type of shit where in America we have just so many things we don't, we don't respect. And it's because that's our norm because we're so distracted with information and divide by design. These other countries are like, well, fuck war and terror and raping and murdering. That's just part of design. It is what it is. People get killed. I fucking go bury them in their, their ancient ancestor, you know, cemetery. And it's just how it is. Why uh, do you think it's that way in America? Because dude, my personal opinion, this is not going to be popular. Americans are slaves. It's all by design because think about the country. We have the most guns in the world in America. But you see all the crazy shit going around the world and people are going against the, the, the man. But Americans are like, where's my barbecue and my football? Like, where's my fucking distractions and dopamine? Because we're pacified. Because we're like, oh, the news said something bad. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm like, bitch, when are you going to learn? The same person that's lying to you constantly, you're, you're looking at them for your salvation. And I feel like Americans like this because we want to be. It's, dude, people are fucking depressed in the state. They, this country, they live in their head. They, they don't even believe in themselves. Tell me how people are even poor in America. It doesn't even make sense. There's so much money out there. There's so much power in people, but yet they just don't believe in themselves. Oh, the demands against me. It's because my skin color. No, bitch, it's because your attitude. Yes, are there horrible things out there? Absolutely. 
but I've seen so many people in third world shitholes transform their lives. I remember running into this, this French family in Iraq on my second deployment, this mom and three kids walk out with all her laundry. She escaped from like Uganda or some shit. And, uh, there's like tanks blowing up shit in the background. There's fucking helicopters flying and shooting. And she's just walking with her bucket of like plastic bucket with her clothes. She's about to go wash some clothes and some ass, nasty ass water. And she was happy because she escaped genocide and she's in a war torn country and she's not, Ooh, my life's dude. She's making shit happen. What is she going to do? But in America, people are like, I can't get off my couch. Yeah, bitch. Cause you're doing the same thing. You have access to literally everything to tarnish your soul and bring you down and you're falling for it. You watch the news, you fucking eat and consume poison. You watch porn. You, you do all these things that are free access for you because if it's free, you're the product. And I don't think Americans know that they're the product. You know, we are a byproduct of what happens because we are emotionally controlled where other countries are more rationally fucking driven, driven in what they live in and what they do. And I'm not hating America. And before the idiots out there, well, you should leave. Like, no, bitch, we have to make us, we have to stand up and start using our, our common sense and start voicing our opinions or you will always be a peasant. Do you have a theory as to why it's that way in America? <clears throat> Control money. You know, like we are the, the common man right in America is controlled by their true God. And that's media. They will sacrifice everything for their second true God, which is money. And they lose all the things that matter most to them. Self-respect, pride, family, community, tribe. We were tribes once. We had community once. We rely on each other once. Now, dude, there's people that in homes that don't even know their neighbors. There's, there's people in communities that <laughs> will pull out their phone and film you being raped. Film you having a fucking knee on you, right? And won't say shit. There's parents that have no idea what's being taught in their schools. And they're like, okay, son, daughter, you're home. Go play with your technology device, which is fucking your brain up. You know, people aren't thinking because people are so busy because there's so many options here. There's so many distractions. And we live in a dopamine infested society where people are so addicted to anything that's going to take them away from themselves. Because if you have most people, hey, do you ever meditate? Do you journal? I don't do that weird, weird hippy dippy shit. Well, no shit, because if you stopped and smelled the roses that you were fucking growing, you, you would not be happy. So let me ask you this. Uh, while maintaining a free society or, or trying to, how would you fix it? How would I fix it? One, and this is another weird thing. Dude, the G people, the G man, they cannot, that cannot be a career. We have to look back at like the kingdoms the wardens of the West. We cannot have these people as career people. Could you imagine what the military would be like if the your drill instructor was your fucking platoon sergeant, was your company commander, was your battalion commander, was all your echelons? Could you imagine that dude sucks so bad and never left? What would happen? There's no incentive to change and create change if I if you have tenure there. And so we have to relook at this whole process and, and people are like, oh, this person sucks, this person sucks. No, dude, this system sucks. So term limits. Term limits would probably be a big difference, but at the same time, political endeavor in itself is is comical to me. I could have sworn I, I heard something once that said a house divided will not stand, and all I see is a house fucking divided, and it's cheered upon. I'm blue, I'm red, I'm this, I'm that. Well, when did we forget? We started as a republic. Now we're a democracy. We were founded as a republic. Now we're a democracy. How well is that working? How well is that truly taking us to the next level. All we do is talk shit and divide. If people knew that every one of their nemesis was the same one and it wasn't each other, shit would change. But people are too distracted because they're, they're, they're emotional robots because this meme comes out, oh, that's offensive. Why do you think pronouns and all this other shit happens? It's not to give you rights. It's to cause more fucking divide. It's to cause more friction in the house and family to separate you further from the truth and keep you submissive to whatever agenda is out there. I'm not saying, you know, people are like, oh, you're just a conspiracist. No, bitch, I'm a realist. How are things getting better? I mean, do you look at what happened the past two years and just like that, everything's magically fixed. Just like that, the most deadly thing to ever hit the earth is just magically over. And we're like, doo, 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 doo. now I can't eat eggs. 
like when are we going to wake up and realize we don't live in a black and white world so you say as you mentioned uh by it's by design uh who do you think is designing that and pulling those strings well i don't think anything is coincidence right and i don't think that I always find you know you hear these terms of the elite the one percenters that control the, the illuminati the illuminati all these different things you hear these things right uh, but you wonder like there's no hip pocket hey guys we gotta enact and enact this plan there's something very very specific and very meticulously done right i mean i look at like the hunger games i look at the uh uh the, oh, what's the other movie divergent i look at all these things where they have these subsects of people and there's always this one control group out of all of it and all they do is create divide and the thing is if you give people enough bread and circus they will be occupied and they'll do whatever you tell them do we live in a world surely where people won't invest money into themselves but they will wait outside of a fucking best buy for 36 hours to buy another black box to put into their house that's insane mm-hmm we live in a world where people have literally limitless amounts and people internet is bad and it's great but people are still poor people still don't have any any internal power to to transform their lives and people don't even communicate with themselves or anyone else so when i say by design I'm like think about it we have so much access to everything that we have access to nothing because people are always looking out for their solution out for their savior and they're refusing to look inward like dude are you happy with your life yes or no well, no. Well, then good. Figure out what it is and go change that. But they're always waiting for someone to come fucking white knight save them. Like, oh, I'm going to wait four years for the next political party to come in. Like, really? Why can't you change your school board now? They have nothing to do with your political system. Why can't you, you know, talk to your sheriff now or, or like someone differently in your own like community or, 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 or whatever? Like, why do we, we're always so we're so submissive yet america was founded so apparently right if history is true we were founded because we were saying fuck you i'm not gonna pay those taxes you know fuck you i'm not gonna do this you're not gonna oppress me supposedly right if history is accurate and history is true the small group of people said i'm not going to do that but that's true because people don't like change bro they don't want change they don't want to have to really peek behind the curtain and realize that never everything is peachy like it's like it's appeared to be they don't want to realize that wait a second, maybe this nine to five I have, I really am working for nothing. I am really working towards death and I can never really truly save money to earn wealth in this life. What the fuck? But you have to ask yourself, well, how the fuck do wealthy people have this shit? Because it's by design, because an education system is an indoctrination system. They're teaching you a government program, how you're going to learn and what you're going to learn. Well, that's why when you look at all these other people like, damn, how are they driving this? How are they buying that, investing that? I, I never learned that in school. No shit, you're not supposed to. Because if you had knowledge, knowledge is power, you would transform your life. And I think people give so much credit away and, and give so little credit to themselves to do anything different. And by design, I mean, that is by design, man. We, we don't say the Pledge of Allegiance anymore. I mean, I'm all about being proud of like the country that I'm part of, right? That has fucking values and belief systems that values true freedom that will not be infringed upon i i think that's pretty awesome i'm not saying we should have a, a cult for it all uh but we should have some form of respect for the place that we call home because if we don't have respect for the place we call home then literally it's up for grabs for anybody and it, that is a slave to me you will become the slave to whoever owns you and if money owns you you're a slave to money if your job owns you you're a slave to your job if the tv network owns you then you're a slave to your tv i mean it's literally called tell a vision for a reason uh, but people were like oblivious because they just saw the next kfc commercial for their next delicious family meal ain't nothing wrong with kfc hey bro you should probably read some ingredients those, those original eggs will fuck you up yeah nah. fuck me up what uh what do you think that the meaning of life is i truly believe and i tell this in my in my coaching group to me the meaning of life is to remember i think everything that we need to solve our own problems we have access to but we have to do the work to remember our power we have to remember like for instance i tell people like cody i want to start a new job i'm like well fuck it started like i don't know if i can like bitch do you remember when you took off the training wheels you remember how you were scared to do that they're like yeah i'm like and then what happened well i got on my bike and i, and I rode it i'm like were you still scared you're like yeah but did you do it they're like yeah and how'd you feel afterwards like i felt good i could ride a bicycle i'm like well what makes you think that starting your business is any different than that right we we forget how powerful we are and i'm not talking about the masses i'm not talking about any of that fucking weird shit. i'm just talking about dude remember when you're a kid you dreamed 
my mom gave me a cardboard box once and a Sharpie and said, have fun, dude. I drew a spaceship in there. I had a, like a race car. Like I would sit in a box and make forts underneath my dinner table. I vision and dream so much. I was limitless. We were all limitless in some capacity. And then some point in your life, you forget. And then you fucking fall into the trap. I have to do this. I have to go to work. No, bitch, you get to do this. You get to go to work. But we forget that along our journey. And when we forget, we lose our power. We forget our imagination. We forget what it's like to, that courage it took us to ask that first boy or first girl out on a date. Everyone's been through that point in their life, but at some point as a teenager, middle-aged adult, and to an adult, you forget that things are just scary. Un uh, uncomfortableness, being discomfort, uh, having, seeking discomfort is the true path to growth and success. So, and success to me is evolution of self. If you're not sober, super stoked on your belief system, where you're at today, what you're doing, your level of impact, just how you think and feel, then why wouldn't you want to change that? And you can absolutely change that by remembering your power. So to me, I feel like the purpose of life is to evolve. I don't want the white picket fence and the nine to five or the 401k. And then I fucking have a great kid, great life. I have grandkids and I fucking die at my wife. I don't want that life. That's boring as shit. Everybody lives that life. Whoever created me or whatever created me or however I'm here did not probably make me all the same. If my DNA is not the same, if my fingerprints are the same, why am I acting the same? And we live in a world where people want you to conform to everyone else because it's easier to control you. That's why they tell you in the military, hey, be the gray man. I get so much hate from, uh, especially Marsoc dudes, believe it or not, uh, and military people because I'm not this gray guy that just shuts up in color. I have an opinion, dude. God gave me a voice, bro. I'm not going to not use it. That is slavery. If I'm slavery to my fear, guess what? I'm a peasant to it. And if we just started to em em empower our own selves, like, Mike, what do you want to do today? Well, I don't know. I want to kind of, I wish I had more, more happiness in my life. Well, good, dude. Form, let's form a plan. Let's go get that. Uh, and so, and we can achieve these things by remembering our power, remembering that we have gone through something hard already in our life. It doesn't have to be my heart. Just remember, it doesn't matter how you broke your leg. The fact is you broke your leg and that's what unites us, mm -hmm. right? This trauma, this, this, these anchors in our life. And if we can just remember that at some point in our life, we have overcome the, that adversity and that hardship, big or small, and apply that to our same level of thought process and action now, dude, we could create so much change. And when you become independent like that, you literally create a new earth. You literally create a new environment that can transform literally not only your life, but those around you. Do you... If you look at it from a universal standpoint, do you ever toy with the notion as to why we exist? Mm. Yeah. And what do you think? Why do we exist? Sometimes I ask myself that question. I'm like, man, what, why, why do we exist? What's the purpose of being human? I don't know, but I can only look at my perspective, man. What an opportunity to be able to feel these things, to, to go through the lives that we've gone through, right? These multiple lives that we've lived to, to choose to evolve if we want to, or to sustain hell in our mind and to, to, to play smaller, to just go all in and win big. What a gift, you know, what a gift to not be a, a immortal person where there's people that know they're going to die and don't have respect for themselves. And the fact that our, the greatest gift we have is death. The greatest gift we have is this opportunity that, we're not going to live forever. And if we're not happy, it doesn't matter if you live 20 years of happiness or just one day before you expire of happiness. It's the fact that you have that choice, that free will to go create the life that you want to. And to me, that's that's why we're here. I mean, I don't know. I don't think a moon dust like created me. I'm a mega CPU. My brain is fucking gnarly, bro. Like my body literally is a, is a, is a complete vessel. It's a temple, right? This Women give birth. That's insane, right? Um, we have all this power, but yet we take it so much away from us because we give it away. You know, we just, people don't respect life in itself. Uh, so what's the meaning why we're here? Oh, God, dude, I don't know, man, but I'm just, I'm glad I am. I'm glad I'm able to even sit here with you today and have this level of thought process and not be so fucking narrow-minded and in pain and, and trauma and hell that I was years ago where I was only thinking about me, not thinking about what I have the ability to do. Yeah. Do you believe in reincarnation or what do you think happens when you die? Man, <laughs> that's a good question. So I believe in energy. I believe energy cannot be created nor destroyed. I have seen, I'm not trying to sound cool, but I've seen a living person and I've seen a dead person. A living person looks very fucking living, even in their sleep. 
And a dead person looks like a fucking dead person. They literally look lifeless. So something leaves their body, right? There's definitely a light switch. They don't just close their eyes because they literally look like they have no life form in them. So I ask myself, where does that spirit go? Where does that energy go? Well, I believe in spirits. I believe in a soul. I, I know this because in my own belief system, I mean, I even did a soul retrieval myself in Peru uh, when I went there to do ayahuasca because throughout all my psychedelic experiences, I realized that I was living a life without me. I, I felt soulless, man. If I saw death or destruction, I didn't bat an eye, you know? If I had trauma or pain, I was like, was disassociated from it. I was just empty inside. I, I basically gave away so much of myself to do a past life job that I had uh, that I had to pay for it. And that's okay. I asked for all those things and it's, I'm not complaining about any of it, but reincarnation, I have been reading this thing called, uh, re I've been reading and, and, and watching videos on this thing called, uh, reincarnation. And essentially like to elevate our consciousness to a new state. And, uh, it talks about this in the Tibetan book of the dead, where like we remind ourselves there's like, this like mantra we're supposed to say on our like last breath to like basically remove ourselves from the soul trap and this reincarnation thing this is gonna sound really weird to a lot of people who aren't ready for this conversation or open to it but apparently like some of the things that i've read and heard is that like when we die you know that's when people meet jesus or a loved one or their fucking their high school teacher whoever is important to them that they're going to relate to the most and they bring them back into the light and the light is this matrix the light is reincarnating back into this earth and uh basically we have this like karma debt from our past lives that we're reliving and it's up to us to to clear ourselves of these of these karma debts by doing good by working on ourselves by you know removing ourselves from our vices that are really just killing us and suppressing our true power within to rise to our highest self and um but then i asked myself okay well, what happens if you don't reincarnate back here on this earth and I also asked myself, well, what if your state of mind is the place that you go to when you die? And I've done enough DMT to think about that nothing in this world that I concern myself with actually matters. Um, nothing that I stress about, nothing that, that weighs me down truly matters when I go to this place in DMT, when I have my breakthroughs with DMT. And so I asked myself, can this really be it? You know, in the Bible, I'm not, please, people don't beat me up, but in the few chapters or a few pages of the Bible that I've read so far, there's some of these dudes have lived to like 900 years. So let's just say we lived the 900 years or 90 years, whatever, 100, I'm going to live to 105 personally. But uh, let's just say that's, that, that's the standard. If there's an eternity, fuck, what if it was 105 years to an eternity? And so I kind of concern myself not with that because no matter what happens to me after this life, what matters is what I can control and influence now. So I, I have to like, I touch those topic, topic points with myself just because I'm, I'm very curious. I'm constantly looking and uh, I'm, I'm not without, but I'm just constantly looking because I'm curious to, to grow and evolve. But then I focus on what about now? What if hell is, you know, seeing what I could have been when I die and not even measuring up to that fucking person? And that's my biggest fear now. So I don't really concern myself with too much what happens after life. I ask myself, well, what am I doing today to fucking better myself? Because my consciousness, my, my connection with God, uh, that conversation that I have, I know what I need to do and I know what I'm choosing to pick and do and I know what I'm avoiding to do. And we all know this no matter what you believe in. And I can easily help people fucking comprehend this. But um, that to me is what matters most because your state of mind is going to create that place, I feel like. Because if you're not armed here mentally as a flesh human being that you can feel all these emotions and experiences and just different situations, and how can you ever be prepared to what could potentially be on the afterlife. But I don't think that I die and that's it. I think my energy is still here. Uh, I think that maybe I just go to a different realm. I don't even know, but honestly, I don't care because whatever is awaiting for me in the afterlife, if there is one, it's only going to be warranted by my actions here while I'm living. So I'm on this path to be my best self, to bring as many people along with me, to help them become their best selves and to, you know, pay off as much karmic debt to, to let go of all my vices and to literally go all fucking in because that's what matters most to me. And, you know, instead of worrying about what's going to happen for an attorney, I'm worrying about what's going to happen for the next, you know, years until I reach 105 years old, you know? Yeah. So you believe in God. I do believe in God. Do you believe that there is a devil? I mean, I definitely believe there's some type of evil out there. I mean, there's there's too much truths out there. There's something that's worshipped clearly that evil people do. I mean, we hear it all the time, as above, so below. Uh, I'm a firm believer that everything we have in this earth, this common earth, right, this realm is inverted. I think what we think is good is actually bad. That's why everyone has access to it. And that's why everyone is in a low state of vibration. I mean, do you look at the people, if you took a vote, like a command climate, like a mil spec monkey survey of the average American person, they're probably heavily fucking depressed. 
They're probably, I mean, look at veterans. Veterans are a small percentage, but they're, they're a representation of the larger entity being the average bear. Well, if you look at the suicide rate for the average people, non-veterans, it's still extremely fucking high. So it makes me think that like there's something out there. And then when I think about the devil, the devil is when I go against my consciousness. The devil is when I'm not going to drink coffee anymore. I'm not going to, for me, I'm not going to smoke weed anymore. Okay, perfect. Uh, then I'm like, oh, it comes to me. And I'm like, ah, I'll just do it again. I'm not going to do it again. It's, it's this temptation to, to give into myself because my consciousness, my gut feeling, my intuition knows what I need to do for myself. And not all the times do we have the clarity to, to tap into that connection. At least I never did until I started doing uh, psychedelics. And I have had those intuitions on deployments where like, hey, dude, don't go down the fucking alleyway you know, or turn left or duck down and these things happen. And for whatever reason I survived and I lived through them, you know, and I refuse to take those opportunities and those gifts for granted because they can't be explained to me. It's and so, and I don't need to prove them. All I need to do is respect them the best I can. And that means sometimes doing the work. And for me personally, it's taken me a decade and a half to do a lot of work to even be appreciative of where I'm at today. Um, so if there is a good, there's a bad, if there's a black, there's a white. So Absolutely. I think there's a devil, but is it a, this thing with a horn? I don't fucking know. Dude, the devil's a TV, bro. If people turned off, if two and a half years ago, no one had a TV, no one would have known there was this deadly thing plaguing the earth. No one would have known, but you had a TV and the same place that lies to you all the time. People go to it for fucking salvation. What's the weather going to be like? Dude, my in-laws watch the weather channel. And that's the only reason why I even know this, but like watching the weather channel, I'm like, dude, there's a lot of toxic shit on the weather channel everything. There's a house destroyed. There's a tornado. And then there's like just carnage and death and destruction. I'm like, God, I'm just trying to get the weather, bro. Is there any sun anymore? Like, does that exist? Uh, we're not too far fetched from like the matrix world where like, it's just like dark and gloomy all the time and ran by machines. I mean, dude, people are fucking straight up robots these days. Do you even have a pulse? Do you have a thought process? Oh no, you're just going to go with the program. Of course you do. That's why you pulled out your phone to video record of violence taking place. So answer your question yes i totally believe there's some there's a devil there's an evil because there is a good there has to be if there's a light there's a dark and we all know that we can tap in for me i can tap into my darkness much easier than i can my light i can definitely create a lot of hell for my life if i want to very easily if i wanted to go fucking do some gnarly drugs and like steal a car i could go manifest that and make that happen and that's pretty easy I just got to go execute. But if I want to go change my life and really do good, that's a much harder process to do because I'm going to have to become someone completely different to go do that. I'm going to have to become someone to do something evil too. But generally speaking, I'm lowering my vibration to go perform an act like that or to do something positive in the light. I have to raise my vibration, which means I have to change so much more. But it's the same level of effort. We just don't see it that way because we're programmed in a low state of vibration where it's easier for us to to, to burn shit down than it is to fucking brain stays up, in my personal opinion. Have you read the book, uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself? Uh, Dr. Is, Joe Dispenza. Yeah, I read some of it. It was kind of hard to read, and I kind of like went in and out of it. We're just talking about the vibration. I was curious if that, that was partly where that came from. But so in, in your belief, then, um, there is a an intentional force for good energetically, and there's a diametrically opposing force for bad. I mean, I think it's any place man will be, darkness will be. But it's it's intentional. It's not. You can't have one without the other. Okay. Uh, here's a here's a morality slash technology combination question. Okay. Um, so there there's a prospect that <clears throat> within our lifetime that you'll be able to download your consciousness onto a similar to a car's ECU or a chip or a microcomputer or whatever, and basically transform that into a, a brand new body and essentially not die is that, would you do that if that was possible? Uh, no. And this is why, because you have no idea who's creating that technology and you have no idea where your consciousness is going. They already talk about cloning people, but people fucking bat an eye at it. Like it's not true, but there's numerous reports. But the thing is people don't do any form of research. They go to google.com. They look at the first few headlines and that's their research. They don't go to page seven. You know, they never go deep into it. And why would I trust anyone? Do we think the average man that has massive tech technology and tech empowerment cares about your greater good? Really? 
we talk about all this like electric car shit, but do you know how much lives it actually costs? Do you know what damage it actually does to our mother earth? But yet these are the same people that are going to tap into my fucking matrix, right? Put me back into something that they control. And I, our consciousness is our connection to God. You cannot have a connection to anything that you believe in without a conscious act. And so to relinquish that right, dude, you're selling your soul at that point, dude. You, you're literally giving yourself up and, you know, would I want to live forever and make an impact for the world the rest of my life? Yeah. Does the fear of death dying, of dying scare me? I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. I don't want to die, dude. There's so much I want to accomplish and I have no idea what it's going to feel like to be 104 years old and encroaching on 105 and be like, fuck, dude, is it coming to an end? That is scary to me. It really is. I'm not a tough guy. But to, to, to live forever with my consciousness being transferred to another vessel, I mean, I kind of feel like that happens already. But as we go through this reincarnation aspect that um, we forget a lot of things, that's why I feel like the true purpose of life is to remember. Because if you can remember, you can find the pattern. You can find the basically the escape of the matrix, right? And not this weird fucking you know, facade they try to tell you about the matrix, but the matrix of yourself. Yeah. The, the true the true empowerment of one's true purpose in life, which everyone is looking for. And they say, I got it. I got the money. I got the cars. I got the job. I got the, the spouse. But they're fucking empty inside. So tell me, what do you really have? I mean, I, yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't do it either, A. Um, and B, I think, from my perspective, uh, people that feel empty, it's because they lack purpose. I think uh, to, to make a reduction of everything that I've thought of and, and, you know, trying to simplify it to kind of a, a singular element of, um, you know, what, what the reason for being here is, is, is its purpose, whatever that is. It's something that when you wake up in the morning that, that you feel driven, whether you want to call it a calling, uh, you know, a, a drive, uh, even if it's a subconscious attraction towards is that, you know, whether it's being the best basket weaver in the fucking planet, the best chef, best MMA fighter, the best whatever, uh, or if it's to help people. I mean, whatever that is, is that is that the why as to your existence is there, it's tangible, it's understood, uh, and it's driven towards, I, I think, is, is really it. It's, I just think it's that simple. But um, <clears throat> if you were to look back on your entire career, is there one thing that was the most shocking of all of the experiences, uh, particularly in combat was, was is there one thing that stands out as being that, that caught you the most off guard like i said i think it goes back to like there's two wars out there there's a war that the the men and women that are fighting firsthand there's a war that's being waged by other people and i peeked behind the curtain very early on in my military career because i was picking up rank fairly fast and i saw how people don't give a fuck about you and then I look at the indoctrination of the American military where there's these young men and women that, think, like me, they could not wait to join for whatever reason, right? A poster, a family member, a TV show. And these people give and sacrifice so much willingly for truly an organization that just does not fucking care about you. You're literally a number. And when I realized that I was a number and I realized that multiple times in my career, but when I was a, I was a three-year master sergeant, right? So I'm fucking super senior. I've only been in at this time maybe 13 and a half years and uh, 14 and a half years. And when I was started to go downhill for all my medical reasons, I'm like pleading and crying, begging for help. And I realized like how much pushback I got. And I realized like how many times they just try like, Cody, it's not that bad. Everyone's got problems. I'm like, what the fuck? Like you think I'm a badass? I'm clearly, I've proven that time and time again in a multitude of ways and leadership and my performance and all these other things. But I'm begging, begging for help. And you think I'm fucking joking? Like that's that's what little credibility I have in your small-minded space. And then I, I remember going to this one seminar. It was uh, talking about traumatic brain injury. And luckily, it was my neurosurgeon there. And I had super gnarly anxiety at the time. Still a master sergeant. It's in Marsaka headquarters building. And the neurosurgeon's up there, and he's like, uh, he called me Cody. He's like, Cody, he's like, uh, what do you think? And we're, we're talking. He basically asked myself about like, you know, traumatic brain injuries and PTSD and all this other type of shit and uh, different ways to get help. And I talked about like, I feel so bad for these young men and women that are joining special operations, at least whether they're a support enabler or, or a team person that is not getting the help they need. I was a, 
I'm a master sergeant getting pushed back to get help. I couldn't imagine what it's like to be an E3 administrative person who something shitty happened. And maybe a previous unit, they got no care for and respect and they maybe cut a small win that they have an opportunity to get help and healed, you know, in this unit that has all these assets and all this money. And they're telling them to shut the fuck up. You haven't deployed. You don't have anything. I'm like, what? And then, but then we do these suicide prevention classes and we do these, they called it, they call it red flags. Now think about it, it just sounds even more fucked up. But they called it like you get put on this list if you were like a um like during my investigation, I was put on this this list of like, watch out, make sure he's not suicidal, you know, because I was going through all this fucking pressure in my life. I'm like, but how many guys are still killing themselves? You don't fucking really care. You're just a big check in the box. And the dudes care for one another. I truly believe believe that. But the system in itself is not designed to care for you because we're trying to turn, and that's okay. What did you expect? We're turning a machine into a, a human and that can't ever happen. And that's what's funny with all the AI and all this shit happening. Like the military system or any system is a fucking machine. It's a robot. And when you try to humanize a robot, you're, you're always going to be fucking let down. And even though there might be humans that manage and run the machine, they are not it. Yeah. They are part of it. They are a mechanism. In it. It's the same reason why so-and-so kills himself or so-and-so gets killed in combat or so-and-so retires. You're instantly replaced the same fucking day. No one's calling you about the TPS report. No one's calling you like, hey, let's get your locker room number. Bitch, has already changed. Your shit's already thrown out if you haven't grabbed it already. What did you expect? And But to, to see that and to realize that there's way more humans in this crazy mobilization called a machine that are completely dehumanized uh, and don't have a voice, don't have power. It, it, it was super sad to not only experience it myself personally after sacrificing so much willingly, by the way, I, I asked to do all that shit, but to see these young men and women that didn't have the level of strength that I had, that didn't have a voice that I had or power that I had that felt so fucking hopeless. Uh, that's what I feel bad for because, you know, I military people, no matter what their job is, if they have the right mindset, they can truly change the world. They can, they're a force multiplier. I mean, fuck, dude, out of boot camp. Boot camp is business. Literally, if you can manage military, you can do anything. If you can go through that structure, you can dominate anything in life. But yet, why do these men and women get out and they're fucking poor mentally? They're poor spiritually. They're poor emotionally. They're poor powerfully. Like they have nothing. They're, they're, they're just broken victims. Why is that? And when I saw, at least in my own perception, but how I see the system work and how they, your conveyor belted in, then you're fucking shit canned out. Well, I'm like, well, what the fuck did you expect? And for a long time, I wanted to be humanized. And I realized that that just never is going to happen in a machine world, if that makes any sense. No, it does. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. And, uh, you know, to see so many young men and women getting just fucking chewed up and spit out is, uh, it's a travesty, you know, uh, I, I hate to see it. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's depressing. Um, is there a best canine story that you can share? Best? <laughs> I got a funny canine story. Uh, well, I got one best canine story. And, and this this dog, uh, he was just, he recently passed away. His name was Wilbur. Um, and him and his handler, Chris, were uh, Marine. Uh, he was a military police. And my third, my third Afghan deployment, I had... Uh, I didn't have my own dog guy. So I sent one of my team guys, the only way to keep my team guy on the team, I had to send him to like our uh, multiple, our MPW, multiple purpose, MPK, whatever the fuck, uh, dog school to bring him as a team guy back as a dog handler. So they gave him like a black lab, right? Which is a whole nother fucking story. Uh, and this dog was nothing but a fob dog, right? We're having to like drag this bitch on patrol. He was like, just like, let's throw a ball for him. He was awesome, but he was not as, he was, not an asset. He was not an asset. He was an asset for morale, for yeah. sure. And it was great. Uh, and he recently passed away also. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, he bought, he has him as a, he had him as a uh, personal dog after he was retired. But anyway, this guy, Wilbur, this dog, Wilbur, um, you know, I, Chris is a savage dude. He's this young guy. He just picked up Sergeant. His dog is just like this Belgian Mal, just gnarly dog this dude already the dog handler and the dog already had a gnarly reputation in the military for just being fucking badasses and epic uh on deployment on the objectives doing crazy shit he comes to my special operations team i'm super stoked to have him first time i meet him he's got this like new york fucking hat on his turned sideways and his dog is wearing silkies you know and it was just like funny as shit and um 
I remember we finally got an army chef to come to this base that I was at because we were eating just shitty ass. Well, they're not really shitty, but at the time now they're shitty. But at the time, I enjoy them. Just we we're eating the uh, the winter uh, MREs, the the white bag mm-hmm. ones, the kind they're all dehydrated. And that's all we we're eating for like four months. I finally get an army cook to come down and uh, starts cooking for us, and we're having like steak. We got all this air drop in. We got this like big reefer, you know. 18 foot refrigerator come in. So we got steak and lobster. I'm like, dude, soft lives good. And the good thing about soft is we were able to always share with the Marines uh, and the sporting units around us. Anyways. So I grab my meal and I come into my office uh, where my team leader and I worked at and I set my food down. I walk out to go grab a fucking drink. I come back into my office and this is like 20 seconds, dude. I come back into my office. I see my leather chair spinning around. My fucking plate is completely empty. And I see, I stop my chair and I see these like dusty ass paw prints on there. I'm like, Wilbur. And I like run out to the fucking, (laughs) to the op center. And this fucking dog is just looking at me. And he's like, and I'm like, never mind. Give me that fucking steak. And and Chris is like, bro, it's gone. I'm like, Uh, it's mine. And, I was really scared of Wilbur because yeah. Wilbur was not one to be fucked with. But, you know, that those types of stories, you know, were always fun to me. Our, our Marsoc dogs were just straight savage and um, their handlers were amazing. Uh, they have a great program. Um, I loved our dogs. And any time that we had an asset like that, that was able to force multiply our dudes on the ground, like, why wouldn't you want that? Were there instances where any of the Marsoc dogs saved your life or any of your guys' <laughs> lives? Not that I was particularly there for. Yeah, um, yeah not not really. Um, gnarly bites. Definitely gnarly bites. But one thing about me growing up and promoting fast in the military, my, my positions change fast. So even as a team chief, you know, my, my job isn't to be necessarily on the breach point. Yeah. I have a breacher. Even though I'm a breacher, I have a breacher for that now. So, you know, the flash to bang for me in a lot of involvement as I progressed through special operations definitely changed. Um, but dogs definitely did save a lot of lives back then. Just, I was never fully involved. Yeah. Um, I remember my last deployment to Iraq though. Um, uh, one of our dog handlers, his name was Pat. He took a round. He was a manning a, uh, a turret, uh, machine gun. He took a round to the helmet and his dog was in the truck. And, um, when they brought him back to the base and, uh, we're, we're working on Pat and you know, giving him blood, all this other shit and managing his dog too. Cause you, I've, Never had an experience firsthand, but I hear the stories like, fuck, dude, the handler goes down, dude. You might have to put the dog down if the dog was fucking crazy. And uh, his dog was uh, super chill and really liked me a lot for whatever reason. And I felt super honored to have that level of experience. And, uh, you know, just to be able to see that bond between dog and handler, right? It's the team member and teammate. Uh, It was just, it's powerful to see. And it's definitely an underutilized asset. And I wish the bigger military had more access to that specialized training um, for the grand purposes of everything. Yeah. But I, I you know, having our, our multi working our multi-purpose canines in Marslack was dudes felt more confident. Like I remember clearing out literally 40 fucking pressure plate IEDs one day uh, with my EOD tech. Dude, if it wasn't for our dogs, Perta sniffing out shit, like I was like, I felt safer if Perta smelled before I went over there. Sure. Um, and why wouldn't I? And so to have that level of training, that level of asset that never had before, just we're, we're going to live from this one. Like yeah. you just increase your odds. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. No doubt about it. Um, as you got out, um, I know that it was, it was a medical process and, and yes. you know, ultimately you're medically retired. Um, I know you've, you've shared uh, kind of that process, so I won't uh, ask you to do the full soup to nuts on it, but if you can kind of synopsize that process and, what it was like once you were actually out and the struggles you went through. Yeah. I mean, I can make it pretty short and sweet, which I know sounds weird. (laughs) Um, You know, I got out. I didn't, I thought my, I thought everything ended in my career. I was identified with my uniform and my badge. Uh, My vision for life ended. Uh, I remember very vividly talking to a SOCOM rep who was supposed to help me with the, what do you call it? A uh, resume and ask me like, Hey, what are four jobs you want to do? And we're going to connect you with representatives from each of those jobs. And I'm just like making up shit. I had no idea. And, uh, the best thing that ever happened to me was my wife, Stephanie. She's like, Hey, if you had like four weeks left to live, like what would you want to do? And that's when we sold all of our shit and moved into a conversion van and just travel around the United States with no plan, no objective. And we lived well with underneath our means. Cause I needed no stress. I was already so stressed out. I needed no stress in my life. And 
it was hard. I felt so lost. I felt scared. I didn't know anything. I didn't know who I was as a person. I didn't know who Cody Alford was. I was really holding on to the perception of me and like, I was this, I was that. And I had no idea who I was and where I was going. Um, and I felt really called personally to invest into my mind, body, and spirit. I felt really called to invest into like my mindset, uh, cause it was fucking weak and I was a victim. Uh, then I felt called to work into my, my, my spirit work. Cause I had no belief system. I didn't even believe in myself, believe it or not. I, I fucking dominated the military. And then when I left it, it, everything ended there. I, I went from being a fucking superstar to, I couldn't even navigate with a GPS. Like I was drilling on myself, getting lost in a two bedroom apartment. I was falling off on motorcycles. Uh, my wife had to like basically do everything for me. And I just felt so just I felt so sad about myself inside. And I was like, why the fuck is this happening? How is this happening to me? And so really this whole process of getting out was just trying to change my life and do these things I felt called to do. And a lot of it was detoxing myself. Uh, my wife started to research a lot of the medication that I was on and realized that it was straight poison for me. What were you on? I was uh, luckily, uh, luckily I was only on uh, uh, uppers. I was on provisional dexedrin and uh, Adderall. Adderall, for my explanation, how they told me it was like 30% of Adderall goes to your brain. Dexedrin, 70% goes to your brain. That was highly abused back with pilots back in like the 80s, apparently. And then provisual is something they get for guys that are working high profile missions. For, you got to stay up for like two, three days. It's like fucking one molecule away from meth. And I was taking all three of these things because they thought I was narcoleptic at the time because my body was basically shutting down and no one knew why. And after all the sleep studies I was doing, they were I was always missing like one REM cycle. So they couldn't give me the narcoleptic diagnosis, which I was praying for because there was a drug for that. It was called GHB, which is also known as a date rape drug apparently. But this GHB pill apparently was helping with narcolepsy. And I was like praying that I had narcolepsy because I wanted this one thing that was going to help me change my life. And none of that should happen. So my wife realizes that I'm on all these pills and she's like, dude, you're just straight up taking poison. I'm eating Motrin on the regular. I have a gold tooth, not because I'm a gangster, but because I was grinding my teeth all the time, um, just from stress, my ass cheeks were constantly clenched. And she's like, we got to change our lives. So we started to do heavy metal detoxing. Uh, we started to change our diets completely. I had horrible gut issues, um, horrible acid indigestion. And that's when I started to get into a uh, plant medicine. I felt really called to, uh, to seek out psychedelics, um, not to disassociate myself or to, to party, but to, to heal. <coughs> Uh, and I really felt called and pulled towards that direction. So for the past, you know, or not for the past, but during this like whole like two and a half year, three year process, I was just seeking self-investment, working on the things I needed to work on, uh, journaling, meditating, breath work, healing. Hippie uh, shit, right? Yeah, hippie shit. The shit that I made fun of, you know, my wife's like, we're getting a water filter. I'm like, what the fuck's wrong with our water filter? Then you find out like how horrible fluoride is. But every time I went to base, for the dentist, they're like, oh, look, did you grow up in, where did you grow up? I'm like, Texas. And they're like, oh, fluoride, that fluoride, you can tell that's good for your teeth. And I always felt so good about myself. Then you realize how fluoride is horrible for your ass. And you're just like calcifying things, calcifying things inside your body. But when everyone's saying it's good, you're like, oh, this is a badge of honor. Awesome. And so we really shifted our whole paradigm on how we viewed everything. I'm like organic, like only fucking hippies buy organic. Well, the reason why you buy organic is because the pesticides that are sprayed on, on common folk food. Well, why do you think these vegetables are able to stay on shelves for so long? Or why do you think your packaged food is able to last so long? Because it's not real stuff. There's, there's preservatives and, you know, I don't, I'm not this righteous, just person, right? I'm not, I'm just better than the old version. I mean, I don't try to compare against anyone else, but my life has drastically changed uh, because we invested into ourselves both externally and internally. And, um, but it was very hard. People thought I was fucking crazy. I was living in a van. I had no job. So they just talk shit about me. Go figure, right? People are going to talk shit about you, whether you're winning or you're losing. It took me a while to really understand that. And I was super insecure because around this time I started my YouTube channel. Uh, I started my Instagram. I was really sharing what I was going through and people were calling me stolen valor on my YouTube channel. People were talking shit like, Oh, you were in the military. You were in a soft guy. And I was like fucking crying at nighttime, reading these hateful fucking comments that had no validity, but I was so down on myself that everything was like, I was giving my power away and I didn't know how to like take it back. And so I was on this journey to like take back my shit and like find me again and my self confidence. And cause I had no confidence at all. I lost when my body started to crash. I literally lost every fucking thing 
became a very passive aggressive person, became very uh, non-confident in any decision making. Um, there was no alpha in me. There was no leader in me. There was just, I had literally turned myself into a victim, self-induced for sure. Uh, but I didn't realize how I was programming myself through my actions and allowing my circumstances to depict my outcome. Um, so yeah, transitioning out of the military was super hard. Uh, I felt like I needed a job. I felt like I needed to make money. Then I fucking hated money. I thought money was a devil and I didn't want it. Then I realized like, wait a second, I want land one day. I'm never going to get land by just saving up my few couple of thousand dollars for my pension and stuff. Like I'm going to have to go do something with my life. And, uh, you know, I started my, my brand, We Defy the Norm. Uh, it was like an um, ability for me to share kind of like my, my philosophy, my ideology of my transformation of self and to encourage others to do the same thing. And, um, you know, later years, to, to be a fact, like a year and a half ago, that's when I started my coaching group, Defy Tribe. You know, I've only been out four years. I just did a post uh, the other day on Instagram where I'm like, I have literally been out of an institution for like four and a half years. And I've compared myself to a lot of people, a lot of these these men, these manly men that I look up to, um, that have the money, have the influence, have the power, have the respect, have the self-worth, right? They have the relationships, all these things. And I'm like, fuck, damn, I'm, I'm not like them. Well, no shit, bitch. They've been doing something for like 15, 20 years, become an expert of their craft. And, you know, the 15 and a half years I spent in the military, I become, I became an expert of my craft for the things I needed to learn and do that set me up for success now. And I had to really give myself credit like bitch you've only been out four years look how far you've come why isn't that good enough for you right now and that struggle with that so long because i'm like what's my purpose what's my why all these things in that exact same voice because i was such a flaccid person because i was just desperate for that one breakthrough and i realized the only way i'm gonna get a fucking breakthrough if i crack the shit myself if i if i crack that concrete open myself because i was the one pouring it so I'm pouring it. I can fucking definitely chip it away. And I didn't, I didn't see life that way at that time. And as I progressed through these different modalities of self-investment and hiring coaches and mentors and allowing myself to face more fears as a civilian without the safeguard of a team to, to back me up or a, or a persona of the military, which I had, which is like this super great guy. I'm, I'm out here in this earth, this world by myself feeling like, and having to like recreate myself and, it was definitely challenging, but fuck, has it been so invigorating and freeing, especially to look back on my military career and not feel bad about any of it. I've learned so much from it, even from the pain. But before, it, it definitely held me prisoner for sure. Yeah, it's uh, it's inspiring and fascinating to hear you kind of walk through, uh, you know, that transitional period and, and kind of finding yourself and uh, just it's amazing to hear. Um, <clears throat> what What is your goal now kind of? you know, today and moving forward, what do you, you know, whether it's a one year, a five year, 10 year rest of your life, like what, what do you want to do? My goal right now is just to go more. I realized, uh, I realized the other day, uh, actually last week I caught wind. I, uh, we have a friend staying with us and she has access to Netflix and we watched this film. It's called like the wrong Missy. And it's a super funny comedy. It's definitely something you should never watch with kids around you. Uh, cause there's a lot of like perversion and shit in there. But at the very end, one of the main characters said, I want to be more like you. I don't fucking care what people think about me where I don't want to live a boring life. And I, I realized at this point in time in my life where I've done all these things in this past four plus years, I'm like, fuck. And even though I thought I was defying conformity, even though I thought I was like not caring, I realized, holy shit, I am fucking caring way too much what people think about me. Dude, I, I wouldn't even see the word God because I wasn't, a, you know, this religious title or I didn't have the same belief as someone else. And I was worried about what everyone else was going to think about me. I realized how truly small I've been playing, even though I've been going fast and hard. I just realized, no, nah, dog, I'm at a new level of consciousness. I'm a new level of life. The stakes are higher now. It's the same game, but now the stakes are higher. I can't do the same thing that got me here, won't get me there. And so my only focus in life more now is just to fucking go all in and not give a shit what anyone thinks about me, what I'm doing, because... I realized how many areas of my life I was trying to peace people, even in my, my peril brand. Mm -hmm. I wanted everyone to feel empowered. Well, bitch, I'm not for everybody. Yeah. And I was making myself available to everyone. I was making my ideologies and my philosophies available to everybody. And I realized that I was really only impacting a portion of who I know I'm here to impact. But most importantly, I was sacrificing my own true empowerment at that cost. I'm like, that's 
that's fucking stupid. Yeah. And I will not live a boring life and I will not live in fucking fear worrying about what anyone thinks about me. And I will not give my power away to people. I will not put my, what do you think about me? No, bitch. I know what I think about me. And for the first time in my, my life, dude, like straight up, I have never felt more empowered. And like, I'm so excited to get back to, to where I'm, where I live at. And just to just move. I'm so excited to get back. I'm so excited to just make things happen because there's so much to be done. Yeah. I, I don't disagree. I think it's great to, you know, and, and I will say like I, I have kind of a hard and fast rule for, uh, for others opinions and, and it's very simple and it's guided me quite well over the last few years, which is if it's not somebody that I would ask for advice, then I don't give a shit what they think, but that's good and bad. You know, because if you, if you listen to people who you wouldn't ask for advice, stroke your ego, then that gives you false confidence. And, and I think, uh, corrupts your mind to, to think that you're somebody that you're not also. So to me, it's like there, there's not very many people I would ask their advice, but if you fall into that category, then, then yeah, I, I do give a shit what you think, you know, and it's just, it's an easy thing to live by that, that sifts through a lot of the bullshit. But so I heard a very similar aspect of that, what you just said, but instead of like, if I wouldn't take their advice, if they're not living the life that I once live, why am I taking their advice? Yeah. And, yeah. uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't ask if, so, if somebody wasn't living how I wanted to live, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't ask them, for advice, <laughs> right. but, but, uh, no, it's, it's, uh, it's really awesome. Um, have, have you felt guided at all, uh, through the process, uh, or has it been more of a trying to figure it out as you go? Like, has there been something that you followed to accomplish this? My consciousness. Yeah. Uh, I, when I got out, I had no belief in anything. I couldn't even say the word God without feeling weird. Um, I'm like, I'm more of like a spiritual person, but in, in, in all actuality, I had no <clears throat> confidence in any belief system of my own. Um, because you can tell who's not confident when they get fucking triggered that you don't agree with them or they don't agree with you, right? You're not secure about your belief system, homie. And guess what? It's okay that we have different belief systems. Um, but I feel like my consciousness has told me exactly what I need to do. And it's been me that has put up the resistance. And that's the work. I remember I did uh, this very large, I did 13 and a half grams of psilocybin in the Grand Canyon about two and a half years ago. So I'm asked, I asked the universe guy, I'm like, what's my purpose? Why am I here? And I just like fucking went all in on this like gnarly, most crazy, insane trip I've ever done in my life. And I felt like I received this message and then was told exactly what to do. And I'm like, what you want me to do X, Y, and Z? You want me to give up X, Y? I'm like, fuck. Because the person I was going to have to become to do those things was completely uncomfortable. I was going to have to like not be a piece of shit. I was going to have to like not fucking use these vices and distractions. And it's taken me a couple of years to to chip away at what I feel I received this guidance. But the more I do them and the more I walk into the unknown, the more I feel like my, my connection to consciousness is guiding me more, right? Like that intuition, I'm tapped more into it. I'm like, I know when I'm fucking up. I know when I'm crossing the line. And I also know when the resistance is so thick, I know that's the path. Because if it was easy, if it was if your path was illuminated to success and evolution of self, then everyone would be fucking doing it. Clearly, it's not the lit path that guides you to yeah. your salvation. It's the dark one, dude. It's the one yeah. that you got to go in and you're like, none of y'all are coming with me. Well, all right, because it's your journey. And so I feel like that voice inside me has helped me get to where I'm at today and really impact the lives I'm able to impact. You know, like I'm just fucking grateful of this entire opportunity. Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. I, I love the the perspective you have, the attitude that you exude, and uh, and I appreciate you sharing it. I've got a couple of random questions. Totally fucking random. I love it. Uh, have you done the Harry Potter sorting test, the house sorting test? Are you Have you gone through that? No, but... Are I'm you a Harry Potter fan? Oh, yeah, I like it. So if you go on, like, if you, I think you have to sign up. Uh, well, you do have to sign up for, like, their fan club or whatever. Okay. And you go through the, the house sorting. I'd be curious what your uh, your Harry Potter house is. I'll text you later and All let right. you know. Awesome. Uh, earlobe tattoos. Tell me about Everyone it. Everyone asks about that. I mean, it's hard not to. Like, yeah. you're the only person I know with tattooed earlobes, so. Yeah. Uh, so, damn. Is this where we do it? This is where we, like, unveil so. that yeah. gold? Unless you want to take your pants off and tell a story. <laughs> so, I decided a long time. I, I feel called to, to uh, you know, I want a community, man. I want people that I can rely on. I want people that are committed to this life, right? Uh, in my in my circle because I don't have time for friends. I have time for people that want to live, right? There's a difference to me and I realized my viewpoint of friends were not the same as where I'm at today in, in my current life. 
Uh, I also realized that my goals of homesteading and, and farming d- cannot do this shit by myself. And I have no plans. I don't want to just live in a fucking farm for the rest of my life. Like I feel so called for more. I, I can't, I'm not going to stay in one place, but I also can't accomplish these things by myself and I can't build this life by myself. So <laughs> me and, uh, one of my best friends and his family and my wife were like, we're going to start a tribe. And uh, so our, our earlobes are like our commitment to ourselves and to this life of like, hey, man, we're not fucking perfect, but we're committing to one another because we know that the path we're on is fucking paved in fucking adversity and overcoming. And that's how that's how we're tribing up. And that's what we're doing to, to build this empire that we know we're called upon to build. And uh, that's exactly what it is, man. Everyone asked me about it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's very unique that way. Was there something that... Um illuminated your thought to to do that as as a representation of tribe is it a native american thing it's just one of those things you're like you know i'm i'm not a you know people are like oh well, your rest porosity you should like shut the fuck up you know like i feel what i feel called to feel dude i'm a warrior class right i have a fucking tomahawk i've a tomahawk tattooed on my forehead and i realized that a true warrior's role in life, no matter what background, ethnicity, culture, tribe, a true warrior's role in life is to fucking heal yourself and to evolve into a king. Because if you stay a warrior the rest of your life, you will stay in hell. You will not evolve and you will limit your true potential. And all that hardships you've gone through would be for nothing because it's absolutely selfish to harness all that wisdom that you've had access to and not share it with the world. Because your truth can set someone else free. It can give someone else the power to rise to their highest level. Find their God. Find their belief system. Find their happiness, right? Find their voice. And why do I have my earlobes tattoo? Why do I feel so called to a, to a warrior tribe? Because who the fuck is to say that I'm not, right? Why are we so worried that, oh, you're not brown skin. You're not a Native American, bitch. I'm Cody Alford. That's who I am. And if I say this is my fucking tribe and this is my tribe and that's it. It's, it's a non-negotiable for me. And it's a, it's a, it's a stance that I will never falter for. And I never waver for because we, all we have in this life is our fucking word to ourselves and to our people. And I have let so many people down in my life. I have gone against my word. I've gone against myself so many times. And when I look back on those moments, I'm like, dude, you disgust me. And if all I have, and this is like, you talked about God and stuff. I don't, Jesus, all these things, but the story of Jesus carrying his cross I've had a lot of those versions, those, those moments come to me in, in psychedelic trips and it's so powerful. And if it's, if it's, if I'm butchering it, I'm butchering, get over it. But if it's true, how it's written, you know, I, I, I think about bearing your cross. I take it to a whole new level. When I used to hear that shit before, it used to irk me, but I, I, I visualized myself when I was doing the psychedelic trip, I saw Jesus carrying his fucking cross up into his death, to his crucifixion. I saw all these eyes on him. And at any given time, this dude knows he's about to get fucking killed. And at any given time, he could have buckled down and quit and cried and shit himself and just, man, and been dragged up there. He was still going to die no matter what. But he knew, and what I felt this connection with, if he fucking quit on himself, everything he ever believed in, preached in, would have been for nothing. And so he fucking did the whole Braveheart thing. Braveheart didn't fucking falter. He didn't waver. He said freedom to his last breath. He didn't bow down to the crown. Because all we have in this life is what we truly fucking believe in. And one thing I can say about myself, I fucking believe. It doesn't have to be what you believe in. That's okay. But I believe in what I believe in and it's worth fighting for and dying for and not fighting for as like, let's go fight the Redcoats. No, bitch. Haven't you seen Last Mohicans? They want you to go fight. Go fight yourself. Go evolve in yourself. Stop worrying and concerning yourself about the issues of the world. Solve your shit and watch how that transforms people's lives. And this is my stance on how I'm transforming my life and the people that I say are most important to me. And that's my tribe. I think it's a fantastic way to look at it. I'm still curious where the idea came from. The idea came from, so uh, my friend was looking at getting Polynesian tattoos. Uh, he, he's a tattoo artist. And um, we were watching this show. I think it was called like Outsiders. It was like this, like, have you seen that show? Not the movie. Uh, like the movie from the book. Not the doo-wop Outsiders, but the these were like these like hillbillies in a hill that just like, they, they're kind of fucked up. They're like all like, in, like incest type of people. Yeah, I haven't seen that. But they are basically like separated from society. And uh, they have their own way of life, their own way of living. And it, it's a drama TV show, so it had its ups and downs and lefts and rights, but what they had most was community. Yeah. And uh, they separated themselves in, the, in their garb and in their tattoos. And we're like, well, how the fuck can we do this to separate ourselves by our garbs and our tattoos? And 
earlobes was it you know it's not yeah. like here's my little butterfly on my ankle yeah. like nah bitch because in the day dude yeah when you're holding the line there will be no question about where i stand for you know and and to me that's power yeah i dig it um is there any uh, thing you want to talk about that we haven't man i just want to say that yes i have a potty mouth yes i have my own opinions that might be triggering you but i would tell you this from a person from personal experience that i was triggered for three and a half years getting out of the Marine Corps. I saw these people, veterans, successful. I saw people that sucked, that were super successful. I saw people that had different opinions to me that triggered me. And all these different ideologies that people like exinuated or, or showed, it bothered me. And I realized, why? Why am I getting triggered by someone else's viewpoint? Why is someone saying the word Jesus and it's making me cringe inside? Why is someone saying, you know, you got to go to school or you got to get this, you got to do that? Why does that bother me so much where I'm losing sleep from it? And I realized along my journey so thus far is that triggers are an opportunity to grow. Pull the fucking thread back. If I said anything that it literally bothers you to your core, investigate why. Because if you believe in anything that you believe in, it should not bother you the opinions of anyone else. And if I could just say one message to the world, like, dude, heal yourself. Whatever the fuck that means to you, do it, dude. Let no darkness dim your fucking light. Because that's what society wants you to do. They want you to, it, they, I don't care what title you put on that, what unit, what group, what elite, it, they, it, sometimes even you wants you to play so small. And if you feel a small speck of being called for more in this life, it is your fucking duty and your right to fucking pave that path, to walk into the darkness and to fucking become who you're here to become. Because that's the only truly way you're going to free yourself. People are worried about heaven and hell. But like, bitch, you're living that right now if you're suppressing your true calling inside. And if you don't know your calling inside, if you don't know your why inside, you're not going to find it stationary. You're not going to find it where you're currently at. Have faith in yourself. This one thing that we sacrifice, especially as Americans, we, we sacrifice this thing called faith. Faith in anything and everything that you need to fucking take one step in front of the other. You have no idea what's going to come to you into your life if you move forward forward but nothing is guaranteed to come to you if you stay the same and um you know that's what i'm all about man i run this coaching group called the fire tribe and i i share with people these things that i've gone through but these 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 nuggets of information that might piss them off and i'm really good at pissing people off i'm really good at triggering people i'm really good at just being an asshole like it's my superpower man i'm good at getting people to think and question i did it my whole military career and when i was fighting and struggling like what am i really good at i was denying myself this power because I wanted to like create a water bottle. I wanted to create a tangible thing I could sell and offer. I'm like, who the fuck is going to want me to help with their mindset or who's going to want me to do this or do that when I'm just thinking and I'm helping people out? Well, that's a fucking gift. And I'm living proof that you can grow and evolve and you can become your own person. You don't have to be like everyone else. You can truly realize that we aren't the same and that's perfectly fine and stop trying to be like everyone else because you're not here to be them and if you wouldn't have them right through your obituary stop looking at them for guidance in your life and take that power back to yourself and see what you can actually do with this one fucking chance we have to experience everything we have to experience and to feel every ounce of emotion we're here to fucking feel to me that is what a gift man that's yeah. a gift no I, I love everything that you're saying i think it's a, a phenomenal and powerful message and uh and i know a lot of people can benefit from it where where do they find that uh they they can go to defytribe.com uh that's uh where i have for my coaching group uh if they want to support the brand we defy the norm that's we defy the norm.com and and man the information is out there but you just have to be ready to uh to go get it and, I, and i'll leave probably the audience with this invest in yourself find a coach find a mentor because time is the one thing that humans think they have and we don't if you can compress time with growth and evolution with learning how to do something finding the who to do the what you can get your time back and when you get your time back you make way more impact you can do way more things in your life and don't try to do it all yourself find your tribe find your people you can rely on and go all in and you'll be surprised what you can actually do in this life I would say I'd take it a step further and say you can't lose. You cannot lose in numbers. Yeah. You can't lose. You are a product of your environment. You cannot lose. Dude, when I'm hanging around my high performing friends or I'm going to a mastermind, I'm hanging around super high performers, millionaires, billionaires, uh, 
multiple seven figure entrepreneurs or people that are starting up, but they have that hunger mindset, just like in our teams. People are like, how did you guys accomplish that tactical mission? Well, bitch, I'm around straight alpha males that want to destroy and dominate every aspect of weakness and fucking uh, hurdle in their life. You can't lose when you're around that mentality. That's why guys who aren't really bred and born for special operations, they stick out like a sore thumb, not because they suck, but it takes you to a whole new level of experience when you surround yourself with people who want the same thing. Not the same thing as I do, yeah. but I want growth. And that's the type of people that I provide in the Defy Tribe. And that's the type of people I only want to associate myself with because I don't have time. Yeah, no, I love it. Uh, and they can find that at, uh, where's the what, the website? We'll put it in the description, but just uh, if you can verbalize it. DefyTribe.com. Awesome. I got something for you. Uh, this is from Champion Silver Services as well as... Uh, well, actually, both of them are from there, but so we got uh, got the mic drop coin uh, for you to take back, and you can shove it up your ass, whatever you want to do. Maybe uh, help with the liver cleanse. Thank you, sir. And then this is uh, in conjunction with your favorite color. What? Uh, we got uh, cha same champion uh, silver services, and John Johnston out in California has uh, graciously donated these uh, parting gifts to all the guests. So, dude, this is super epic. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, absolutely. It'll I have be. a good Mac belt. Uh, Amen. You know yeah. Mac belt? Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I got a good leather Mac belt, American made. That this bad boy's gonna go on. Awesome, man. Well, that's good shit. Well, I, I uh, can't thank you enough for coming and, and uh, sharing both your story and your perspective and viewpoint on everything. Uh, super interesting guy. I'm proud of shit for everything that you've uh, accomplished and, and will continue to do so. Uh, and just thank you for, uh, for coming and sharing it. Thanks for having me, man. I'm really, really grateful, really appreciative. Yeah. No, I, should, I appreciate you. Thank you. To the listeners, uh, you know we appreciate you. Uh, and even if you didn't like the episode, you know you can choke yourself. And until next time, this is Mike Drought. <laughs>